The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Ms Widget. Good morning, Commissioner. May it please the Commission. Commissioners, today you will hear evidence this morning from Lieutenant Colonel Paul Morgan, retired. Following that evidence, you will hear evidence from Professor Jennifer Wilde, Professor of Military Mental Health. And then this afternoon, you will hear evidence from Rear Admiral Sarah Sharkey, AMCSC, and Rear Admiral Sonia Bennett. Yes, thank you. Commissioners, could I just give my appearance? My name is Demars, D-E-M-A-R-S, initial W. With your leave, I appear for the two witnesses this morning, Colonel Morgan and Mr Ross. I'm instructed by the Defence and Veterans Legal Service. Thank you, Mr Demars. Thank you. Commissioners, as I just said, the first witness is Lieutenant Paul Morgan, who is in the room. Before the uh, affirmation is administered, I note, Commissioners, that I anticipate that the evidence this morning may be distressing or triggering for those watching either online or who are in the room today. I raise this now, Commissioners, to afford people an opportunity to decide whether or not they wish to watch the hearing this morning. Thank you. The witness can now be affirmed. Do you, Paul Morgan, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And the Constitution of Australia, I do so affirm. And Commissioners, this morning, Graham Ross will also be giving evidence and he also can now be affirmed. Do you, Graham Ross, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do affirm. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel, please can you tell the commissioners your full name? I am. Uh, you will need a microphone. Apologies. Is it on? Oh, you've got the microphone on you. Yep. Wonderful. I am Lieutenant Colonel Paul Morgan, retired. You made a statement to the commission signed and dated 19th of March 2024. Is that correct? And there are 98 pages to that statement. Is that correct? Yes. And your statement has six annexures? It does. Would you like to make any corrections to your statement? I would. At the end of paragraph 10, I'd like to add that had a bigger impact. Thank you. And in paragraph... 381, death treat, should read death threat. Thank you. And noting those corrections, are the contents of your statement true and correct? To the best of my recollection and understanding, yes, they are. Thank you. Graham Ross, can you please tell the commissioners your full name? Uh, Graham Gordon Ross. You made a statement to the Commission signed and dated 19th of March 2024, is that correct? That's correct. Would you like to make any corrections to your statement? No. And are the contents of your statement true and correct? Yeah, true and correct. Commissioners, the Commonwealth and the Royal Commission itself has not had an opportunity to review the statements and the documents that are on the tender bundle list. There's not been an opportunity to make any redactions or deal with any confidentiality claims. For that reason, commissioners, I do not intend to tender the documents or the statements at this point. However, and I, I defer that tender. However, they will be tendered during this hearing block. 
and understood. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel, is it correct that when someone leaves the army at a certain rank, that they retain that rank? Is that correct? They re retain the title to be addressed as that rank. That's correct, if they are major and above. And in that case, I refer to you as Lieutenant Colonel on the first instance, and then after that, I am to refer to you as Colonel. Is that correct? That's the convention, yes. Thank you. So, Lieutenant Colonel Morgan, you are giving evidence today about your time in the Australian Army. Is that correct? I am. And you are here with your partner, Graeme Ross, who is also giving evidence today. Is that correct? It is. And you spent 20 years in the army as a psychologist and an officer. I did. When you left the army in 2017, you held the rank, as we just said, as Lieutenant Colonel, is that correct? That's correct. And you hold a Bachelor of ba Behavioural Science with Honours degree and a Masters of Organisational Psychology degree, is that right? I do. And when you joined the army in April 1997, you undertook a two-year training program for psychology graduates. In fact, I joined the Army slightly before that in the Reserve and I went full-time in April 97. And you joined the Army Reserves in 1996 That's in the right. part-time role, is yeah. that right? To me, the Reserve and the full-time are, are the Army together. And your army, in, your army service includes, amongst many other things, operational service to Bougainville, East Timor, Solomon Islands, Iraq and the Middle East area, is that correct? It is correct. And uh, I just wish to note, to honour my grandfather, I was in Bougainville as a captain exactly 60 years after he had been there in the Australian Army as a captain. It was a great honour. Thank you very much for sharing that, Colonel. In your role as a psychologist, and you were a defence psychologist, is that correct, in the Army? Uh, I was a uniformed Army psychologist, yes. And in that role, you have counselled defence members who've been subjected to abuse during their service, is that right? Many. And you advised army commanders on the management of abuse in defence in your capacity as a, as a psychologist? Yes. And would you say you advised many on that as well? <laughs> many, many. And you received a commendation for your work in Iraq with three RAR for your service in Iraq and Afghanistan and including, the commendation was also for establishing permanent psychological services for the Australian Defence Force, is that right? Just in Iraq, not Afghanistan. Thank you for clarifying that, Colonel. And when you joined the Army in 1997, what would you say was the culture at that time for serving members who had, had identified as being gay? Well, the law had only changed uh, five years prior to that, uh, five years prior joining uh, the army as a gay man or a lesbian was a crime. And uh, so all the people who believed in that and argued f for that idea that uh, gay men were, would destroy morale, teamwork, and be a, a harm to the warfighting power of our nation, they were all still there. So, you know, and slurs were everywhere and whatever. But yeah, so that was like, I mean, in, in other countries, it was still a crime. For many years to come, we were actually ahead of uh, many other countries in, in re recognising uh, that we needed to uh, reflect Australian society. And did you notice in this early period that it was difficult for gay serving members to be open about their sexuality and there was still some secrecy around that? Well, obviously it had improved. Uh, I mean, you couldn't get... Uh, court martialed anymore. So, uh, but yeah, you still had to be extremely discreet. I was not out for the first five years or so. Uh, you know, people used to have fake girlfriends and something, but I, I'm a, I'm a, I don't lie, I don't do that. So I didn't have any fake girlfriend, I was just gonna nothing. Thank you. And at paragraph 26 of your statement, you give evidence of your goals in giving evidence today. Yep. Would you like to tell the commissioners what what is, and if you've got your statement there, it's at paragraph 26, and if you need to refer to it. Thank you. Please do so. Uh, let, me, 
Let me just say uh, uh, one thing first. Um, I've got a lot to say right today, probably too much. Um, uh, my brain doesn't quite work the way it used to at the peak of my career. I might get muddled on dates and events, uh, but uh, the best of my recollection, this is how it is, and I kept a shit ton of emails. So uh, I've forgotten a lot of stuff. So if I refer to the document, it's just because my brain is a bit concrete these days. And, and Colonel, can I just say that that is absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you. To take your time and at any point you want to have an adjournment, I will seek from the commissioners an adjournment and we can have a break. So there is no rush. Please take your time and please don't worry about, about getting things confused if you do. I'll try and assist you as much as, much as possible. Thank you. The, the commission and its staff have been the epitome of best practice in, in psychological support for those of us peering. I appreciate that. Thank you, Colonel. So paragraph 26 yes. of the statement. I'll just read it. I said, my goal in making this statement is to improve the Australian Defence Force, especially the Australian Army. My goal is to reduce the number of suicides and to reduce the number of instances of self-harm. And your goal today is not about naming names, is that right? No. no. And as has been the procedure in this Royal Commission, I'll just ask that names are not mentioned and if it happens inadvertently, we will cut the feed. I get that. You, you state that it's important uh, for you to be upfront about the goal in terms of giving evidence today and you say that the reason why you think it's important to be upfront about that is because you've seen over many years that those who criticise the ADF and the Australian Army face being characterised as wanting to damage the Army, damage the Defence Force and its power to defence the Australian national, the Australian nation in war. That's right. And, yeah, just to go, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Army culture or ADF culture so I just want to point out here that I'm starting, starting as I intend to go on. This is about the fact that you do not criticise upwards. You do not criticise your boss in the army. And we will go... And when you do, they bite back hard. Thank you. I'm sorry if I interrupted. I thought you had finished. But, and we will go through the sequence of events of what happened to you. Yes, sure. And we will return to, and I will give you an opportunity for you to talk about why you think what has happened to you has occurred. Yep. So it's not your intended goal uh, or reason for giving evidence today to criticise the ADF, to bring it down, if you like. Your reason really is to try and improve things in the ADF. Is that right? Constructive criticism. I think every organisation should be open to constructive criticism. The ultimate goal is for you to improve. Improve. The our, improve our warfighting capacity by improving how we look after our people. And at paragraph 28, and you don't need to read it, but I, I, I'm just going to put this to you, that in that paragraph you say that from your 20 years of defence experience, you have su suggestions that will substantially enhance the warfighting performance of the ADF while simultaneously reducing suicide in defence members and veterans, is that correct? I think if you look at the cultural reasons, specific army cultural reasons, ADF cultural reasons for suicide and self-harm, if you solve, solve those cultural uh, problems, then you will solve the recruiting crisis, you will solve the retention issues, you will solve the, the acquisitions problems, the reasons why people overstate what's achievable in terms of equipment and, and and so on. So yes, there are common reasons why if you solve this issue, we will be right across the board better off across, to, across the Army and Defence. And is your evidence that it will also address or attempt to resolve suicide? Yes, that's right, very much so. And your intention in giving evidence today, ultimately, is to improve the ADF and make it a place where members would be proud to serve. Do you agree with that characterisation? I want the Army and the ADF to be a place where my 
fair-haired son and my pink-dressed daughter are safe and want to join. Yeah, like I did. I, I want it to be safe again. I want it to actually be safe this time, so that, that the, the parents of Australia who are entrusting their fair-haired sons and their pink-dressed daughters can feel that, that they are safe inside the army, no matter the fact that they might die for the nation. But inside, they're safe. And behind you today, you have brought in a photo of your family. And would you like to tell the commissioners what else is on the easel behind you? Uh, OK, so I, I just have uh, my hat from Army Days, my dog tags, uh, and, and uh, our beloved Labrador. <laughs> And on the table, I have a uh, thing, a couple of mementos from my, my, my kids. I'm, I'm a hairy daddy, and he's not hairy daddy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Colonel. We're going to now move into what happened during your service. You had been serving for around 14 years when an incident occurred in August 2010, that resulted in you making a complaint of unacceptable behaviour, is that correct? It is. And for some context, what rank did you hold in 2010? Major. And before that incident occurred in August 2010, on March, on 7th of March 2010, you received an anonymous death threat in your workplace, is that correct? In my workplace, yes, that's right. Operator... The document that I'm going to ask for you to display is to be displayed privately and the document ID number is GRS.0000.0001.2010 and that is at number 21 of the tender bundle list. Commissioners, I didn't display that for the reasons that I said earlier. Uh, understood. Thank you. And if you could please go to the last page of that state of that document, operator. Thank you very much. Thank you. That in front of you, Colonel, is the death threat, and it was sent to you in the form of an email to your defence email. Is that right? That's correct. And the sender's email was not a defence email, is that correct? That's right. And is it, is it the case that defence members' emails are, are not available to the public? They're completely private? Yes, that's right. The, the Defence Restricted Network has private emails. And you're not permitted to give that email out to anyone, are you? Conventionally, no. And the death threat would you agree, is graphic and violent? Yeah. And as well as the death threat being made in that email, it also contained uh, what could be described as profane and derogatory comments about your sexuality. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that's an understatement. Would you, do, would you like to add to the description? No. Okay. I mean, I'll just leave Thank it at you. That. And the email stated that the sender of the email had just walked by you in your workplace. Is that right? Indeed. I mean, I have a number of workplaces across Defence and that was one of them. And did you tell anyone within Defence or in your chain of command about the death threat? Yes, immediately. And did Defence do anything or anyone in your chain of command do anything about that death threat? No. Were any protective measures put in place for you? No. Did you report the death threat to the police at the time? The civil police, yes. Yes. Sorry, the civil and police. The civil police, yes. And by, by recollection, I also uh, informed the uh, service police. But so you made two. So you reported to the civil police. Yes, I went. I went up the out, out the out of the barracks and up to the civil police because yeah, I mean, civil. I mean, it's a. In the military justice system, it always used to be internal, like you could just deal with everything, and now certain matters 
uh, private, like, murder uh, in Australia are now dealt with externally, largely. Yep. Thank you. And when we're talking about the military justice system, at the time when you were serving and when this happened to you, it was referred to as the Australian Defence Force Investigative Service, known as ADFIS, is that right? That was part of, of yep. the military justice system, yes. Which is now the Joint Military Police Unit, JMPU, is that Well, right? ADFIS has been subsumed into the JMPU, yes, along with Mary, uh, other service, conventional service police and, and other elements. And then moving forward to August 2010... Sure. You then received an email from a defence work colleague, an army work colleague, informing you that she had been invited to join a face group called Steve Austin. Is that right? Yes, it is right. I uh, received a, a, an email from someone who uh, stood out from the crowd. They were literally outstanding in their actions. And I just raise that to note that the um, the definition of the uh, 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 the definition of the criteria for the award of the conspicuous service cross is to offer outstanding service, which I believe she did, and I believe she should be awarded that because all our generals, morning tea people, as I call it, the morning tea medal, they all have one. But you know. Sometimes we need to give medals to our soldiers for their outstanding actions. Thank you. And she told you that the group appeared to be outing people in the ADF as being gay. Is that right? Yeah. And to your knowledge, did the Army know about this Facebook page before your war colleague had told you about it? At the time, I didn't know that they knew, but yes, in fact, they had known for a week. They had known about the Facebook page for a week. And the death threat for months, yep. And the death, well, the death threat from March. Yep. But they didn't tell you no, about they didn't. the Facebook page. No, they didn't. And it took a colleague of yours to tell you that it was up. That's right. And you referred to that Facebook page as a gay hate site. I do. And that's because the site, in your evidence, was not only outing ADF members who were supposed to be gay or alleged to be gay, but that the site made it clear, didn't it, that being gay was not OK and referred to being gay as a filthy lifestyle decision. Correct. And I just want to add here that, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about army culture today, and I know that culture has been uh, a very strong focus. So one of the things that happens that you learn as an army officer is to wordsmith. And wordsmithing means to say something that may, to one person, accurately describe the situation, and, and it means a different things to other people. So I was fully aware that they were going to downplay what that was. And I was playing the wordsmithing game in the other direction, whereas I was going, yeah, and I dare you and I dare anybody still serving to come to me and say, yeah, that, that, that doesn't accurately describe what it was. It certainly fucking described what it was. It was a fucking filthy, hateful, degrading, Side. Excuse okay. my army language. Yeah. That, that's okay. Thank you for a adding to that it's, um, uh, important evidence. And then you also then give evidence that the Facebook site also embedded YouTube YouTube videos uh, with images and um, uh, depicting pornography, the Nazi swastika images, and images of extreme violence. Is that correct? Sort of. It, it embedded one, which then definitively linked, gave a link to all the rest. So there was a chain that if you bothered uh, you, to follow, the first thing took you ever more deep into this well of filth. And some of the public videos was calling for the reinstatement of the death penalty for gay men. Is that right? It was indeed. And, and it used my face 
Sorry, and they used your face? And images of me in uniform. On the site? On the sites, yes, on the videos. On the actual videos? Yes. And a call for, and they also, there was a call for vigilantes to take up the cause of killing gay men in line with this old law. Is that right? There was, yes, absolutely. And to your knowledge, how many people had become friends, and I use that term because sure. that's how Facebook pages yep. work, is that right? That there's a Facebook page and that's you right. can become a friend on that. Yep. Um, how many, to your knowledge, had become friends of the site and, and do you know how many were serving at the time? Well, tons of them were in uniform, they were carrying weapons, they were sitting on weapons platforms. So it was not hard to guess that they were, there were a, a ton of them in the Army and, and Defence Force in general. Uh, so I didn't, obviously didn't know, but I nominated them all. And uh, in retrospect, it came out at uh, 32 serving members were participating and uh, may 50 veterans and civilians. So or 50-ish, 50 plus. So it's a, uh, 32 definitively and 80 plus or minus a couple, yep. Thank you. And what do you believe was the intended goal behind that gay hate site? Uh, the intended goal was to, uh, well, intimidate gay people, uh, get rid of gay people from uh, gay men and lesbians, but gay men especially from, from the army in particular and the D Defence Force in general, um, and to intimidate us. And, and linked to uh, the, the associated graphic violent uh, elements that, that were linked to it and that I had received previously, uh, then, yeah, it was pretty easy to understand that they wanted to rid the army of gay people you know, and, and frankly, if they had killed one of us, um, they would have succeeded because why would, you know, we've got a recruiting crisis as it is. You know, you wouldn't trust your gay kids to join the fucking army if one of them had been slaughtered as they, sorry, excuse me. Yes, as they, amongst the specific actions that were literal were, sorry, I'm not meant, I don't know if I meant to refer to what they said in the death threat, but um, yeah. It's okay. They would have succeeded. And, and, and let me just point out <laughs> that a lot of, a lot of, this, con a lot of this conversation uh, that goes on, uh, you know, and I talk to my friends and they go, well, shit happens everywhere. Shit happens in, a, in normal society, right? And it does, absolutely. You know, when they talk about ADFA, they say, you know, I, I see all the commentary about, you know, the, the cadets that were sexually violated at ADFA. Um, and there were scandals at roughly the same period of time. And people say, well, this shit happens at all universities. But what people don't seem to realise is that ADVA is not just a university. It's a goddamn workplace, right? They get paid a full wage and super to go there. They have to obey military law to go there. They wear uniforms. This, so people, you, they deride army life as a hobby or something light. It's not, it's, it's, it's a very intensive thing. And for me, in terms of one of the specific things that ha uh, happened to me, is when you get sent a death threat and a hate group starts up to you, and maybe that happens in corporate life in Australia, like us, Graham, but, but if it does, I can guarantee you that all the people around you aren't fucking armed. Well, there is, that is the case. I used to practice psychology where oh, I was armed to the fucking teeth and the people I was consulting or treating, they were armed to the fucking teeth, right? I used to, I used to have a team of six people that would fly me to the front lines. We were all armed to the fucking teeth. So when you get a death threat like that, and you get it specifically, these people, they had no fear. They had, I could not believe how fearless they were to put themselves in uniform up there with weapons, which they used in everyday life. And, and all they needed was their defence access card to get, get right up to my office. It was unbelievable. 
Colonel, you've anticipated my next question to, to oh, some degree. No, not at all. Um, the question is, were you concerned about your safety? God damn, yes I was. And did Defence do anything to put protective measures in at this point? No. So they didn't put any protective measures in in March and then they didn't put any defective, um, protective measures in in August? No. And they knew about the site? Do you know roughly they when they knew about the site? Roughly in dates? It doesn't matter. Oh, it was a week before I was told. Okay. So a week before? About the sixth, fifth or sixth. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You then... So I'm just going to move forward now. You took screenshots of the Facebook page and of the profiles of those that were friends. Sorry, can I just interrupt and, and, and put some further context around this? Which are all of these things. All, I'm mouthy, I'm wordy, and as is my husband, right? So, but you'll have to forgive me for a little bit. But for people to understand that what it was like, you need the full context of what it was like for not just to do psychology in the army at the time, where we were all, you know, uh, armed to the teeth. You need to understand what it was like for uh, a gay man to do uh, psychology in the army at that time. And not only, yes, a gay man and a psychologist. So I went to university and uh, one of the people I studied with was slaughtered to death by some uh, mass, a serial killer who had, and I'll, you know, the, the, this person was a, uh, I think if you remember the, the, the description correctly, he was a psychosexual deviant who did, uh, became obsessed and stalked this colleague of mine and, yeah, slashed, you know, like, sh she suffered. In her I'll home ask, and her workplace. I'll just ask, Colonel, that you just refrain from giving any graphic details Sorry. just to prevent any triggering for those watching. I, I apologise, but I think it's important to... Because nobody seemed to understand that there are particular threats for those of us who practise psychology. At that time, gay men were being... Can I, can I say what was happening, Shannon? I don't know what you're going to say, Colonel. So it's just you, you can you can say things, but it's just be mindful about going into any graphic details that might be violent. Well, suffice to, suffice to say that that New South Wales has had a commission about just how many gay men were being killed, fifty metres from my office front door, and and you know that was a ton, and and the cover-ups that were happening at at that time. Yeah, so th th there's. That, that will, if anybody, that will tell you. Lots, lots of gay men. So what was happening to you, so I, what I'm taking from what you've said there, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that what was happening to you was happening within that context. Yeah, within that context, that's right. And? That any decent human being being told that would understand, wow, that's, that's shit. And any decent person in terms of, in your workplace, someone to understand what this must have been like for you. Yeah. And yet they did nothing. Yeah, all except one. Except the person except that the you one who told me, yep. You then fly down to Melbourne? No, that's not true. That happened the next year. So oh, I it, see. it remained uh, private, which is my goal, and then at, at some point it... It hit the media and I, I, I knew the night before and I thought, oh, God damn. You know, I've got to tell the parents and I don't want them to see it in the newspaper. Yes. So that's why I was flying down to beat the newspapers so being delivered. back to that then when we get to, get to that point. So then on the 11th of August yep. 2010, you made a verbal complaint of unacceptable behaviour. Is that correct? I did. And... When you made this complaint, what rank did you hold? Major. And in terms of your chain of command, um, without naming any names or where you were sure. based, what were the ranks above you at that time? I was a major, so it conventionally goes up uh, lieutenant colonel and then full colonel, and then down the hallway were one star and two star generals. 
And what year did you become Lieutenant Colonel? Oh, I honestly don't recall. But I think maybe 2012. Okay. I don't know. That's fine. And But you would say that you are, were at the most senior leader, level of leadership within within the Army when you made the... Well, at, I was certainly around it. Yes. And what was the basis of the complaint? And that's at paragraph 60. And if you like, I can just read it out, if you like. Sure. A group of 80 soldiers had established a, a hate site on Facebook directed at me and five other individuals as the first steps in a process to out and intimidate every gay member of the ADF. Correct. That was the basis of your complaint? It was. And did you make that complaint to someone in your chain of command? Yes, I did, to my and, superior. Yep, and, 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 and when you made that complaint, it was to your direct superior? Yes, to my direct superior, but I also spoke to superior. And, and at what rank are we there now? Are we at so my, my superior was a lieutenant colonel, and then superior was a full colonel. Thank you. And did you say anything to anyone within? Um, well, sorry, uh, sorry. I withdraw that. When you made the complaint to your direct yes. superior, how did your superior respond? And that's at paragraph seventy-five. If you need to refresh your memory, but can you remember what was said to you? Yeah, if I think I, I know what you uh, to what you are referring, but basically tried to save my career. Is that what we're referring to? Yeah, so uh, the boss called me in and said, are you sure you want to do this uh, unacceptable behaviour complaint? Because, you know, well, you know this could be career death <laughs> because these things don't go well and particularly with next door. Superior. Is that Superior, yep. Yeah. And... Did you, did you view at this time that your superior is someone who has a, a level of responsibility for your welfare? That's right. And did you find that comment to be supportive? It was the standard way that it was a pragmatic. It was pragmatic, yes. We all know you lodge an unacceptable behaviour complaint and uh, your bosses are kind of scored around how many of those they get each year or whether they should have trained their soldiers to behave better first. So if you're saying, oh, you know, whatever. So the problem is, yeah, it was a pragmatic way of support, but obviously it functioned in reality as intimidation to me to, so, you know, he was hinting, don't lodge the, a written report. Now, I think this is, gets to the point of most officers don't know, you can make a verbal report, it's done, it's in. And you don't have to put a, a, a written one in. So whether or not I went to put a written, written re report in or not, it doesn't matter. And you know, you don't even have to make a verbal claim. It, your, your boss just has to recognise that what you've been through is unacceptable behaviour to start one, to start a complaint process, and they should. Yeah, so it acted as intimidation, and that's what I stated. And so maybe my question wasn't phrased very well when I asked, was it supportive? Was, I'll ask it this way, was that response in accordance with the defence instructions at the time on managing unacceptable uh, behaviour? No. And did you say anything to anyone in the army about the comment that that your superior had said to you? I did, yes. And what was the outcome of that? Was there any outcome of that? Well, as I said to you before, you do not complain at, about a superior, a private walking, you know, they, they just do not go the sergeants. They just don't. You just do not blatantly say the boss has done something wrong because you get rep there's reprisals. So when you then told someone in the army, this is what I've been told. Yep. I've it acted to as make intimidation. A, yeah. yep. Did that person then say, I'll deal with it, don't worry? And no. When I say I'll deal with it, look, that's okay, we'll start the unacceptable behaviour complaint process. Did they no. say that? No. So you go to two people who are more senior than you 
and neither of those people initiate the unacceptable behaviour complaint process according to the defence instruction. As per paragraph 9 of the defence instruction, it is a lawful order which they are issued, the defence instruction, they were lawfully bound under a general order from the Chief of the Defence Force to, to start the process. They did not. And then, Colonel, on the 13th of February 2010, two days after you made the verbal complaint, you then lodge a written unacceptable behaviour complaint. Is that correct? 13th August, I believe. Did you just say 13th February? I did. Did I say that incorrectly? August. Yes. 13th that is August. August. Correct. Correct that for the record. I did. I remember it was a Friday night and all great things happen in the Army on a Friday night. That's when you're about to head off to the weekend and then you go, oh my God, I've got to do something. <laughs> Which is what they were meant to do. Uh, Colonel, I, I just ask, and it, this is my error, not yours, that um, in refraining from names, if you can also refrain from any pronouns. Ah. Yeah, in terms of identifying someone. Sure, yep, no problem. Thank you. So you make the... Only done by using plural pronouns, I think, these days. In, in terms of they or them? Yes. Yes, uh, I, I'm, I don't take any issue with that. That is permissible. They and them is very cool these days. I've got a lot of they and them friends. Thank you very much, Colonel. Uh, so you make the complaint on the 13th of August 2010 and... I am going to ask you about the sequence of that complaint, but before that, before I go there, the, the following weekend after you found out about the gay hate site... That's right. ..you find a note under your door in your, at your home, is that right? Correct. And would you like to tell the commissioners what the note said? Uh, it had written on it various things. It had uh, all fags out. Uh, it had the... Nazi SS uh, uh, type symbol there. It had uh, references to uh, SA crossed out. Mm. Can you recall how you felt knowing that someone had not only placed that note under your door, but that they knew where you lived? Well, I was shit scared. <laughs> Frankly, oh, god damn, you know, got my husband there, got the new dog, the dog especially, hubby can look after himself, but the dog, man, it, it, oh, I had visions of the, the dog being, you know, stuff to happen to the dog and I, I knew that if, you know, as sad as Graham getting murdered would be, that if they went the dog, I'd fucking lose it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was just bizarre. It was twilight zone. It was excruciatingly painful. Yeah, and yeah, it was terrible. Do you know how someone could get your address given all the security protocols within the Australian Defence Force? Ah, uh, well, you know, at the time it was it was BM, there was BM keys. You could get people's names and addresses like that. Yeah, if you were in if you're in the system. And. Did you inform defence or the civil police or ADFIS about the note? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I go and inform everything. I follow the law. And what was defence's response? Uh, or army's response? Nothing. And was there any support offered to you by army or defence when you reported this to them? On the Monday? No. Any time about the note? Did you get any support? About the note? No. Did, was there any... I, sh I showed it to, you know, I, I mean, I took a copy before I took it to the civil police and they took it into evidence. Um, and so I, 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 had a, I had a copy and, you know, I, I, all, all the generals saw it. The generals and the colonels. Get on your mate. You showed it to them. Yeah, we sat down across. I sat down across the, the, the desk from a two-star general, 
and we discussed what it was, what it meant, what it might have linked to, what the hate sites and the videos, or no, they, they might have come later, but you know, and we, there was this one on the site, which then subsequently uh, linked to other emergent videos. Yeah, it was, it, you know, and I, so I had so many conversations in such great detail. Um, you know, I, it, it, we, 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 we sent at least, it, we, we had, we, I think we counted it up later and we had at least 1,200 interactions with people trying to talk to people about what this was like and at least 100 at-length emails uh, to try and deal with this issue. That, that's over the period of... Oh, oh, over, over the period that, that were to come. But I, I, had, or, I had already sent an email on the, on the Friday about problems that were happening in it. Uh, you know, like given the verbal and the written thing, you know, by, by the Friday they should have they should have conducted what was legally bound for them to do. They were under the order, and these are the generals and the colonels that tell our sons and daughters to go to war and to follow their orders and to die for us in defence of the nation. And did they follow their own orders? No, they did not. They were legally bound, morally bound. Just to obey the same orders that they're giving out to privates. And that is to conduct a quick assessment within the first 24 hours of receiving an unacceptable behaviour complaint. It never happened. I, I thought at one stage it did. But it turns out that was a quick assessment to protect one of their own, not me. They never gave me one. And so at the time that you make the verbal complaint, the written complaint, you have a death threat, you now get a note put under your home yep. by someone that you don't know that is obviously derogatory as well. Yep. And you report it to someone in the army, you're saying quite high up to generals and colonels, and at no point... I'm asking you to say whether this is right or not. At no point someone says to you, here is the number of someone you can go and talk to to get support. Is that right? That, that's right. But I was the person people should go to to get support. I was a psychology officer. Now, but I, this is happening to you and what I'm asking you, did anybody at any point say... They just presume... Well, you're a senior officer. They just presume you're going to know. But nobody said that to no. you. Is that right? No, they didn't say that. They were, they, they were, I, just, just, I just think that they, their minds were blown. You know, it was just, they couldn't believe that the thing was happening and they couldn't believe that a bag would, in the army would complain about it, would actually say publicly, this is happening to me. They thought I'd be too shamed. Like, I just think they just had no fucking idea about how to react, which is weird since they run the goddamn place. And I was working in the health cell, let me point out to you. I'm in a health organisation. They're meant to be the epitome, the epitome of, of care and concern on, on health and uh, uh, mental health, physical health. It, it, it was... You know, if anyone's going to get it right, they should have got it right. The generals should have got it right. They, these, these people have been in the army 30, 40 years. If they can't follow, read, understand and follow their own orders, who can? Or, or express what, what you're meant to do as an army officer, as, as, a, as a human being, just, a, just basic care and concern for someone... In, in your workplace and someone, yeah, who you in other times have sent to goddamn fight for the country. Thank you, Colonel. And then you make the written complaint and you give evidence at paragraph 79 that the complaints were against each of the soldiers concerned in the gay hate site to ensure that the behaviour was stopped the complaint was to stop the circulation of the videos and the images and to protect the welfare of the other P 
people who Correct. were named and targeted in that. The targets, site. I call them, yes. Um, sorry. Just the targets, I call them. Correct. Yep, is targeted, and um, and many, and you also wanted to protect the welfare of those who work side by side, the soldiers vilifying them. By yeah, absolutely them right. Facebook, yeah, absolutely right. And and let me just say, I named by name all eighty people. So it essentially functioned as me lodging 80 separate unacceptable behaviour complaints. So at this point, through your complaint, ARMY are aware of names that they are associated are. with that site? Yes. And then you give evidence that you are particularly concerned for their safety, given the nature of the threats uh, that you had received at work and at home. And uh, there, there were six targets, by recollection, and... and 80 POIs, they say, 80 perps, yeah. And you, you've alluded to this uh, briefly, but can I ask you what, in terms of the defence instruction that was in force at that time, yep. what was then supposed to happen once the unacceptable complaint was lodged? What should that have triggered? Well, it, it's it's highly, you, it, you would think it's highly conventional. There's, there's, a, there's various types of inquiry it's, they're very well described uh, and they suit very different functions. The most basic is the quick assessment. It describes a, a, a very quick process that you're meant to do in the first 24 hours. At, at most, the first 24 hours, it really should happen immediately. Uh, yeah, so that was meant to happen. Did it happen? No, never. It never happened? No. So up until the time that you were discharged in or that you left the army in 2017, no quick assessment was ever done in response to your unacceptable complaint. And just about the complaint, we'll come to other things yep. later, but just about the complaint on the 13th of August, 2010. I, I came to the mistaken impression that they had, but they hadn't. Okay, thank you. And at this point, were you given any information like, Here's the contact details for the Defence Council services to help you navigate the process. Yeah, no. Did you ever access Defence Council services? Uh, sorry, by council you mean legal services? Legal services. Yes, I did, yes. Yeah. But at this point, did anyone give you a little pamphlet or a written <laughs> note on a no. note to say, here no. you go, you can call these people? It wasn't a lot of uh, humanity going around. Would you say there was a lot of compassion going around? Yes, yeah, no. Empathy? <laughs> no. And then you give evidence that... Sorry, I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to laugh, but again, you need to understand... People think, and the army officers say, oh, we, we are the best leaders in the world. You can trust your children. Trust, you know, we, it's, it's leadership of people that inspires us and we, we love our soldiers. It's, it's all bullshit. They love equipment, it's what they love. People, not so much. Thank you, Colonel. And then you, before I ask you that, at this point, were you concerned about your safety? Yeah, totally, yeah, 100%. And to your knowledge, when you made the written complaint, do you know whether Army or Defence had taken any actions to find out who was behind? the Facebook page or restrict the movement of those soldiers? No, they hadn't done anything like that. They, they, they wanted to protect their reputation. They were right all over that, over army branding. No, we've got to get the army branding under control. But safety of people? Yeah, no. And again, I know I asked this before, but I'm, I'll, I'll continue to ask it because there was sure. a sequence of events. And they didn't do anything to put any protective measures around you or... Not at that time, no. And you sent an email, and you may have alluded to this. It yep. might have been this email, and you say it's the first of many. The first of many. To the chain of command, where you ask for assistance from the chain of command. And you, you actually make specific requests. You say, I want to be kept up to date with the adverse investigation. I'll come yep. to that in a moment. Sure. You wanted to get some PR advice from them because you were concerned about how the gay hate site would reflect on the army. And 
given the history, you say, given the history of systemic bastardisation. And then you also asked for a case liaison officer that you needed to feel safe at work, correct? I did. And it's interesting, you mentioned the referral to address there. I, 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 it, um, my mind is, yeah, there's something. But um, I'm a little bit, I fucking love the army. I love a hierarchy. I love, uh, I grew up in a Catholic church and I got 100% for religion. I, I, I like the law. I don't do anything illegal. I like to follow direction and give direction. So I read the defence instruction and followed it. And it concerned me that others didn't. And out It was the law, after all. It was a lawfully general order issued by the Chief of the Defence Force. And they were meant to do it. And I was meant to do it, and I did. Apologies again. I no, it's fine. You. I'm sorry. I thought you'd finish. Um, and so out of those numerous things that you asked for, and if I ca characterise it this way, you were reaching out for some help. I was. I was trying to help them help themselves. And to help you. That's right. And did you get any of that support? I was normally the helper, all right, you know, as a psychologist. No, nothing. Not for, not for a long time. And then we moved to the 28th of October 2010. Yeah. And your partner... Graeme Ross, you're also giving evidence today. You rang, Colonel, it's your evidence that you rang, that, that uh, Mr Ross rang uh, someone in your chain of command, someone high in your chain of command on the 28th of October 2020 to express your concern, Mr Ross, about... Uh, senior leader mismanagement of the unacceptable behaviour. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And would you like to just briefly tell the commissioners, if you can, just succinctly, what happened when you made that contact? Yes, I think I think it was actually the second phone call with this officer that I'd had. I'd had a prior one, which was just, you know, um, expressing my concern that these standard processes weren't um, uh, going as they should and that Paul was in a very poor state of health um, under the stress and was very concerned about his safety. So I had this uh, follow-up call because nothing had changed. Um, and it was, I would say, a, a heated conversation because the officer was quite defensive um, about uh, that, uh, that, that I would actually <laughs> raise the issues. And I felt like, you know, that they weren't used to having somebody from the public question their um, decision making or whatever. Anyway, it continued through that conversation, and I, I concluded uh, in a forceful way saying, "Well, I, I will go to the Minister of Defence, and I will go to other parties um, and and call for public accountability uh, on this matter because it, it's you know we need to have an intervention here." And at the end of the conversation. The officer involved uh, stated that you've threatened my kids, and um, <laughs> then I didn't know anything about. I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, could we just cut the feed just for a moment? Well, Commissioners, if I cut the feed for a moment.
Proceed, thanks. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Yes, I, I had... Mr Ross, probably, the, the feed is now resumed and uh, for the benefit of those watching live and for the, for the transcript and for the record, can I ask what was said to you by this officer at the end of that call? Yes, the officer uh, said to me that I had threatened their children. Uh, I didn't know the officer. I didn't know they had children. I, I'd only spoken to them once on the phone previously. Um, and But they just hung up at that stage. So in my immediate reaction, I was profoundly impacted by that because Paul was obviously in a very poor state and I was reaching out to a senior officer in the Australian Army to get them to do what they should have already had done uh, and to protect him. Uh, and they, you know, provided that response that, you know, really, really... Um, impacted me and I knew immediately that it was sort of to degrade me and also to dissuade me from taking action in, in raising these matters with other, other parties, including the Minister. Did you receive any calls or have Defence contact you at all? I... After, I, after that situation? I, I initiated... I, I wrote an email to the Chief of the Army from Recollection and I called the Chief of the Army's office and I had a call back uh, subsequent and I had a letter back from the Chief of the Army. Um, they, uh, they asked me to be respectful um, to the officer concerned uh, when I had obviously not... Uh, I, I have a professional life and there's a way of having conversations that are heated and respectful um, and didn't overstep those marks. Um, and it was just a sort of a denial of what had happened, basically. And, and can, I, can I subsequently say, um, and I know you'll get on to this, but the IJDF report that was conducted um, uh, mentions, and it's a finding of the IJDF report, that my, my alleged statements were then reported to other uh, defence members by that officer uh, and the, uh, uh, so they were communicated within Paul's work environment and the IGADF concluded that they were false allegations. Thank you, Mr Ross. And we will return to the IGADF inquiry and its report. Can I just clarify that? The allegations against you were false. Yes, that's Thank correct. You. Thank you, Commissioner. Two things arising from that. You mentioned that Colonel, Ross, uh, Colonel Morgan was not well at that point. Is that why you needed to step in and start doing this advocacy? Yes, I mean, I think Paul would come home from work in a highly distressed state um, and, and we would look at these images that were still percolating around. They'd taken certain Facebook sites down, um, but the YouTube uh, and YouTube channels continued to be there. Paul's image was uh, from defence-related sources. There were images of other defence-related people, formal training videos that was sourced from the ADF. Um, and he would, he would break down as he watched this because he knew his career was being destroyed. Um, and he, he found it such a sort of repulsive um, sort of process. And the inaction uh, went to the heart of it. And the, the Facebook page, am I correct, actually had the army Rising Sun logo on it? Yes, it did. And I found the action, the inaction, degrading. I found the inaction more humiliating, more degrading than some evil threatening my life. 
the people that you had sworn that your life to, that you would give your life to, to, if they asked, and they did, they asked us to go to war, I, and I did, and yes, they, these people, yeah, people shot at me in war, so yes, and then they did nothing. They did not feel their side of the moral contract to look after, if you're gonna, uh, if you, if you're gonna ask soldiers to go to war, you have a moral obligation and a legal one to look after them in return. Can I clarify something for my benefit? The Nazi imagery on this website, um, was it um, shown in a laudatory or denigratory context? It was, it was absolutely lauding the Nazi. It was, sorry, it was, it was absolutely lauding the, the, the Nazis. The, the, the point is that the note I'd gotten un, under the door was also had Nazi references. I remember reading that it had the SS. That's uh, right. Symbol in effect written. Using and, you know, and if SS. you understand, if you understand the, the history, there's a particular thing around the the initials SA, which is obviously the site was Steve Austin. Still it's, it's, it's it's all very abstract, but yeah, yeah. It, was, it was yeah. You know. Can I add one other thing? Like some of these images on these sites had. Uh, um, representations of soldiers who had died with Nazi flags draped over coffins. Now, obviously, they were created images, but that's what they depicted. They, they, you know, one hopes that they didn't have Nazi flags draped over the coffins of Australian servicemen who had died. But that's what these... This is the type of material. Uh, and these... these these things showed, you know, people being thrown off buildings. It had, you know, horrendous images of brutalised people. Uh, and these were all connected through these embedded images in the Facebook site. Thank you. Mr Ross, I wanted to just... I didn't go through your background, but you mm -hmm. briefly mentioned it there, that I just wanted to say that it's... Correct, isn't it, that you had a fairly extensive career in the corporate world, is that right? That's correct. And you've historically managed large, complex businesses in large organisations, mm -hmm. is that right? That's correct. And you run your own corporate advisory business and have governance roles as an independent non-executive director, is that right? That's right. So is it fair to say that you know how organisations should work? It is, and I've never seen an organisation function like this. I mean, we'll get on to... When you say... The, you mean the, uh, the Defence Force or the Army? Yes. OK, thank you. Colonel Morgan, after Mr Ross then has this conversation, is it the case then that the Army initiated a quick assessment regarding your conduct in relation to your dealings with the senior leadership in your chain of command? Yes, that's right. You do not criticise the boss. How many times... Sorry. Can you tell the commissioners what happened as a result of that quick assessment? Just briefly, but can you tell the commissioners what happened? No. It, uh, uh, it's just out of my mind at the moment. That's OK. I can perhaps take it to you when I find the reference. Was it the case that you had an admission to hospital at that time? Yeah. And that was as a result? Around that time, yeah. Around that time? Yeah. But that was... Was it not one of the recommendations that came out of the quick assessment that you were to have a mental health assessment of some sort? I can't remember. Okay. We'll return to that if okay. we need to, Colonel. So moving now to the what I'll call the adverse. Oh, that. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that. Yeah, they did that. Can you tell the commissioners what they did? Yeah, they had me because, yeah, I mean, obviously I was extremely unwell, but uh, the relevant uh, senior officers had me assessed uh, 
to be whether or not I was fit to stand trial. What do you mean fit to stand trial? Well, you can be court-martialed for insubordination. And is that the... The, is that what was happening to, to you, that that quick assessment was an investigation into your conduct about the way that you were dealing or handling, trying to handle your unacceptable behaviour complaint? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was into the safety of the senior officer. That's how it was framed? Yeah, like, oh, like yeah. Like, I'm the threat here. And the... Yeah. Why do you the think... Thing, the thing is... I'm sorry for a slight diversion into army, army culture, but you, if you ever get criticised and, and it ever goes on your permanent record, you know, the consequences in the army are severe compared to civilian life. So if you're in a, if you're in a, a job, say, in an office building across from where we were, a civilian office was, and, and you get, you know, but it, you get told, oh, okay, no, you, you, if you fuck this unacceptable behaviour complaint. But if it happens in the army and it goes on to your record, which, you know, we were emailing and talking and whatever, what happens is you lose, uh, you lose postings. You know, like you could be sent to Weeper, as we mentioned the other day, you could sent to the middle of nowhere. You can lose your promotion. Right, which is the way you feed your children and your superannuation is totally tied to it. You, you, you could be given the most boring task in the world. So the army functions differently in that you don't get to choose. You are totally controlled. So any criticism is regarded as, you know, a threat. Yeah, and, when, and then there's the wordsmithing again. So, right, so if it, a threat, it's a threat to your income, right? It's not a threat to your physical safety, which is what was, I was being threatened with. Are you saying there that by making the complaint, it's a threat to somebody's... I, I, don't, th I, don't, think, I don't think that senior officer and most senior officers can differentiate in their own mind between someone coming at you with a knife and being held accountable for mismanaging an unacceptable behaviour complaint. They, they, they regard being held to account as more threatening than going to war. So, Colonel, with the adverse investigation, there were delays with the adverse investigation, is that right? That's an understatement, yes. And do you know, so you provided adverse with information, and this investigation, just for the record, is the investigation into the Facebook gay hate site. Yeah. So that the, the yeah. military police had decided to commence their investigation, their own investigation about the gay hate site. Sorry, just to be clear, the military police remained in uh, army at that time, but the investigative services, the detective arms, had been amalgamated a into a joint unit under the BCDF at that point. Thank you very much for clarifying that. So we'll just refer to it as adverse. Adverse, yeah. Yeah. And do you know whether the people that were at the beginning of that investigation, do you know whether the people that were, including yourself, but obviously they knew about you, but do you know whether the other people were notified that they had been named on that site? Did I know then? Yeah, did you know? No, that? I had no idea whether they'd been told. We, you know, obviously, anyway, all that. Yeah. Graham best to address this issue. And were you told why there were delays at the time? Uh, no. And you give evidence that it took 290 days from the time that you lodged your unacceptable, the unacceptable behaviour complaint before adverse investigator interviewed you. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Okay. So what happened was uh, they did speak to me three days in 
and uh, I gave them a lot of evidence and I said, I've got a lot more at home, you know, come and, come and talk to me again, which they didn't really do. And, um, but in terms of the first respondent, that was 290 days later. However, when, you know, questioned, um, again, wordsmithing. So whenever adverse got questioned, have you started the schedule of interviews in relation to uh, this issue? They would say, yes, we began it on day three. Meaning that I'd spoken to them. Not that they'd interviewed any of the respondents. But they tried to portray themselves as taking action repeatedly in numerous ways. And, uh, yeah, they weren't. And it took 441 days after you lodged the unacceptable behaviour complaint before the adverse investigation was completed. Is that correct? Correct. And during the investigation, the initial investigator was actually removed from the investigation and replaced by somebody else. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I, let, let me just let me just uh, make a, a, a remark, a slight diversion, if I can here, to talk. So, for the for the benefit of uh, everyone. So, in adverse, this is a, a, at a time when we're starting the joint shared services uh, model, and the the investigators, because there were very small numbers in each service, they were amalgamated in, in, into adverse. So, adverse has begun just three years prior. And uh, so, and, and there was there was a supposed advantage in in that, and the advantages was that, and this uh, the chief at the defence force at, at one stage said the advantage is that the chain of command it goes investigator, provost marshal me, or me BCDF me so CDF and. BCDF together, but it goes directly from a woe, from a, can I mention rank? Can't remember. Anyway, from, there's only two steps in terms of that. So, yeah, so this is how close it was to the top. That person's behaviour in not interviewing anyone for 10 months was well known one and two steps above, I believe. Because, anyway. Did you ever re receive the adverse report? No. You've never seen what's in it? No, I haven't. I've asked for it many, many times. I'm not shy in case that's not apparent. They refuse. You know, there, are, there are hundreds of hidden documents that they refuse to provide. Key ones, key documents. I hate being held to account for failure. Do you think that if a defence member is part of an investigation of some sort, that they should receive the investigation report, whether it's redacted or not redacted? God damn right I do. Why do you say that's important? Because, firstly, you need to understand, you need to understand well, they, they, they give you some kind of, oh, we've, we've done this. And, and you want to understand why. Why, why, have, you, why have you done that? Uh, why have you made that decision, not that decision? Because that, that one's really bad for me. That's shit. Uh, so tell me why that happened. You have to understand. And if, you, if they refuse, you, you're left in this mental limbo land. The situation is twilight zone as it is, let alone without people going, we refuse to tell you why we're doing what we're doing. Yes, there are documents, but, you know, you can't have them. I mean, it's not, yeah. And then on the 26th of October 2011, so this is over a year after you've lodged your unacceptable behaviour complaint, you get a letter notifying you about the outcome of the investigation. Is that correct? And that's at... No. I get someone's opinion about the outcome yeah, it was. It, it wasn't from 
adverse. No, you received it, it was message. someone. It went through someone else, and then they thought what they thought, and then they told me what they thought that those people had said. And in that letter, did it say that anyone would be held to account for what had happened? No. And you then also received. And just to be clear, that letter was not an outcome on your unacceptable behaviour decision. No, it's not. No, no, no. There's a structured way of delivering a, a, a decision in relation to an unacceptable behaviour complaint. That wasn't it. And then you receive a letter dated 24th of October 2011. And then that letter, what that letter is, is the letter that they sent to soldiers who were friends on the Facebook gay hate site. Is that right? Yeah. And can you recall what was in that letter? Essentially, it was advice on smart social media use, i.e., you know, do your gate hating in private. Don't get caught next time. That's how it read to me, that kind of thing. You know, and to be fair, you know, that's... When, when we... I, I, you know, I had nothing. She was, you know, fucking fag and backs to the wall and pillow biting this all over the army at that point. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, we went through, you know, it's just what was said at work. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but it's different when you get all t- <laughs> 80 people together, right, doing, doing this kind of thing. And it is smart to, if you keep you, your un- unacceptable opinions to yourself, and, and even as a soldier, you are entitled to your own opinions. And I fully support people having their own opinions in their own home between them and and their family. I've got plenty of opinions about them that I don't state publicly. Can you recall how the delays in the adverse investigation impacted on your mental health? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was totally, uh, yeah. It was devastating. Can Can you remember how it impacted on your family? I remember. It was just too painful to talk about. And that is absolutely fine, Colonel. It clearly had a serious impact on your yep. mental health, did it? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was I, yeah, 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 suicidal and oh, I've spent so much time in locked wards and with, with blood on my uniforms and I'm sorry to be graphic. It's okay, just take your time. And can I ask, at this point, so a year and two months after you lodged your unacceptable behaviour complaint, was de- was the army facilitating any support for you? Uh, I had a, a liaison officer, um, my lieutenant colonel. He was great, but um, that was you know because yeah, he was just communicating information, and uh, he as a he as a human being was, was yeah you know not every army officer is a. Can I swear? Can I be army-esque? <laughs> not, not every army officer is a bastard. One out of ten of them are absolutely the most amazing people on earth. Yeah. Nine out of ten, however. <laughs> not so great. Especially the higher up you go, <laughs> the worse it gets. For, for structural reasons, I have to point that out. There is a, there is a reason that the, the, the unique nature of the army structure drives these things. But, yeah, so he, he was good. He was, it wasn't his job, actually, to be nice to me, but he was. The rest of them, not so much. And, Colonel, in May 2011, the police then arrest and charge the person who admitted being responsible for the gay hate site. Correct. And... That person had left the service when that was done, is that correct? So they were a former serving member? Yes, oh, oh God. He was a former serving member and he was a veteran. Right, so they... they sorry, I apologies. Thank you. My apologies. They were a veteran. Yeah. But they were described relentlessly, including in the uh, IGADF report, as a civilian. Again, wordsmithing. You want to distance yourself from any responsibility? The army officers are 
the epitome of the wordsmith. You don't, you don't, you don't want to take, you don't think it's relevant that this guy was a, a, a that this person was a uh, veteran. It's 100% relevant because it, the whole issue is centred around that. Colonel, noting the time, what I intend yep. to do now is to just take you through the sequence of events to get to sure. your last redress of grievance and then to allow you some time to tell the commissioners why you think it happened yep. and your concluding comments. No worries. So around October 2010, you informed Adverse that you would lodge a formal complaint with the Australian Human Rights Commission, is that correct? That's right. And you were told uh, when you said that um, that you should not do that, is that right? No, I was not told. I was ordered using unique special military powers, unique to the Defence Force, I was explicitly, they explicitly invoked the unique military powers to contain me. That this is another way of trying to explain to people just how trapped you are in, in, in the army. You are trapped. They have special military powers to order you not to go to the Human Rights Commission. They used the special military powers of the promised marshal to order me. And did the IGADF inquiry report find that that was the case? Yes. And then you wrote to the Chief of Army about this, is that right? I did. And... He did nothing. He did nothing. And then in March, 1st of March 2012, so we're now coming up to nearly two years after the time you received the death threat. Yep. That's, and 568 days after you lodged the complaint. Yep. Uh, there was an appearance on the 7.30 report. Yeah, one of the generals got on. Was it the Chief of Army? It was. The 7.30 report. And then you give event, uh, evidence that um, there was some questioning about whether the soldiers had received disciplinary action. That's right. And your evidence is that he said warnings, formal warnings. That is literally true. He said that. And But that's not what happened, was it? No, that's a lie. Um, and then Army issued a correction, is that right? They, they issued something they called a correction. Was it a correction? No, it was a reinforcement of the lie using different words. And then your unacceptable behaviour complaint is then closed around the 29th of May 2012, 500 and, uh, 657 days after, is that correct? Yeah, they got sick of me asking what's happening. And then... And that was done by the rank of general. Correct. And by a submission of a closure report to Fairness Resolution Branch. And that's right. I don't need to go into that, but just that that's how it closed. And yep. it was, that's an unusual course, isn't it, to take with an unacceptable behaviour complaint? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then in You're meant to issue a goddamn decision. And there was no decision, was there? No, there has never been a decision. And then... You receive a letter from the Chief of Staff of the Army in June 2012. Yep. And then, Mr Ross, you're still doing a lot of advocacy at this point. I am, yes. You're writing lots of letters. Mm -hmm. You're writing to the Prime Minister. Yep. And you're detailing and, and when the documents get tendered, Commissioners, you will see letters from Mr Ross that can be up to six to eight pages giving fine details, specific details about what was happening. Is that correct? That's correct. And then you then, Colonel Morgan, receive an envelope, the hand marked, or well, I'll withdraw that. You receive an envelope from Army, is that right? Yes. And uh, operator, can you please display privately GRS 00000001091, my apologies. And can you also display privately, Lee, and if you can have them next to each other, if that's possible, 0903. Now, this letter, there yes. are two letters there. That's right. Can you tell the commissioners, is, is this a letter that is making out that 
there's a decision on your unacceptable behaviour complaint? That's right. That the, the, that had, everything had been done and had been finalised. Yep. Decision, blah, blah, blah. Everything required has been done in relation to your complaint. And in the envelope contained a decision brief, and I'll get to that in a moment. Yep. But what do you make of these two letters that you get? This is fucking gold. This, uh, man, they really fucked it here. They gave me the actual uh, final letter and then I, in my humble opinion, they accidentally put in the draft and the decision brief that backs the draft and you can see quite clearly the sequence of events where uh, a draft is presented uh, and what was done to that draft and what they were trying to fucking cover up when they presented in, the final letter. And in the draft, sorry, I'm struggling to see it myself, I'll just put this in. And in the draft it says... And this. That, that, one moment. In the draft it says that your unacceptable behaviour complaint was not in accordance with defence policy. Yes, Which is regrettable, it does. they say. But it doesn't say that in the... The clean letter, if I can No, that. it does not. Do you think you, you were meant to, and I know this is just, you know, your... There's no document. way you get working documents. That's a mistake. That is a blatant error. And it was the one insight, or one of the few, where I could see behind the veil that they knew what they were doing. They knew. This is not accidental. This is not accidental. Oh, we didn't realise we fucked up. It's stated right there in the draft and then slashed out. And then it says, this has now been addressed and the reports have been loaded onto the Army Incident Management System. Yep. Have you ever seen any of those reports? Uh, I'm not sure. And then if operator, again privately, can you display... 0895. Sorry, are we, are we going to address the second element there? Oh, apologies, yes. Operator, please please hold there. Apologies, Colonel, that's right. Yeah. There was another issue that you wanted to raise about these letters. Yeah, so as I said, this is lifting the veil on uh, another aspect of army culture. This is an aspect of army culture, army officer culture in particular, in which you do not admit error. Ever. You, that, that to admit error to the public, to the government, to anybody, to your junior or your senior, it is just something you never do. It is not acceptable. And that was slashed out. And then down below, you can see that they entirely knew what this mess was about. It's, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what, what it says. Can I say that? Um, the handwritten note, just above the black line. About the decision? Yeah, about the decision. Yes, of course you I, can say Sorry, that. I'm just I'm, I'm that's fine. trying that's, to respect... Yes, that's fine, Colonel. I love a law. I love, a, I love following, trying to at least, procedure. And uh, it's got decision underlined, and then it says, you could read it for me, and the redress of grievance process is also available to you. To no, no, the handwritten, no, the handwritten element. It says, what specific decision are we referring to? What specific decision are we referring to? They were well aware that they had completely rooted the... Sorry for being a pedant, but it actually says, to what specific decision are what, we referring... To what specific decision? To T-double-O. Yes, well... So presumably to, also... Yes. Yeah. To... Double O. To what specific decision? So they knew that they, in their, in their minds, that a decision was required to be made. Yeah, they, they totally knew it. They totally knew what they were doing. And then they, you know, yeah, then they present this wordsmith clean version that admits no fault, that never refers to making a decision or not making a, a decision, talks about finalising the complaint in line with the policy. Yeah. In the clean letter, though, it's still saying that there was a decision. I mean, in, yeah. in your view, and based on everything you've received, there was no decision. No, there has never been a decision. 
in line with the, the lawfully ordered discussion about what I, whether what I complained about meets the definition of unacceptable behaviour. And then, operator, if I can have you display, please, 0895, and this is the decision brief. That's right. And you want to raise the issue in paragraph four. Oh, sorry. Let me just... Can you see that there? We'll have that yep. expanded. Oh, thank you. This was about reporting obligations yep, right. were not met. They were not met. With defence policy, which is right. not what the letter said. And then it said, four command retrospectively compiled the required reports this year and these were loaded. On retrospectively backdated documents to make it look like they'd done what they were meant to do, but in fact they hadn't. And they, you know, bad army officer. You're admitting to the boss that, that we don't, we, you know, you're not allowed to admit that. That's why he slashed it out. That's and why they slashed it out. And all this time, you are mentally unwell? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so many psychiatrist visions, so many tears, so much uh, humiliating abasement of what it's like to be so unwell in the workplace. So many visits to locked wards and, yeah, I, I, was, I was so, so unwell. Colonel, you then take up the offer to do a statement of reasons. This is yes. now 800 and, 806 days after you lodged the unacceptable behaviour complaint, then it takes the Army 119 days to issue the Statement of Reasons, correct? Yes, that's correct. So a Statement of Reasons is a basic, simple document. It's a Whenever you're making a decision, you get out the policy, the evidence, you consider the logic and you come to a conclusion. You write it all down, you, you're going to write, you essentially you have to issue the decision, you issue the decision, fine. And then, then all it is is that, that working document about putting those things in that order. And you ask, you, you, the legal requirement is when, when if you're going to redress a decision, you want to understand why they did what they did, on what basis. Maybe they picked the wrong document, maybe they, they used too much evidence they weren't meant to use or, or whatever it was. And so, yeah, you're meant to be getting the statement of reasons in 14 days and they took 119 days. Yeah, slightly unlawful, you know. While I was extremely unwell, they knew what it was doing to me. And then later, they refused, yeah, they refused again, point blank, mm -hmm. the, following, the following year. And we won't display it, but they knew because there was a letter from a medical officer detailing your mental health. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So uh, my, uh, my boss at the time was a, a, a senior army general and is now an extremely senior army general. And um, yeah, so my doctor wrote to them and said, your, your, your decision or your act of the second time, right, of refusing to provide a statement of reasons, just point blank refusal to follow the goddamn law, that, that put, um, I'm sure the commissioner will understand, hopelessness, being trapped in a military system and getting more and more hopeless every day. There's no escape. There's no escape tunnel. There's one escape tunnel. That's it. You can kill yourself. And I felt that every day. Thank you, Colonel. I just, for the record, commissioners, want to say that the email that went to defence 
is dated 18th of June 2013. So that is slightly after this period around the statement of reasons. But is it fair to say, Colonel, if I can just finish, is it fair to say, though, that the Army were on notice of your mental health concerns because not only were you emailing but your partner, Mr Ross, was emailing and detailing how unwell you were. Is that right? Is that fair to say? Um, I, I will say I, I wrote many letters, you know, uh, repeatedly saying how, what, what a catastrophic effect this was having on Paul and describing in great detail uh, how he had mental health breakdowns and he'd self-harmed and um, had su suicidal ideation. OK, thank you. We'll just have to move on, Colonel. Sure. OK, and we'll, we'll turn to anything if, if you'd like to. Yeah, no problem. Anything. Then there's your first redress of grievance lodged yep. on the 7th, uh, December 2012. Yep. Anything happen with that? No. Second redress of grievance lodged on the 7th of December 2012. By recollection against the failure to provide a compliant statement of reasons. Yes, yeah, so the first one was about... The decision, failure, the, the fa so-called decision. Decision, and then the second one was about the decision, is that right? Was the second one... Let's I, not call it a decision because it wasn't a decision, but the second one was about... The, the, I, I, re, I redressed the failure to... Com to uh, com get a complying statement of reasons. This is what I needed to, to challenge the first decision. What policy did you use? What evidence did you use? What logic did you use? I ne I, you need that. It, it's only meant to take 14 days. Mm. And then there was an the issue that you raised about in, in one of your redress of grievance, the appointment of an administrative officer to deal with your case where you said there was a conflict of interest, correct? That's right. So I'd complained about actions and then uh, uh, around a series of people that were involved in initially and then so they have to appoint somebody to run the review. The, 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 an admin, it's called an administrative commanding officer uh, in relation to a redress of grievance. So and they run the, the review. Yep. And then in, you then end up approaching the Office of the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force on the 10th of February 2013. Yep. This is now 914 days after you lodged the unacceptable behaviour complaint. That's right. And, and, the, and, the, and the reason, just to step back one second, is because, you know, these people I'd complained about, you know who they appointed to be there to, to judge whether they'd done a great job or not? You know? They appointed this... General's immediate subordinate that sat outside their door. I, they were three steps away. I measured it. And, and nobody could see a blatant, blatant conflict of interest. I went everywhere. I went to, yeah. And you actually say in your evidence, and I'll just read this out, in terms of the impact of how it was having on you in terms of how you were viewing the army and the ethics around These the army. These people were immoral, inhuman. And can I read this out? I was in the mi I can't see where I said where I was. Sorry, did you want to finish that? In, generically speaking, I'm a psychologist. I worked with people specialising in... And I was at a high level. So, you know, it's not hard to put together. These people um, running the entire goddamn system for looking after suicidal people and when they get one in their own office they behave in illegal unethical immoral inhuman ways indifference was rampant this is generals and colonels we're talking about and you say, I genuinely no longer believe that there was any ethical army colonel or general in my chain of command. And that remains the... Yeah, absolutely. You're then interviewed by the office of the IGADF on the 26th of April 2013. Yes, yet more wordsmithing. The army likes to complain that it started... No, I go, went to the IGADF first. 
Yep. You initiated them. I initiated, and then they go, oh, my God, he's gone to the IGADF. Best we put in a request for the IGADF to do something in case he says that he got it all under the way. Oh, we, we better look like we're doing something, because he's gone to the IJDF. And then on the 1st of October 2013, 1,147 days after you lodged the unacceptable com behaviour complaint, that is now three years and two months, you received the outcome of the IDADF inquiry, is that correct? Yes. Army has a problem with timeliness. And... Paragraph 179 of your statement. Yep. You receive a letter on the 1st of October, and it's a letter, it's not the actual IDADF inquiry report, correct? No, that's right, it's not the you, report. You've never seen the report, have you? No, I'm not allowed the report. And. You list there, and I'm not going to go through all of no, them no, it's fine. in the interest of time, but these are the findings that the IGADF had made. Yeah. They found that the Army failed, and just say yes or no to this if you like, the Army failed to manage your complaint in accordance with policy. Yep. That an officer who assumed responsibility for managing and deciding the complaint could not be identified. Correct. In fact, they say that not one, they couldn't find one single person who was responsible for the complaint, is that right? There was not one officer, not one colonel, not one general that would accept responsibility or accountability. There was, they explicitly state there was disagreements amongst senior generals in relation to this point. The statement of reasons did not meet policy requirements, correct? Correct. There was an internal review that found significant shortcomings in the initial adverse investigation, correct? Yep. That it was not satisfactory that adverse investigations did not contact persons of interest until some 10 months after the matter was first referred, correct? Yeah, you wonder why I wanted to kill myself. It was, I felt so hopeless to have any Effect. And I could not tell people, you could, you were not allowed to, there are, there's no way out. In those 10 months, you know, what, what are you... Sorry, go on. Please don't apologise, Colonel. You... In a civilian organisation, you can go to uh, the Human Rights Commission, you can go to a union, but that's, you, you get charged with a crime if you go to a union in the army, you can go to Fair Work Australia in, 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 a, in a civilian, it, it's, a, no, you can't go to Fair Work Australia. We're not even given, we're not even contracted. There's no contract for army officers. There's a commission on, on it's a completely different legal structure. You have no out, there's no out. You, it, it's a, a crime to go to the media. It's a crime, they were, they were, they were using these extraordinary military powers to, to put the fucking boot on my neck. That's why it's different in the army. And while they were doing that, I was in love with the army. I fucking loved it. I loved it from the first moment. I, it was my first real deep and enduring love. And if they just, fix themselves, I'd fucking go back to them. Yeah. The way I've come to conceive of it is that you are trapped in, um, with a, a place that you are deeply in love with, that's service to the nation, in times of war, and it, it is abusing you. It's, it's like domestic violence. And if you want to know why people, that, it, that, that, it's not a shitty thing happening to you when you're working at the local fast food. Sorry. And does your case demonstrate that 
whilst there may be risks to people's mental health on deployment and in war, that non-combat service can place and has placed defence members at risk of suicide. Yes, absolutely. There are extraordinary demands in, in, in military life. I'll give you just two quick examples. You must salute. And if the officer does not drop their salute, you must not drop yours. So your hand movement is controlled on a moment-to-moment, day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. You are 100 percent controlled. If your senior officer places their right step forward, you place your right step forward. And if you, the anxiety you feel about falling out of step, literally and metaphorically, with your senior officers, it, it makes you sick because that's how you're trained. You are trained to love the army. It's a that they use cult-based training in in in, in principles in, in, in the recruit school. And you end up agreeing that you love this organisation and that they are 100% in control of you. And just the final finding for the IGADF report that I want to mention is that they found that the involvement of many senior officers in your case likely impeded effective management of your complaint of unacceptable behaviour. Is that correct? Because no officer likes to take accountability. And... They all want to shove it on to some, someone else. It's absolutely standard behaviour for senior army officers. And Colonel, in December 2006, you there's a further threat against your life. Is that yes. Right? And it went on. Oh, did I? Oh, so apologies uh, for the record. I, I think I said the wrong date. It's 2016. 16. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, it went on and on. Yep. And so, yeah. 2016. And also there were other times during the course of here where there was property, damage to your property at home. Yes, Is that right? the front door of the house was kicked in, the cars were attacked. You know, these and people, you know, you, you, you infer that they stalked us. But, you know, I, I'm a psychologist. I deal with people who display that kind of behaviour. Yeah, yeah, that's my job. And then there's a third redress of grievance... And you don't get the outcome of that redress of grievance until after you've been discharged. Is that until right? In 2017. After, until after I'd been discharged, correct. It's until after you've been discharged. Were you able to read that letter at that time? You, you, mean, it? you mean physically or psychologically? Both, if you like. <sighs> oh. Oh. <laughs> there are. Uh -huh. Degrading psychological effects that you get from this thing, and you know everyone's got the conventional war trauma, right? And you know, and, and what I what I've got is sometimes I wander the streets like I have Tourette's, and the other, you know, and the other thing that happens to me is that I have admin phobia, which sounds so weird, right? And, you know, it sounds... Oh, I, I can't deal with email. I, I can't answer the phone. I, can't, I struggle with every aspect of everyday life. You know, you, know, you know how I solve that? This guy, he does it for me. And then I personally had to hire, out of my own money, people to... Open my email for me and summarise for me in person, in person. Because I, yeah, yeah, it's terrible. I, I was in no state to read yet another. Fuck up, I just wanted to be out and leave this all behind. C commissioners, I note the time for the transcriber. I also note that I am going to seek an indulgence of I probably... There was probably 15 minutes left. There are some important matters for both the Colonel and Mr Ross to say in concluding remarks. May I suggest we have a very brief adjournment now for that and, and then return if you can grant me that indulgence? 
That should be fine. Um, just so you're aware, Colonel and Mr Ross, we have a two-hour limit for yep. our transcription people. They have to have a break every two hours, as you can appreciate. Oh, I see. Uh, we're just going to take a very short break and return. Yes, OK. We'll adjourn. All rise. Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide will adjourn to 11.20. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Yes, Ms Bridget. Thank you, for Commissioners. Colonel, before the adjournment, I had asked you questions that had come to the point of where you had been discharged from the Army, and that was in 2017. It was. That is seven years after the... You lodged the unacceptable behaviour complaint, is that correct? Indeed, yep. And there was, you received the, your, the outcome of the third redress of grievance to your home, is that correct? Yeah. And before I hand to you to share with the commissioners why you think this has all happened and how it's all been managed and your understanding of it. Sure. Any recommendations that you may have on that. Can I ask the support that you were receiving during the course of these seven years, was that self-initiated by you or did the Army assist you in providing any, any support? Well, here's another part of the trap. You aren't allowed to go to civilian health services. So, yeah, I initiated it, but I wasn't allowed to go outside, was I? What do you mean you weren't allowed? It's not legal to go to a civilian... If, if you're not allowed to go. If you do go to a civilian health practitioner, you have to bring back the report and, and, and include it and have your bosses told what you told your outside doctor. So that was the case while you were there? Yeah. Right. And if you can now share with the commissioners why you say this happened and any recommendations that you would like to make? Yeah, sure. Um, just a quick thing about my, my version as an organisational psychologist. Um, uh, not that I am, I'm not registered anymore, not practising, obviously, not just, but was in the past. Um, so, yeah, again, as my friends have challenged me, tell me, why is it different in the army? And why is it to, to civilian life? I've, I've emphasised that the, you fall in love with the army, but that you are in a trap that you can't, uh, there are fewer escape mechanisms for, and they cut off every single one of mine, I can tell you that. And then uh, there's a particular thing about uh, the nature of army service, and particularly about officer service, and that is that uh, you can't hire. You cannot hire a middle-ranking officer. I mean, you have to grow them from... So the rest of society has organisations in which there's cultural flow and information and modern thinking come in and out, and if you make a, a call against one colleague, then you can move on the next year if, if they're conducting a revenge campaign against you, right? 
But in the army, the, with that first day that you step into, uh, or the Defence Force, that first day you, you step into uh, training at ADFA, those 100 people are the 100 people that you need to convince to do stuff for you and you do stuff for them for the next 40 years. There is zero chance that you will gain outside influence, like people will, will teach you about what modern life is like. And there is zero chance that if you are asked to judge whether they had tried, whether, uh, whether you, ha whether your mate, your literal mate that you've known for 20 years had failed, a uh, CEO of infantry or whatever it might be, had failed to train his, their soldiers properly, you're never going to, you're never going to hold anyone to account. It's a goddamn self-protection racket, and I know that the soldiers know that. Army officer life, by necessity, and so I have some sympathy, but not a lot, because what the army asks of you, the way they ask of you to get around this fact that you have to be not, you know, you can't call, if, some, if one of your soldiers gives you an unacceptable behaviour complaint that, you know, someone over there under that person's command has done the wrong thing by you, you, you aren't. You aren't going to criticise them. You aren't going to sustain it. Because if you, if you sustain too many unacceptable behaviour complaints, you get sent to goddamn WEPA and your children have to move school and you lose your promotion. Right? The things that your family are doing for you, you owe them. You owe them protection. So you must, you must deny under whatever circumstances, you must not allow an unacceptable behaviour plank to get up because there will be retribution. Oh, so there's a bit of army officer culture for you. Uh, yeah. Just, just on that, you use the term delay, deter, deceive. Yeah. So those are... When you, when you say cover-up, right, it looks like a cover-up because if you were to run a cover-up, these are the sorts of things you would do. Is it conscious? Maybe some of the time when you're slashing letters to never admit that you made fault. Yeah, yeah, some of the time it's conscious, but mostly you're just acting in a biased manner towards protecting your, your peers because your, your health and well-being, the health and well-being of where your chills go to school, you've got to rip them away from their friends yet again. You know, you, you, you do not, you want to get the promotion. And, then, and, and let me just point out that every single one of the generals and colonels involved in my case were promoted. Every single one. There's no accountability. That's ridiculous. Not for officers. Accountability is for soldiers in, in real life. And even, not even then, sometimes. So what do you say is the solution or what's your recommendation? Well, I have mentioned it once before on television in 2013 that, and I think I remember saying this, we need an outside body to step in today to look after the welfare of abused. But I want to add today the abused and the accused because, you know, while, while I was abused, I was also accused. That thing at the end, 2016, that was a false accusation made against me. And we ran through all of this terrible stuff, right? That, the false accusation was, was you know, wiped out, right? So we need to look after, it's not the abused versus, the outside body is not, a, 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 it isn't a, a pay, well, in my view, it's, it's that you have paid professional people whose career it is, civilians, banned from military joining for seven years or so after you leave them, paid civilian people who are motivated and professionally developed in, in accountability and military justice. I think the, it's patently obvious to me that the army should lose its rights over military justice and that it, this is not a revolutionary concept. People have been recommended in this goddamn body for... See, 20, 2005, massive review, 1985, it's been opposed, who by, the senior, senior people in the army. They, they hate the idea of independent outside review. They, you see what they did to my husband? That's what they do. The independent, outside, paid, professional people 
who, when you are so, so unwell, that, that, that they take over for you. Also, let's just forget about me. Let's go to Private X. And Private X has, you know, been in the army for about, you know, comes from, you know, they don't, they don't have what I have, you know, degrees and senior officers and rich husbands, you know, they, they don't have. We need to build a system that, where Private X, let's just talk about the phone number, right? Private X on day one is given the number and said, if shit happens to you, you do not need to hold your boss to account because you cannot. What you need to do is report it there outside the system. They will then take over for you. And if you get psychiatrically unwell, you don't need to be the one. You, you know, this is what the army currently asks people to do. You could, they asked me to do things while I was in a locked psychiatric ward for fuck's sake. It's insane. The current system is insane. We are not insane. We, 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 and, and we did not veer off. We stayed on the path of truth. We, I persisted for years and was finally justified. It's the army that veered off. I hear all of these commentaries in the Royal Commission from senior officers and even psychologists and other people going, oh, and then they go off into this uh, strange, you know, complaining behaviour or this other thing. No. I stayed on the path of truth. That's what the army asks of you. They ask of you to show they, you, the solution they currently have for this peer protection racket that army officers run is moral courage. That's their solution right now. And in war, yeah, moral courage, yeah, yeah. And, and in extraordinary circumstances, moral courage is absolutely something you should expect army officers to display and soldiers. But the reality is they got a lot to lose. Right? It's structurally not possible to hold your peer to account when you've known them for 20 years and you're going to need to know them for 20 other years. There's no other army to go to. It, you can't. This is part of the trap. It's part of the trap for the army officers, the senior generals, but you know, I have very little sympathy for them. So the way I conceive of it is it's not the abused versus the accused, right? It's the abused and the accused, you know, they, they, they're, they're together and they say they need, both need in, independent outside representation. It's, it's not the abused versus the accused, it's the generals and colonels, the goddamn star ranks and red tabs versus the truth. But they can't handle the truth. They will do anything to escape it. Anything. They will threaten your family. They will allow the most degrading treatment of you to escape accountability. Anyway, so that's my... I said outside body, outside body. Everybody's been saying outside body now for years. Thank, thank you, Colonel. And before I turn to you, Mr Ross, and did you ever receive an apology from the Army or the ADF, Colonel Morgan? I did. And was that apology all a bit too late? Any apology at any time helps. The word apologise has unique power. Right? It, it, it is amazing what you can make up for with a heartfelt apology. But what you have to go through to get that apology is disgusting. Thank you. Mr Ross, I understand that you would like to share with the commissioners the impact that, it, that this situation has had on you and the advocacy that you've had to do for Colonel Morgan and your experience with DBA getting access to mental health care for Colonel Morgan? Uh, yes, um, and I'll, I'll be succinct given the time pressures. Um, you know, Paul has described his 
sense of hopelessness um, and vulnerability. I mean, obviously, that translated to me and our family in terms of profound anxiety um, and distress. Uh, we, we felt that we were incredibly at risk of being harmed when people were coming to our home and doing these things. And that sense of hopelessness uh, was magnified by the fact that nothing that we did could intercede over all of this time. And, and Paul and uh, the commissioners you know, heard that you know, I took exceptional steps. I would ring the Minister of Defence, uh, write to the Minister of Defence, the Minister for Defence Personnel, uh, the CDF, the Chief of Service, uh, you know, all the way through the commanding. And I'm talking 30 or more letters describing what was happening to him in a concurrent way. Um, and, and, you know, what I come out of this with, which is probably a bigger lesson in my life, is that I expected, like Paul did, that the Australian government and an organisation like the Australian Defence Force actually stood for some values. I mean, why do we send people to places to protect our interests of Australia if this is the type of treatment that this organisation perpetu perpetuates and how it treats its people? And, you know, I know we have to... The Defence Force is a very complex organisation and it has a very tough job, but this is not the way to treat people. And this, the, the level of suicide, et cetera, is just an unacceptable outcome. And it's a, it's a national tragedy. Um, you know, and, and so I was, you know, advocated so much and it was just a, it was a hopeless exercise because we would face false information being provided to us um, and definitively false. There's no question about it. Um, breaches of the defence instructions, obviously, but... You know, what sort of organisation, when you're talking about a sense of fairness and justice, what sort of organisation doesn't tell uh, five of the other targets that were targeted in this Facebook page uh, that they were targets for, I think it was nine months? You know, nine months those other people had to wait to be told that they were on these, represented with images of themselves, with pornography and everything else, with colleagues that were there um, uh, around that, and that, you know, those, that, that Facebook page was linked with the, uh, with the death threats that Paul, you know, had received, and they were, they were other members being targeted and one of them had received. I don't not understand how an organisation can think it is in the interest of its people to withhold for nine months uh, that type of information. And I will only reference quickly. In 2016, you commented, and Paul is not so aware of this because he wasn't well, but another party linked with those that Facebook site made vexatious comments about Paul, but also death threats against him. And the Australian Army decided not to tell him again. The only reason he found out about those, uh, um, those threats was because an adverse officer uh, may mistakenly called him. And Paul lodged a redress of grievance around that complaint uh, and saying that they had failed in their duty of care. Uh, and there, there was a response generated that found that defence had not um, violated its duty of care and breached defence policy. Now, that party is definitively linked with the parties of the original, um, you know, Facebook thing by admission in the, these documents that go to... Because there was a legal report generated. But if you read the legal report... The legal, the legal officer in defence was not given the salient facts. They had no knowledge of Paul's past treatment. They had no knowledge of the Facebook page, and they, they had no, and they had no knowledge that he'd suffered trauma from defence not um, providing him with information. So he was left exposed to this person who was a convicted criminal, um, and and as I said, linked with these other parties, and and and. 
you read this legal report, which was attached to the, the finding decision in that case, delivered to him after he'd left, and it, it, the logic of it is beyond comprehension. They suggested that when that a, a external contractor to defence, who was in the capacity of an occupational therapist, who had no legal, no uh, mental health, and uh, uh, other than the occupational um, therapy perspective, was the party to advise Paul that he was in. You know, there was an adverse investigation going on. Now she did. She did not. Uh, they right. did not. They did not um, make. They didn't have any understanding, of course, and they did not tell Paul. And so he was in a state of profound mental illness on the path to discharge. An adverse officer calls him, tells him that this has all happened again in 2016, and then obviously he has a mental health crisis and is hospitalised. Uh, and, and then they go and investigate it. They said they've kept and met their obligations um, and that an external contractor who has no knowledge of any of these affairs um, and there was, there was no safety net or anything around him had told, had told him when in that same documentation she says, I did not tell. And I was so outraged about that, I went to the external contractor, their organisation, and they provided me with all of the documentation around the text messages and emails that that person had sent to the ADF um, officers involved. And, and it just blatantly makes clear that those representations are false. Mm. The last aspect of that, in terms of welfare of soldiers, which I think is something we've tried to talk about, they did a theoretical desktop appointment of a welfare officer to Paul. He didn't know about the issue. He didn't know he was being threatened. He didn't know the name of the welfare officer, but they satisfied, apparently, in their view, the, the requirements of duty of care to Paul in that desktop appointment. Thank you, Mr Ross. And I can give you 30 seconds if you also just wanted to comment on the impact on you. Oh, can I, can I, rather than, I think the impact is clear, but I, I will say, just to comment on DVA, um, there are wonderful people in DVA. They're doing their best. Um, they have to rely on a broken, in my view, external mental health um, capacity uh, system. Uh, and, but their best advice for a, a defence member facing a mental health crisis is to call an ambulance because they, they don't have any dedicated beds and they don't have, well, you know, um, mechanisms to get uh, veterans facing that into facilities that, that help them um, uh, not reach a crisis. So Paul is one of, was one of the highest ranking mental health workers in the ADF. Seven years after discharge, he has never had uh, programmatic PTSD treatment because they cannot find it and cannot do it. It took me writing to the Secretary of DVA after waiting 18 months to get uh, DBT therapy, which was pre-trauma. I had to reach out to the then Secretary after contacting the Minister and all of that. And, and you know, so when you, when you ring an ambulance, what happens is the ambulance come and fix the person up, takes them to the emergency department, and you stand there, they've got no beds, and uh, they want to discharge the person uh, within an hour, and they're discharging into your care. We can now resume the live feed, and if you want to just briefly conclude, Mr Ross. So, so as, as I said, the, the, the sense of desperation when you've tried to do everything legally possible to get an intervention, and then you go into another bureaucratic system that actually doesn't, you know, provide the level of care required. And it is designed as a no-fault system, which is great, because it means that people who have injuries just have to prove their injury. But when you're dealing with people that have been illegally harmed, 
and the service delivery is low, there's a sense of moral outrage. And I feel that outrage all the time because DVA cannot, you know, provide you with the services and you're saying, well, we tried to prevent the injury and the fence is responsible for this. And uh, I think that's, you know, a, a material and problematic position because in the whole scheme of DVA, you know, obviously there's compensation and, uh, you know, ability to make incapacity payments. But they, they do legal... They, they limit your capacity to take common law rights and cap certain types of damages. Right? So we've got defence harming people. They exit illegally. them... They exit illegally. Them, Ill illegally. And they exit them into DVA. Uh, and DVA don't know anything about those people. You know, we, we went through the Defence Abuse Response Task Force. The names of those people didn't get conveyed to either defence or DVA. You would have thought that was something, an opt-in strategy that would have been um, appropriate. Um, but you know, obviously the impacts have been profound and, and we need to change this. And my advice to people, you know, thinking about joining the ADF is I wouldn't. It's too dangerous. It's an honourable profession but not in the way it is administered today because nobody will be there to help you. For much of the time, I've always known that I'm the only person that can keep Paul alive because there are other systems and structures around, but when it comes down to actually preventing Paul, Paul you know, in, in engaging in suicidal behaviour or acting on that, um, those don't come into play. There's, you have to be there. You have to step in and, and that is profoundly traumatising yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Ross. And Colonel Morgan, I understand that you would like to thank a number of people and at this point we'll have some photos being displayed of you during your service. Uh, yes, I would. Um, I'd like to thank... Uh, Sergeant Kirsty Claymore for literally being a standout, outstanding. If I can get you that goddamn CSC, I will, because it makes me sick to see the people that failed me be rewarded and, and you who are literally more honourable and more brave to do a thing that no other member in the army would do, you deserve it. Uh, to Warrant Officer Class 2, Dan Deasy, Thanks for the shred, mm. you bastard. I'll get The other photos um, can be displayed, but just not that photo, please. And we'll resume the f feed. Colonel Morgan, please continue. Thank you. Uh, to one of my most loyal supporters who checks in on me, I see how I'm going, Warren Officer, Class 1 CP, you're a good man for a Warren Officer. So, to Sergeant Penny Looker, who she validated Graham and I as uh, two dad parents in the most amazing ways when I was going through the most amazing anti-gay shit. Uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Sarah Watson, uh, to my cousin, amazing cousin and photographer, Saul. Thanks, mate. Saul Morgan. Uh, to my loyal friend, uh, Sean Tulk. All my loyal friends. Uh, to my husband. <laughs> especially for your undying love, your unrelenting devotion to me and our family. And uh, I'd just like to... Uh, send, I know this is video for future purposes. My children are not watching today. I just want to send a message into the future. And I, I want to say, Daddy and Papa, we love you dearly. This is... This... 
This is why Papa screams in the night. We, we, we can't save you from that. I'm so sorry. But we, we want no other children of Australia to have their parents come on. And, and have, you have to see the things you have to see. No kids should have to listen to that. Kisses and hugs, my darling. I love you. And I just have one, one more thing to say. Uh, a, uh, we've spoken a lot about the terrible, shitty culture, right? Uh, but Australia has some unique elements. And I learned recently that, that, that one thing we do here in Australia is we use the word vale, and that's an Australian culture thing, right? And it's one of the greatest things, because vale means farewell. And so I'd just like to start by saying vale to those we have lost. As, an, as, a, as a psychology officer in the Australian Army, I see things through the frame of the, the battlefield of the mind. I say to you, the heroes of Australia who stayed on the path of truth when the entire goddamn organisation veered off away from you. I say to you, the heroes of Australia, dead at your own hands, having been abandoned by the generals and colonels, by the star ranks and the red tabs on the battlefield of the mind, I say, we will never forget you. We will never forget you. Farewell, Vale. Thank you, Colonel. Can I ask this before I turn to the commissioners who may have some questions for you? To this day, today, do you feel that in your case that justice has been done? No. And do there... you, Sorry, just one moment. And do you feel, as of today, in your case, that there has been accountability for what has been done? No, there's no, no, no accountability. I, 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 I welcome, I welcome the, any of the generals or colonels involved to come and speak to me. I'll say sorry for what they did. I, I welcome their points of view. I would welcome engagement with them. Like, that, that engagement is accountability. Right? Saying sorry is, it's, it's, it's personal accountability. Yeah, but none of them have done that in it. Yeah, they don't know. Thank you, Colonel. And can I also thank you for your courage for yep. giving evidence today? C can I return to the question about uh, has there been justice? Yes, of course. I'd like to say no, there has been no justice and there is no justice, not real justice in the Army and the Defence Force. There's no justice for the abused. There's no real justice for those who are accused. There's no justice for the low ranks, for the middle ranks. You know what? I wish I could administer some justice to the generals and colonels. That's who I reckon should get some justice. Thank you, May. Thank you, Colonel. And Mr. Ross, can I also thank you for your courage in giving evidence today at this Royal Commission? Thank you. Commissioners, I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Bridget. I'll be saying some things at the end, but um, I'll just check with my fellow commissioners if they have any questions. Commissioner Brown. Thank you. I, I, I don't have any questions. I just, <coughs> excuse me, also wanted to add my thanks to you both. I know this wasn't easy. Um, but it was very important for the Royal Commission to hear your account. 
I have to say it's profoundly disturbing to listen to. Um, but as I say, very important for this Royal Commission. It goes to some of the heart of the terms of reference. Um, and uh, again, just, just wanted to say a, a very heartfelt thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. I agree with what Commissioner Brown has just said and would also thank you, Colonel Morgan, for your very distinct courage in coming here and speaking to us and telling us what is an immensely important story for our Royal Commission. And thank you too, Mr Ross, not only for your courage in coming forward, but for the obviously very significant help you provide to Colonel Morgan. Thank you. I don't have any questions either, Colonel and Mr Ross, but there are a couple of points I just wanted to make. Um, I know we didn't get through everything in the 100 page odd statement today, but I, I hope you realise that we have read every word of every document that we've received. So the Commission is aware of the totality of the evidence and the, 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 the absolute impact of, of what has happened to you. Um, I don't think there's anything I can say that's going to fix things, but if you could take some small comfort. Um, you've brought up so many really important issues for the Commission today. Uh, just a, a quick uh, sample, if you like, of the ones that certainly resonated and will mean a great deal to us. Um, I and the Commissioners have been actually um, harping on, if you like, about the problem of um, the lack of specific accountability and responsibility when something goes dreadfully wrong. In fact, nobody owns it. Um, there are many fingers in the pie and there has not been, in many cases we've seen, um, actual responsibility by an individual or an office. And your case is one of the worst, I have to say, that we've seen. The second thing is you've really effectively highlighted for us the need for um, independent oversight and, and true um, independent review of some of the major decisions that happen that affect health and welfare in particular. And thirdly, and again, I thank you for this, the power of an apology. Um, really significant, really significant. I can't think of anything else right now, but I just, I just would really just want to thank you both uh, for your courage in standing up and coming forward today. As Commissioner Brown said, we know it's not easy, but it's absolutely and was absolutely essential for us to hear it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we just need to go through some other formalities now to see if others need to ask any questions. Miss Wright, did you have any questions for the Commonwealth? No, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, Ms. Damaris, uh, Mr. Damaris, sorry, do you have any questions? Rather than ask any question, can I just observe, it's understood, of course, why it hasn't been possible today to publicly tender statements and the bundle, but I know both witnesses, Colonel Morgan and Mr Ross, look forward to relevant issues being resolved so that um, that matter is in the public. Certainly. I think we'll, we'll certainly keep you apprised as well through Council Assisting and the Office of Solicitors Assisting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms Bridget, are any matters arising? No matters arising, Commissioner. Okay. Um, Thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you're excused from your summons to appear today. Yeah. Um, and we wish you every happiness as you go forward. Thank you. We hope today has helped. Oh, I, I, I often speak, I wish, you know, I would try to put this, you know, behind me, as I said. I, we, hope, we hope you can and we hope we've played some small part in that. But sometimes you're in this twilight, so you don't, you don't know what's real and what's not and have to be being invited to, it's a validation. It's a validation. And I hope that the people in the Defence Force who see that the, the Commission reaching out to do that validation feels, yeah, he got validated. And, and I feel validated too. So I hope you, you, that you, we want to express our thanks to you for, for that grounding and that, that this, this will help me. And I hope it helps the people of Australia and, 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 the, and the future members, maybe my own kids one day, in, in the Defence yes. Force. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, so you're excused from your summons to appear Thanks. today. Um, we'll adjourn for half an hour for lunch. All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 12.30.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon, Mr. Rigotti. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Commissioners, we will now hear from the Professor of Military Mental Health and Defence in Phoenix, Australia, Professor Jennifer Wilde. Uh, Professor Wilde will be giving, giving evidence on her role in defence as the Professor of Military Mental Health, her research program, which focuses on the mental health and wellbeing of ADF members, and her engagement with defence, and in particular, the mental health and wellbeing branch and JHC. I'd ask that the professor be sworn or affirmed. Do you, Jennifer Wilde, swear by almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. There is a tender bundle um, associated with this examination, if that might be displayed. It's three pages long, uh, and I attended the documents described therein in the manner described. Thank you, Mr. Rigotti. They'll be accepted into evidence and allocated the next lot of numbers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioners. Commissioners, in 2020, uh, the Joint Health Command engaged with Phoenix Australia, the Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health, and the University of Melbourne to establish a Professor of Military Mental Health position. And the position was to provide leadership in pursuit of academic research that links best practice and innovation with policy development and service delivery. Professor Wilde has occupied that position since the 26th of September 2022. Prior to that, uh, she was, Professor Wilde was a visiting uh, officer for the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Ox Oxford. Or I should say that was from September 22 as well, was it not? That's right. No, thank you. Um, and then prior to that position, from 2012 to 2022, Professor Wilde was an Associate Professor of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. Um, from 2009 to 2012, Professor Wilde was a Senior Lecturer and consulted clinical psychologist for the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College in London. And from 2003 to 2012, Professor Wilde was a clinical psychologist and lecturer for the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. Professor Wilde holds a doctorate of clinical psychology from the University of College London, which she obtained in 2000. Um, also a Master's of Education in Counselling and Clinical Psychology from the University of Toronto, which she obtained in 1995, and a Bachelor of Science also from the University of Toronto, which she obtained in 1990, among other professional and educational qualifications. Professor Wilde, does that accurately characterise your position? That is correct. Thank you. And Professor Wilde, is it correct to say that your subject matter expertise includes PTSD, social anxiety, and its treatment and evaluation. My area of expertise includes post-traumatic stress disorder and comorbidity, so major depression, and the prevention of these problems and the translation of evidence into practice in high-risk occupations. Thank you, I'm grateful for that. Um, now, Professor Wilde, prior to your being um, appointed to the position, uh, the Professor of Military Mental Health, that role was assumed by Associate Professor Lisa Dell for 12 months on an interim basis. Did you receive a formal handover from Professor Dell? I received a handover at AMA, uh, the Military Medicine Conference, um, where I first was introduced to members of Joint Health Command. And Lisa talked me through various projects that she had led on within Defense, which were the WATCH study and the Laser Eye study. Thank you. And tell me, in the work that you do, um, do you work on your own or do you work with a team of researchers? H how do you engage in the, the, the research programs? I, I work with Joint Health Command. I work with the Mental Health and Wellbeing Branch. Um, much of my work is done in consultation with various expert advisory groups and committees. Um, I do not work siloed, um, yes. 
it's, it's correct to say that you work on, on your own at the research but informed by the views of others. Would that be an accurate way to describe it? I, the, the work that I'm, I, I, yes, I do have my own office. I sit in my own office, but it's very much uh, informed uh, by the different consultation groups that I'm involved in and with Greenex Australia as well. Thank you. And you mentioned that you received a handover from JHC, is that correct, when you assumed the role? I received a handover from Lisa Dell. I see. But, and but was JHC also involved in any fashion in that handover? Informally, I, it was an informal handover from Lisa Dell, and it was, uh, I was just meeting JHC for the first time when I was at Emma when I arrived in the country. Thank you. And tell me, when you were first in, you first assumed the role and introduced to the issues that was to consider, um, what was identified to you as the, the major areas of challenge for, for defence and, and for study? I think this, this was an open area, and um, I think what became really apparent that a systematic approach needed to be taken to determine the areas that were important to address. And so the defense health research strategy had just been um, formalized and that had been presented at AMA. And the uh, director of health research had presented at AMA this, the defense health research strategy, had asked, had identified the priority areas and then had asked members in the audience who were a range of current serving, ex-serving academics to input uh, their priority priority areas within each priority area. So uh, I was interested in mental health and well-being, so the audience inputted um, their priority areas into mental health and well-being. I then analyzed the inputs and distilled them into themes. I then held uh, six think tanks with academic experts and with defense members to um, identify what looked like would be the priority areas within mental health and well-being. And what emerged um, were two areas that captured the core concern, and this was delivering prevention and improving recovery. So I'll, I'll just check the transcript because I didn't hear that quite clearly, I'm afraid. I, I say that delivering prevention and improving recovery, I think yeah. was your sense. Um, and, and, and when you, you speak there of the um, priority areas of research, Tell me, does that, are you familiar with the Defence Health Research Priorities document for 2022 to 2025? And is that, it's the that's questionable one, are you aware of that document? I am aware of the Defence Health Research Framework 2021 to 2025. Yep. Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll indicate then that the Defence Health Research Priorities document from 2022 to 2025 outlined eight priority areas for research. Um, so you can assume that if you're not familiar with the document. I'll tell you what the, those priority areas are and I'll invite you to, to tell me, or tell the commission, whether they conform to the priority areas that were first identified to you. Um, so they, they are these, measuring and monitoring the health of the force, uh, mental health and wellbeing, uh, musculoskeletal injuries, um, health of the future warfighter, health system performance and efficiency, infectious disease, gender and health, and occupational and environmental health. Is, is that what was you were told about when it comes to priority areas? We're speaking about the same document. Okay. Yeah. And, and might I just, if you could repeat, how did you describe that document? The Defence the defense Health Research Strategy Framework. Okay. 2021 to 2025. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would you could tell the Commission now, please, um, the, the programs of work that you are currently undertaking and the nature of your research? Okay. So my, the priority area I'm working in is uh, mental health and well-being. The program of work I'm undertaking is a programmatic approach to delivering prevention and improving recovery. Um, I provide, I've developed a program of work, which is a five-year body of work to deliver prevention and improve recovery. I'm involved in subject matter expertise and comment. I developed a programmatic um, approach paper, um, which was endorsed by the Health Select Committee. This was because I had observed that a lot of the research that had been commissioned uh, was ad hoc, it's quite ad hoc. There didn't seem to be 
kind of programmatic approach to delivering end outcomes. Um, and we know that the, the most effective way to deliver interventions with the highest efficacy uh, need to take a programmatic approach. Um, so I developed that where we're developing. Well, thank you, Valerie. Just pause you there and ask you some questions related to that. First, as to those eight priority areas that I identified, you are focused on the one being mental health and well-being. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and as to the programmatic research that you identified, is that a research program to prevent the onset and persistence of mental health problems in the ADF? Yes. Um, and when you say programmatic, do you mean by that a series of linked up studies or pieces of research? Is that correct? I would call them linked up studies um, that are, I can go into more detail about what the studies are, but they are linked up studies that build on the study, um, the earlier study to lead to uh, more precise and effective intervention. And, and why is that? That is because um, we absolutely need to apply the same level of rigor that we apply to physical ill health and prevention to mental ill health. So I'm gonna give an analogy because I think this demonstrates the point very clearly. But cardiovascular disease um, is common. We know, we know risk factors, like in mental health, we know risk factors, there are risk factors. In cardiovascular disease, one of the risk factors is fatty deposits in arteries. In order to develop the most effective intervention for reducing the incidence of cardiovascular disease, we have to have an evidence-based understanding of risk factors, one of which is fatty deposits in arteries. Once we have an evidence-based understanding of this risk, uh, then we can develop much more effective interventions. So for example, we know that sedentary behavior increases fatty deposits in arteries. That's one of the um, factors, there are many others. Once we've, that have been identified through understanding um, that, that risk factor, through an evidence-based understanding of that risk factor, and then we can target all of the, the contributing um, causal mechanisms of fatty deposits <laughs> to reduce cardiovascular disease. We have to apply that same approach to mental ill health, otherwise we're just throwing interventions that might work. We won't necessarily know why they work. When we have a physical health disease, we would not be satisfied going to the doctor to get an intervention if they told us it might work. We don't know how it works. Sometimes it works. We actually really have to have a good understanding of risk in order to develop the most precise and effective interventions. That's why we are taking a programmatic approach. Great, thank you. And tell me, are there any limitations with a programmatic approach? What might they be? I, I don't see a limitation. I think a limitation that could be perceived is that um, you need uh, two to five years for this kind of work. I see, and, and what is the time frame allocated for this research? Five years. Um, and might you explain to the Commission, please, the, the nature of the studies, each of the studies that you're undertaking in brief terms? Yes. So there are nine studies, and there is a precursor study, which I think is important to describe for the Commission. Um, when I arrived in the country, I, one of the first meetings I attended was in Brisbane, and um, I was told that um, veterans want a quick fix for mental health symptoms, and I asked if there were any data to support this, because certainly I was aware in the UK that um, the perception was that people want a quick fix for mental health uh, symptoms, and it wasn't until research had been conducted that it was determined that actually people want effective psychological interventions that work over drug treatments. So I thought, um, Professor Wild, I'm yeah. sorry to cut across you, but could I ask you just to speak a little bit more slowly for the stenographer? Okay, thank you. Um, so obviously we want data to understand what do ADF members want and why and uh, in relation to post-traumatic stress disorder. So the first study that I'm conducting that has just received organizational approval and will now be submitted to ethics is exactly that. Um, what do ADF members want for post-traumatic stress disorder and why? And so what this study involves is a brief description of the core features of PTSD, and it then lists the available support and treatment options, including drug intervention, peer support, talking therapies, um, self-management tools, chaplaincy. It describes, the questionnaire describes how each of these support or treatment options work, if that is known, and their evidence status. 
So members will be asked to imagine they develop symptoms of PTSD in the future. What um, intervention or support option would they choose if they were to choose support? And at what level of impact would they pursue this line of support, whether that would be a symptoms were having a mild, moderate, or severe impact on their life? When they select their preferred option for intervention or support, they are then prompted to indicate why they have selected that intervention. And the second questionnaire evaluates um, with various subscales whether that relates to fear of negative evaluation or stigma or perception that psychological interventions don't work or that they do work. We will be able to determine with this study why mem what members want, why they want, a particular intervention, we will be able to determine the role of fear of negative evaluation in someone's choices, the role of a sense of self-reliance in someone's choices as well. And I think that's really essential in terms of um, communication around interventions that are available and communication around um, or you know, updating around any misperceptions that somebody might have around an evidence-based intervention. So that's the pre precursor study. That's not part, actually, of the, the nine studies that form the five-year program of work. Y yes, and tell me, Professor Barn, how many members are enrolled in that precursor study, and what is the distribution across services? Yeah, so um, that study will, it's a survey going, it's across tri-services, mm -hmm. and uh, there will be, according to the sensitivity analysis, a minimum of 1,268 people are required for that study but there'll be equal representation across services. And, and you mentioned that there were nine further studies. Will that mm -hmm. same cohort also form the cohorts for each of those further studies, or will they be based on a different cohort? Well, not necessarily. Um, I don't think it, um, that first study is anonymous, so we won't know who's participated, and that's absolutely essential so that we get as honest answers as possible. Um, the next nine studies, the first study won't involve any participation from members, and this study uh, is aiming to um, evaluate the efficacy of psychoeducation for preventing the onset and persistence of mental health problems. So I've been involved in work in the UK um, where I've compared interventions that I've been involved in developing to psychoeducation um, for the British Army. I evaluated uh, British Army resilience intervention compared it to psychoeducation, neither were very effective at improving resilience or well-being or had any impact on mental health outcomes. And there is an emerging picture around psychoeducation. And so I think it's very important to determine for whom psychoeducation works and when it works um, in preventing mental health problems or reducing symptoms. So that, that's a rapid review. That's the first study. Studies two to four build on research um, that has been conducted with the ADF specifically already, and that's seminal research that's come out of Phoenix. That research has identified risk factors for later mental health problems, um, primarily focused on new recruits, which obviously are a very important target group because of the high rates of mental health problems in that age group, 18 to 27, yes. Well, can I ask you also, I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry to interrupt, if you could, would it be possible to move the microphone just a little further away from okay. the I'm not Like that? Is that better? I, th I think that's okay. better. I think it's the, um, the, the, the sound that's coming back. Okay. Um, so we know that uh, mental health problems first emerge in the 18 to 27-year-old age range. That's also the age range of new recruits. We know that from research that uh, Lisa Dell led on with the laser R study, this longitudinal resilience study, that there are modifiable risk factors for later mental health problems. Um, these relate to sleep, anger, negative experience of the social support or social withdrawal. They were overlapping findings in the WATCH study as well. So studies two to four are um, aimed at taking a rigorous approach and um, developing an evidence-based understanding of those risk factors so that we can develop precise and effective tools to target and modify them and reduce rates of mental health problems. Studies, study five is a randomized controlled trial of internet delivered cognitive training in prevention. This is an intervention that was developed in the UK that shows um, high rates of efficacy in terms of 
significantly reducing rates of PTSD and major depression at one year follow-up um, compared to alternative training and standard practice. Study six will be a study with mid-career to late uh, career members, and this will be evaluating the efficacy of the tools to target emerging symptoms and whether or not that um, effectively reduces rates of PTSD and depression. Study seven is uh, investigating whether or not we can train mental health teams to effectively deliver these tools and whether that's associated with reduced rates of mental health problems. Um, studies eight and nine focus on improving recovery. Study um, eight is making one change in um, Garrison Health, and that relates to introducing routine outcome monitoring. Routine outcome monitoring is about assessing symptoms um, every week that a patient presents for treatment, not just pre and post treatment. So that will be introduced every week. They will be completing measures related to their primary mental health problem. That introduction is typically associated with significant improvements in treatment success and reductions in treatment failures. And then finally, study nine will be a randomized controlled trial of internet-delivered cognitive therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, which achieves um, very high rates of recovery of over 77%, and also um, advanced statistical analyses, latent growth curve analyses, have demonstrated how that treatment works and why, which um, is essential and, and, ap and applies that same level of rigor to physical health that we want to apply to mental health. Thank you, Professor Wild. Now, earlier I asked you whether or not uh, that you observed any um, limitations in respect to the programmatic um, approach to research. Uh, and just returning to the topic of cohorts and they're not being necessarily the same cohort, do, do you consider that that might be one limitation in circumstances where we're looking at the, the research is intended to look at um, the impact on service and the engagement and service of um, defence members across the, the life cycle of, of defence? I, d I don't see that as a, as a limitation. Um, it's a very, the treatment preferences study is a very large study across the services. I don't see, and, and to be relatively representative, I don't see why we would have to select only those individuals for the subsequent studies. Okay. Thank you. Now, you mentioned the, the wellness action through checking health pro pro project, and that's the WATCH project. You weren't in involved in that project, as I understood it, because that was undertaken prior to your assuming the role. That's correct. Um, but that the, the, the you're familiar with that project? Yes. And you're familiar with the, the issues that were identified in that pro project? Yes. And they were, were they not, subclinical markers of potential future mental ill health or distress? Yes. And, and what were the three subclinical markers that were identified in that report? Sleep problems, yes. uh, irritability or anger, and social withdrawal. Thank you. Now tell me, um, does your research also seek to build on other research that's been undertaken? And I'll, I'll mention one project for the moment, and that is the Longitudinal ADF Study Evaluating Resilience Project, the Laser Resilience Study. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. And does your research build on that? Very specifically built on that, yeah. And can you explain in what way? Yes. So the laser R study was a large-scale longitudinal study of over 5,000 recruits to the ADF and investigated um, and identif aimed to identify modifiable risk factors. So these are risk factors that can be changed with training. Um, so the modifiable risk factors of later mental health problems and the laser R study identified uh, sleep problems, anger, irritability, negative experiences as social support or social interactions as predictors of later mental health problems. I've gone back to reanalyze the later laser data set and we've identified that rumination, um, which has also been established in the international literature as a risk factor for mental health problems, Rumination is also um, predictive of mental health problems um, in that cohort. Thank you. Um, and th that la laser research study, just to, to, to by way of background, that, that spanned some 10 years, did it not? That's correct. Um, and, and that also allowed for the investigation of um, psychological and behavioural attributes um, uh, uh, that might be associated with psychological resilience. Um, it, was it not in the ADF? looking at members as they adjust to 
and respond to the experience of the ADF, is that right? That's right, and the majority of members were resilient. Thank you. Um, now, when it, when it comes to the, the current research that you're undertaking, um, plainly enough that it could well be drawn from a high-risk population, is that fair to say? No, it won't be a high-risk population. We aren't selecting out people or who are high risk. The military is considered a high risk occupation, yes. but we aren't selecting high risk people within the military. I see, that there, there's a potential that amongst the cohort there might be some who are at high risk. Absolutely, and we've seen that in laser R. I, I can give more details if necessary. Yes, and, 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 and in this current research that you're undertaking, how are you managing for that? Um, this for, 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 for example, people dropping out and the like. Right. Um, well, we could go through that study by study, but essentially, um, I mean, for some of the studies, if people um, are scoring above threshold on a clinical measure of post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, we would obviously, it would be in their clinical best interest to have intervention if that's what they wish. They may also want to manage their symptoms with evidence-based tools. They may want to do that as a first option. But we will be um, assessing, uh, we, we have to, for the nature of the research, determine mental health symptoms so that we can look at what's influencing outcome. Um, but generally, it's standard practice in these research programs that if somebody is struggling, so they have symptoms, they have clinical impairment, and they want treatment, that they are signposted for intervention. Thank you. Um, and now tell me, will well-being, I understand that well-being will be a secondary outcome that is um, examined in the research, is that correct? That's correct. And in what way will it be examined? The, the current way we will examine well-being is with a standard quantifiable measure of well-being, such as the Warwick Edinburgh Well-Being Scale. Um, I'm also aware in the Defence um, Veteran Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy that there is a well-being wheel that covers different domains relevant to well-being, such as housing, um, social connection. So I think it potentially will be important to capture measures that can speak to those domains so that they can translate onto those domains. I think that will, that will look at the functional outcome of well-being. Thank you. And might you explain to the Commission whether well-being and mental health are synonymous or whether there is different approaches to well-being and then mental ill health, for example. How do they, how do they all fit together? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, um, mental ill health sits on one end of a continuum. Um, well-being typically encompasses um, features such as how satisfied you are with your life. That's a proxy measure for well-being uh, in the Office for National Statistics in the UK. Um, it's actually a really <laughs> complex picture, and there's been some research that's been published in Nature, which has demonstrated sort of links well-being to happiness, and is trying to tease it apart. That some of the strategies that support happiness and well-being aren't necessarily the strategies that support um, recovery from mental ill health. I would agree with that. I think the processes that lead to the development of mental health problems quite far down the continuum, where someone is suffering from clinical impairment. So these are factors related to significant difficulty disengaging from rumination or significant abuse of alcohol and substances to control for symptoms that aren't necessarily the same processes that support well-being. So processes that might support well-being would be sleeping well, exercise, and whilst those are relevant to supporting mental health from a or recovering from mental ill health, they're not the same processes. Um, so it's, it's actually a, a very complex picture, but relevant. So obviously you can have a mental health disorder and have good well-being um, because you're being well taken care of, you have support in your family, you have your job. Um, having mental ill health doesn't mean that you don't have good well-being. Yes, and tell me, when it comes to suicidality and, 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 and suicide prevention, um, do you consider that the, in terms of effectiveness of the, the focus, is should the focus be yes certainly on well-being, but should the focus truly be on mental ill health or uh, 
and a quality of focus on, on, on the various issues or aspects of on the continuum? I think suicide prevention encompasses a multifactorial approach and people can be suicidal without having a mental ill, without having mental illness. Um, much of the time there is depression, um, but you know, there's also circadian rhythm disruption. There's, there's also that sense of entrapment and feeling um, overcome and overwhelmed with one's life. There's loneliness, there's con many, many contributing factors. So I, th I think you know, we have to do lots to help to prevent suicide. One of them is having good access to mental health treatments if somebody is suffering from mental ill health. But that's obviously not the only thing that has to be done given that there are many contributing factors to suicide. Thank you. Um, now, now tell me, as to your research priorities, put, putting aside this program of research that you've just addressed, are there other research priorities that you have or is this your main area of focus? Uh, delivering prevention and improving recovery is my main area. Okay, thank you. Um, and for other, uh, as for other studies or programs at the moment, this is all this is all you have. Okay. In Australia, this is yes. all I have, but I have other work. I understand. Um, now, tell me, have you had access to, or have you received any of the um, the evidence that has been before the Royal Commission on, from various mental health experts who have given evidence in relation to these various domains, so well-being um, impacts on on mental health. Uh, Sandy McFarlane has um, sent me um, some of his evidence. Thank you. Um, now, if I can move to another topic, are you involved in the development or the implementation in any way of the, or the assessment of the continuous improvement framework in defence? No. Thank you. Um, and now I'll move to another topic, and that is the mental health and wellbeing branch. Um, what is the nature of your engagement with that branch, if any? So I um, sit on the Defence and Mental Health and Veteran Wellbeing Strategy Advisory Group. So I am involved in giving um, expert input into the strategy. And I have met with Caitlin and we have discussed the five-year program of research. Uh, her team has um, reviewed it and given comments um, which were incorporated. Um, and you know, primarily my role is giving feedback, expert input onto the strategy. Thank you, and just for the benefit of the transcript, when you say Caitlin, you're referring to Brigadier Caitlin Langford, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, and I suppose the real nub of it for, for the Commission is, is how is your work being utilised and translated in the mental, wealth, uh, mental health and wellbeing branch, and to what extent is it? Is it being engaged with? Are you able to give any indication um, of your response to that question? Yes. So my my program of work is getting up and running. So there are no outcomes yet for my program of work, but the mental health and well-being branch have identified that they want to translate the outcomes of my work into what they're doing. But I don't have outcomes yet that can be translated for them. So my main role with them is to give expert into input into the strategy. Yes, have they indicated to you the way in which your outcomes might be utilised? Not yet. I think it, it, it would be an early discussion because we don't know what the outcomes will be. Like the psychoeducation, the rapid review is about to start on psychoeducation and depending on what that is, that, that may nuance the way psychoeducation is disseminated within defence. Thank you. Um, and moving from the mental health and wellbeing branch, um, do you have or have you engaged with the work health and safety branch of defence? No. Um, uh, in, in that case, I just wonder whether you were aware at all, even if you haven't engaged with the branch, um, of the mental stress review that was undertaken through that branch? No. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I'll just note for your benefit, um, that uh, review was one of six reviews conducted into risk areas that were identified by Defence People Group, uh, and it resulted in 85 factors, controls that give rise to risk, and among them, um, threats or causes of exposure to psychosocial risk at work, um, uh, and then and barriers to psychosocial stresses at work. 
it, having given that description, does that overlap in any way with the work you are undertaking? The, so the question is whether the work I'm undertaking is investigating psychosocial risk. That's right. That's correct. So yes, we in um, all of the studies that will be conducted with members, we are looking at organizational stressors which capture some of that, um, not just organizational stressors, but stressors in general that occur outside of work and family, domestic situations, housing, um, which are considered psychosocial risks. Bullying um, as well, we will have a measure of that in our stressor questionnaire. Thank you. But you haven't as yet provided any s input on the strategy developed by the Work Health and Safety Commission. Um, Department of Defence? I haven't um, been involved in the strategy, but I have reviewed um, a document um, for um, developing a resilience training for people who are supporting individuals who are undergoing highly stressful legal <laughs> um, investigations. Thank you. Um, now, move to another department, and that is the Department of Veterans Affairs. Are you able to indicate um, what engagement you've had with the department, given having mm -hmm. regard to the position you're yeah. in at the moment? So I um, sit on the Mental Health Expert Advisory Group, um, directed by Jenny Furman. And um, my role in that group is to give SME expert input. Um, we discuss different topics that are topical and relevant to DVA. Um, the last one was the use of ketamine to, the long-term use of ketamine to um, treat uh, treatment-resistant depression. Thank you. Um, and stick with me for a moment. Might I turn now to the mental, the defence and veteran mental, mental health and wellbeing strategy um, from 2024 to 2029. Now that is a draft strategy that's being developed across defence and DVA to provide a lifetime approach to mental health and wellbeing in respective members and veterans. Is that your understanding of the strategy? Yeah. Um, now, did you have any involvement in the development of that strategy? If so, what sort of involvement? My my role in the development has been to give regular input and feedback, um, which is being incorporated and has been incorporated. Yes, what was the feed feedback you've given? Um, primarily, uh, the strategy had a number of goals, of which there was no um, indication of how those goals would be evaluated against outcomes. And I thought it would be very important that um, the goals that were specified include uh, a method of operationalizing the goals um, so that they could be measurable, so that we could say over time, um, this was the goal, this is how we evaluated it, this was the outcome. Thank you. Um, now, you identified, I believe, in, in the course of your engagement in respect to that strategy uh, and called out a... Um, a UK strategy, that is a the, the UK Defence People Health and Wellbeing Strategy, is that right? That's right. From 2022 to 2027. Um, one aspect of that strategy is that it specifically identifies physical injury as a, a focus for as, as an aspect of mental health and wellbeing um, and health and wellbeing. Um, that at present hasn't, hasn't been incorporated in the, the draft of the current strategy across defence and DVA, is that correct? That topic? Uh, I'm not sure that is correct because it's looking at mental health and wellbeing. So obviously if somebody has a physical permanent injury, that's going to affect their mental health and wellbeing um, and how they respond and cope with that um, injury would be addressed, but it, doesn't, it may not be explicit. But it is, and uh, we do respond to injury. So if it is a marker of distress, it would be picked up in the strategy in the way that the, the strategy um, is written in terms of supporting people at all, um, 
all parts of the, the mental health continuum. Thank you. Um, and are, are you satisfied that the, the matters you have raised thus far in relation to the strategy have in fact been heard and responded to and incorporated where appropriate into it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, um, I have given a lot of feedback and um, yes, it has been. The, they, they have incorporated specifically what success will look like and how they will measure success and I think that's really important. Um, and uh, let me ask this, uh, as, as to metrics or means for evaluating the strategy and its effectiveness, um, they're, they're not contained in the, the strategy itself, are they? The strategy doesn't set out any metrics that pertain to performance, is that right? They, they have a page on how they are measuring the goals. And, and are you content that that is sufficient to pick up the, 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 the matters that you raised as to the need to call out um, clear goals for the strategy? I think they are clear and I think they will move in some direction in terms of being able to evaluate each of the goals. They will most likely um, want to expand on some of the areas in terms of deciding on whether or not to include a metric for well-being, for example or you know, potentially looking at um, number of days off work or whether the strategy leads to reduced days off work or reduced sickness absence, things like that. Um, and, and of course, goals is one matter, mm -hmm. but measuring performance against goals is another. Um, that is not contained in the strategy. Do you believe that such a, a, a measure will need to be set out somewhere in order to test the strategy's effectiveness? I think the goals and how they're going to meet them are in the strategy. It is outlined on one page of the strategy. Um, they, they are in the strategy, but specific measures, like you know whether I measure well-being with the work at Edinburgh Well-Being Scale or measure it against the domains um, that are identified in the strategy, that level of granularity is not in, in the strategy yet. Um, now, beneath the strategy, it is proposed that there will be various action plans that, that, that will sit beneath it. And one of those action plans is a suicide prevention action plan. Are you aware of that? I am aware of it. I'm not involved in it, no. Um, and are you aware of or involved in any of the other action plans that sit under the strategy? No. Do you think having regard to the research that you're undertaking, um, and it's a little difficult to say, but nonetheless, by reference only to the title, Suicide Prevention Action Plan, do you think that the work that you're undertaking might well contribute to the development of that plan? It might well be relevant to the development of that plan, yeah. Thank you. Just excuse me for a moment. So returning then to your engagement with the Royal Commission, um, can you explain the way in which you have en engaged with the, the Commission's work? Like, for example, you indicated that uh, Professor McFarlane sent you some materials. Um, are you able to describe whether you have engaged with the work of the Commission in any other way? I've been involved in the notices to produce and responding to notices to produce and checking the accuracy um, for various things that are relevant to the work that I'm involved in before they're handed over. Yes, and in terms of receiving um, other evidence in, in the Royal Commission or papers tendered in the Royal Commission, have you yourself obtained that or has Defence provided that to you or DVA provided that to you? Defence has provided some papers. Um, I have read some papers. Um, I have read some submissions and I have reviewed some of the PowerPoint submissions. And what was the context in which they were, that was all provided? Was it for the purposes of this examination mm. or was it for the purposes of your work? It was when I joined. <laughs> yes. when um, I joined and in what way have you utilised the information contained in that material? I have utilised the information in terms of informing 
the research priorities that sit within mental health and well-being, which is part of that defense research strategy framework, health research strategy framework. Thank you, Professor Wallach. No further questions, Commissioners? Thank you very much, Ms. Rivigotti. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I'm just, perhaps if I can just um, pick up on, <laughs> on that last uh, element. So your research program doesn't specifically address suicide prevention. It, it addresses a number of things that may well be relevant to suicide prevention, but it's not specifically suicide prevention. Um, but, but you have been provided with information to this Royal Commission that's about suicide prevention or was it around mental health more broadly? It was around mental health more broadly, yes, and risk factors. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just clarify in my own head, and I apologise if Council went through this and I missed it at the beginning, but to whom do you actually, by whom are you employed and to, to whom do you report? So I am employed by the University of Melbourne and um, I report to the um, Surgeon General and I report to the Director of Health Research within Defence and my I have a line manager at the University of Melbourne and I have a line manager within Defence. Okay. So how often do you meet with the Surgeon General? I meet with her every six months. Every? Six months. Six months. So what understanding, in terms of um, the research that you're doing, and I appreciate it's, it's very early um, and we're nowhere near a translation type um, stage yet, but what understanding have you been given about how defence health services, mental health services operate now to potentially inform your current research program? So uh, I'm not I'm not clear on the so the what have I been told about defence mental health? Yeah, well, yeah. So what do you know about how defence um, delivers its current health and mental health um, services? Because you talked about um, you know interventions that are potentially mm -hmm. available and mm -hmm. and uh, how your research might help to shape that. I'm just understanding whether you uh, I I want to understand whether you know. Um, what happens now, or are you kind of developing this in the absence of that knowledge? No, and, and, and either might be an acceptable way forward, yes, I just want to know. Yes. Um, so my understanding is there, there are garrison, there's garrison health, and individuals can have treatment for um, diagnoses within uh, garrison health. There are also um, individuals providing services to defense who are BUPA uh, registered and qualified um, and that they're outsourced. Um, they're a little harder to um, determine quality assurance and competence. Um, so when study eight, which is looking at the routine outcome monitoring, which I think is the one that you may be referring to, we will look at a pilot site to work with a pilot site um, to keep it homogeneous within defense and look at the effects of routine outcome monitoring within that um, pilot site, which will be um, most likely Garrison Health in Canberra. Um, it could be elsewhere. Um, but yes, I've, I've been given an overview of um, mental health service providers to defense and what happens in Garrison Health. And do you see and again, just to understand, do you see the the sphere of your influence being primarily the primary health services delivered within Garrison Health, or do you see your sphere of influence potentially extending out to those external contracted providers? I think the primary beneficiary of this research will be the members themselves. The, most of the studies are aimed at um, delivering precise and effective tools that members can use to reduce um, risk of developing mental health problems, but also to reduce symptoms should they have those early markers or if they should have um, more severe markers. There is, uh, you know, 
in terms of the, the later randomized control trials I'll be running, um, that they will be delivered by um, clinicians within defense. Uh, so the, they'll be trained to deliver um, internet delivered cognitive therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. That won't touch on the uh, external providers of mental health services. Although having said that, Open Arms has been in touch with me. They're very interested in uh, internet delivered cognitive therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder for their veterans. Um, so that um, if that work with them goes ahead, then that would involve training um, clinicians who work for Open Arms to deliver uh, internet delivered cognitive therapy for PTSD. Um, and I'm possibly not um, relevant given what you've just said about the primary primary uh, influence being over service members themselves, but have you formed any view about the, the um, effectiveness and appropriateness of what's currently offered to service members? So I was told that um, service members have access to evidence-based intervention, um, and this will depend on the level of uh, quality of uh, intervention being delivered by, say, somebody covered by BUPA. Um, and they are offered evidence-based intervention within Garrison Health. Um, that's, that's what I'm told. Um, Have you seen anything that supports that to your satisfaction? I haven't evaluated it. I haven't been involved in, in evaluating that. Um, I can speak about translatable work that I've done with the National Health Service and differences and how interventions are delivered over time um, when people, you know, when clinicians um, uh, learn a new intervention or deliver an intervention without uh, ongoing supervision. But I'm not, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the Garrison Health. And the, the program of research is primarily focused on um, the prevention aspect. There are two studies focused on improving recovery they will be tightly controlled um, studies, um, which following which we would think about an implementation phase more broadly. And, and if I can just come to that in terms of uh, looking at the translation of your research, because that's generally the harder part of the equation. Um, do you have a sense that there will be, there is a commitment or will be a commitment to uh, providing the resources required to support that? Yes, there, there um, is definitely a commitment to improve recovery, and we know that this is one of the areas that has a knock-on effect on reducing suicide rates. We have a model already of implementation and dissemination because the, in, in the UK, um, uh, within health services, there had been a very kind of, um, and I'm not saying that this was done here at all, but there had been um, an ad hoc approach to delivering treatments for mental health disorders. And we put, my team in Oxford, um, we put forward a case to the government on utilizing evidence-based practice for mental health problems and put forward a, a health economics argument. They were, they were good value for money and they helped to get people off benefits and back into the workforce. Um, we then were funded to deliver um, evidence-based interventions primarily ones we had developed for anxiety, but also for post-traumatic stress disorder. We then trained over 3,000 clinicians within the National Health Service, and we are now um, rolling. So we rolled out the face-to-face -face intervention. Um, following COVID, we translated um, the intervention into a digitally enabled therapist-assisted version, and that has now been funded to roll out to all National Health Services within England. And there's a training and delivery model um, and the cost effectiveness of that has been evaluated. It's cost effective, it's good value for money. And so there's a model to draw on um, towards the end of this research when we're getting results in relation to, and I, I don't see why um, we wouldn't get similarly very highly effective results because this is an intervention that's been, when we're thinking about post-traumatic stress disorder specifically and improving recovery, it has shown demonstrated efficacy across populations uh, in different countries. And Professor, just one last question, just and really for the 
um, benefit of having this on the record. Can you perhaps just describe what you mean when you talk about recovery? Because many people equate recovery to the uh, absence of symptoms, whereas I think those of us who work within the mental health um, sector have a slightly different understanding. So just perhaps to get it on the record. Um, recovery in our research refers to loss of diagnosis. Sorry, so that loss of diagnosis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Landless. Uh, thanks, Professor. Um, earlier in your career, you were a lecturer, then senior lecturer at King's College in London. That um, you know, university, or part of university, uh, part of the University of London also has the King's Centre for Military Health Research. Did you ever get involved in their work? Yes, um, Neil Greenberg and I have published um, a paper together on um, pre-incident training to uh, improve resilience um, in first responders. Well, one of our earlier witnesses in this sitting, Major General Singleman, is a retired general, suggested that we in Australia need a uh, I suppose a, a centre of excellence in mm -hmm. military health research along the lines of the one at King's College. Do you know whether there's any thinking about the creation of your professorship at Melbourne University along those lines? Uh, I'm not aware of any thinking along those lines. So yours is a five-year professorship that's right. And you don't know whether it's permanent beyond that? No, I don't know. And you haven't heard any uh, contemplation of that sort of possibility? Not yet, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Just in relation to the UK program you've mentioned where it saw 3,000 clinicians trained and so on, I'm guessing that's not military specific at all? No, it's not military specific, but historically veterans have been seen as part of the National Health Service. Okay. Would you see um, a path, if you like, for that to be applied in Australia in a military context, focused on a military context? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and is there any, um, I'm, I'm, I apologise if we've missed it, but is there material published that um, assessed the, the success and uh, achievements of that program that we might have access to? Yes, it's all publicly available. Okay. Well, grateful if you can assist us with our, you know, offline down the track. It, um, um, we've been looking at ways, obviously, um, to assist, make recommendations, if you like, in relation to the treatment that people have been having or not having. And the UK seem to have a number of initiatives that we are looking at and have looked at. And one of them is the accreditation of um, GPs, for instance, uh, in a military in environment. So there's a number, a large number of people who are accredited in that space and they proudly display the sign and so on. We accept it's a different environment with the NHS. Obviously, in the UK, it's very different to what we've got here. But there's certainly some lessons there that may be helpful for us. But thank you. Thank, that's all I had. Just thank you for your evidence today. Um, Mr Fordham, did you have any matters you wanted to raise? No, thank you. Thank you. Ms Rubilotti? Commissioner, I did have just a couple of matters arising, actually, if you don't mind. Certainly. Um, uh, Commissioner Brown asked you how often you met with um, uh, JHC and I think you said every six months or so. Um, is that the same also with the Mental Health and Wellbeing branch? Sorry, I should um, just interrupt. The evidence was the Surgeon General, not JHC. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, the Surgeon General. Mm -hmm. um, is that the same uh, with Brigadier Langford? Or how often do you meet with Brigadier Langford? Let me put it that way. Um, um, well, I... I meet um, regularly for the defence and veteran mental health and wellbeing strategy. I think that's every, possibly every two months. Um, and we've met on two occasions um, related to research. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and in answer to a, a question that Commissioner Brown asked, you said that recovery means loss of diagnosis. Is that right? That's correct. Should, might, might you explain what that means for those who are not familiar with that, that phraseology? Mm -hmm. So um, we'll use post-traumatic stress disorder as an example. Um, it's assessed with various structured clinical tools. If it's assessed, for example, with a structured clinical interview for DSM-5 um, or the CAPS-5, um, in order to recover, you have to have 
will no longer have clinical impairment. So it's no longer the symptoms, if you have symptoms, they're no longer interfering with your life. Um, and you no longer have a duration of symptoms. So if you, you lose that, I've had these symptoms for at least one month duration criteria. Um, so it, it assesses, there are different ways of assessing recovery, but the most rigorous is through loss of diagnosis. You no longer meet diagnosis for the disorder. Thank you. Um, and tell me, Professor Wilder, are you able to indicate how your research outcomes will be disseminated through defence? Or do you not know the answer to that? I, I can broadly speak to that, I think. In, oh, I, I think you mean, ter do you mean, um, Gabriella, in terms of implementing or in terms of disseminating utilizing. the result? Oh, utilizing, utilizing the results. Has that been indicated to you? That hasn't, except I do know that the, the Mental Health and Wellbeing branch will be utilizing the results, and we've talked about that. Um, but uh, through what method yet, is, it's unclear. It depends on the results, apropos your previous answer, is that correct? Yeah. Um, thank you. And if we, could we just understand where your research sits within the clinical focus that JHC has, and then the wellbeing focus that the branch has? Do you, are you across? both areas or, or, or where, where do you locate your sphere of influence? These, this program of research is relevant to both areas. It has an improving recovery focus, which is relevant to JHC, and it has a prevention focus, which is relevant to the mental health and wellbeing branch. Thank you. And tell me, are there any formalised information sharing mechanisms as between you, JHC, and the branch? Any formalized sharing? Yes, information sharing mechanisms. Um, I pred no, I'm thinking about my work with the Surgeon General. I'm just thinking I, I, I give regular written updates. Um, when I meet with Caitlin, it's a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, there's no necessarily like formal Yet, I don't think there is. I think there will be once we have results. And, and meeting between um, uh, the three. Oh, I see the three. Um, well, JAC is involved in the mental health, defense and mental health wellbeing strategy. And, and, and yeah. that's the way. Yeah. Thank you. And I take it there's no such mechanism with the, the, um, uh, uh, the WHS branch. Work, health and safety. safety that's right. No. Yep. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Um, may the witness be excused from her summons to appear there? Yeah. Thank you, Thank you for your evidence today, Professor. Um, certainly very helpful. Uh, you're excused from your summons to appear today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there's no other matters, we'll just take a short adjournment for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 1.50 p.m. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Yes, Mr. Everybody. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, we will now hear from Rear Admiral Sarah Sharkey and Rear Admiral Sonia Bennett. Uh, Rear Admiral Sharkey has a dual role as Surgeon General of the ADF and Commander of Joint Health from 5 December 2019 until her retirement from the ADF in December 2023. This is her fourth appearance. 
uh, at this Royal Commission, her having given uh, oral evidence on the 14th of March 22 during hearing block three, 13th of April 2022 during hearing block four, and the 24th of May during uh, hearing block nine. Um, Admiral Sharkey's successor, Admiral Bennett, assumed the role of Surgeon General of the ADF and Commander of Joint Health on the 1st of December 2023. And it is her first appearance at this Royal Commission. Uh, might the witnesses be sworn? Do you, Sonia Bennett, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you, Sarah Sharkey, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. A tender, bu a tender bundle uh, accompanies this examination. Um, the tender bundle list is shown there. There are five pages. Um, among the um, documents indicated in the documents previously tendered, there are two documents that remain the subject of outstanding confidentiality claims, but the witnesses will not be taken to those parts of those documents. Um, the documents are otherwise tender, it, tended in the manner they're described. Thank you, Mr. Everybody. They'll be accepted on that basis then into evidence and allocated the next lot of numbers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, now, the purpose of this session, Commissioners, is to continue the theme um, that was identified with Mr Craig Sedgman of Bupa, the contracted healthcare services provider to defence and in certain respects DVA, and, and that is to explore aspects of clinical governance, including in particular clinical performance and effective, effectiveness, which is to say the, um, the delivery of safe and high quality care, healthcare, um, and the opportunities and risks associated with that delivery, particularly at the interface of healthcare teams, um, and further to explore quality improvement systems and the, the promotion within defence of continuous learning environment actively to manage risk and improve safety and the quality of care. Um, prior to going into that detail, though, it is appropriate, I think, to um, address a, a little of uh, Admiral Bennett's background, her having not appeared before the Commission. Um, Admiral Bennett, you assumed the role, as I said, of Surgeon General of the ADF and Commander of Joint Health on the 1st of December 2023, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And prior to that, did you have service in defence? I did. I, um, in February 1991, I probably can't give you the date, uh, I joined as a medical undergraduate student uh, and in the last two years of my degree and served in uh, uh, permanently in defence until 2009, uh, October 2009, uh, when I transferred out to what was then known as the Active Reserves. We now refer to them differently as service categories. Um, uh, and uh, as a public health physician, I was, uh, at that stage I was qualified as both a primary care practitioner and a public health physician. But in 2009, I joined uh, Queensland Health and worked for Queensland Health. Uh, and then most recently the Commonwealth Department of Health. Yes, and just, just um, to, to confirm, in the Commonwealth Department of Health and Aged Care, you're in fact the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Yes, and with the Queensland Department of Health, you're the Executive Dir Director of Communicable Diseases Branch and the Deputy Chief Health Officer, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And um, in that connection, you've been a member of a number of committees, including the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. Is that correct? Right? Um, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. Yes. And the Communicable Disease Network of Australia, and of which you were also a chair, I think, from 2019 to 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And as to your qualifications, Admiral Bennett, you have a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery. Correct? Correct. Um, you're, a, you have, you're a fellow of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. Correct. Um, you have a Master's of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, is that correct? Correct. And you're also a fellow of the Australian Faculty of Public Health Medicine, and that is a faculty of the Royal Australian, Australasian, I should say, College of Physicians, is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Um, now... If I might just start... Um, broadly to speak 
to address the, the roles and responsibilities that um, you had, Admiral Sharkey, and you now hold, Admiral Bennett, um, as Surgeon General and the Commander of Joint Health. Um, it, it's the case, is it not, that you, are, you were and you are the principal advisor of a high-level integration coordination of health services within Defence? Yeah, thank you. Um, and you have and you, you, you now do manage the delivery of garrison health services in Australia. Yes. Um, manage health research. Yes. Um, coordinate capability for health material. Yes. Um, exercise technical authority across all defence health services. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and develop health policy and programs. Yes. And essentially the, the authoritative source of strategic health advice. Um, and might I just co confirm one matter? When, when we say exercise technical authority, what is meant by that? So I understand it to mean really, uh, and we've heard over the uh, course of evidence being given about professional mastery, social mastery, military mastery. So it's the professional mastery aspects of our role. Uh, so the, the medical and, and technical aspects. So the, the health advice, uh, or more specifically the medical advice that we provide uh, both through uh, policy and implementation, but also strategically to um, command uh, and up through to CDS. Thank you. And would you agree with that, Admiral Shalke? I am. Thank you. Um, and you each heard at the, the introduction of this session that I, uh, I indicated the Commission would be addressing aspects of clinical governance. To inform those that are listening, I might go through some general prop propositions regarding clinical governance, and I invite you to indicate whether you agree or not. Um, so when we, we, we speak about clinical governance, we are speaking about the provision of good quality, timely and effective health care, and, and that depends upon robust clinical governance frameworks. Do you agree with that proposition? Yes. Um, and it, clinical governance is the set of relationships and responsibilities within a health service organisation, um, within its stakeholders. So we're talking about leadership, middle management, patients, and also other health care organisations, arguably. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, and it is a, a systematic means of ensuring that health services deliver safe and high quality care, continuously improve and deliver good clinical outcomes. Do you agree with that? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, and a good system of clinical governance has both a, an inward focus on the health organisation itself, but also, as I indicated earlier, focus on other health organisations and um, other others within the network of uh, acute and primary, the, the acute and primary care sector. Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree. Thank you. That, that was a yes. Thank you. Um, and in a well-governed health service, you have, as I also indicated, um, responsibilities at various levels of clinical governance. So. At, Leadership is involved in establishing the strategic policy frameworks, leading the organisational culture, um, overseeing management performance and, and, and monitoring organisational performance and accountability. Would you agree with that? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, and management, that management leads and coordinates the workforce and implements well-designed systems for the delivery of care. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, clinicians obviously enough maintain their skills. Um, and, and with a view to delivering high quality care, you would agree with that? Yes. yes. And of course patients uh, play a role too because they're partners in care and that's a, a fundamental matter to take, keep in mind and they need to be confident that they can engage with clinicians in, in, in their health and wellbeing. Would you agree with that? Yes. yes. Um, and that of course is all within a, the, delivered with a, a safe environment for the delivery of care. You accept that? Yes, yes. And to the extent that I've identified these clinical governance propositions, well, certainly they apply in a civilian sector, but equally they apply within defence, don't they? Yes. Mm. yes. Thank you. Um, if I can start then with the, the BUPA contract, because that's a, a key element, if you want to put about that, with, within the clinical governance framework within defence. Um, Admiral Sharkey, you gave evidence on a previous occasion, one of your previous occasions, that... Um, uh, the majority of garrison health services are procured under the BUPA defence contract. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, and you indicated on that occasion that 95% or more by volume of services. Do you recall that? Yes. And is that does that remain the case? Um, broadly, broadly, in the order of in the order. that magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and 
the clinical governance principles that I've just indicated, they of course apply to the management of the BUPA contract. You would each agree with that? Yes. Thank you. And if I can just um, display a document from the previously tendered list, no, document I, ACA.1001.0005.2299, at 293, so 2933, item I on the tender list. Um, so this is taken from the Productivity Commission report and I think you're directed, you've been directed to, to um, an aspect of the Productivity Commission report and we'll make sure we're on the right page two. Nine double three. Um, whilst that's being located, I might read it out to you. Um, what what is said there is that when governments choose to commission other providers to deliver services. They remain responsible for the range of functions that both determine what services should be made available and the effectiveness of those services. Um, and then it, what, what's more that is said there is that defence needs to accept full responsibility for the stewardship and delivery of the, in that case it says rehabilitation support services because that was being discussed in that aspect. But more broadly, do you accept that in the case of the procurement of third party services, defence is ultimately responsible for the delivery of those services insofar as you are overseeing that delivery. Do you ex each accept that? Yes, yes, I accept that. Thank you. Um, and because that is, of course, an aspect of oversight, oversight within the clinical governance framework. Thank you. Um, and I indeed, Admiral Sharkey, on the, on the previous occasion, you addressed the objective of the, the BUPA contract. Mm -hmm. And you, you said it's to provide assurance uh, around access to high quality healthcare services, to consolidate and provide improvements around the corporate governance arrangements over the way in which defence procures healthcare services, to improve the clinical governance arrangements over those services and provide opportunities for data informed continuous improvement within the defence health system. Do you recall that evidence? Yes. Yes. Um, and that, of course, remains your evidence today. Yes. Um, and that reflects the aspects of clinical governance we've been discussing. Yes. Um, and and in, in that, you identified a number of elements relevant to the BUPA contract. So I might, might address each of those elements individually. Uh, and then the first is your indication that the contract provides assurance around access to high quality healthcare services. Um, so I wish to explore the notion of access to those services. Um, now, BUPA's role is to provide clinicians to defence and defence determines how they operate on base, is that correct? Yes. Um, and are you, have you read and familiarised yourself with BUPA's response to the very notices to give that were issued to it? No, I have not. Um, Admiral Bennett? I have briefly reviewed both, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, for your benefit, Admiral Sharkey, what BUPA identified in at least one of those notices, and this is the first notice, it identified five, five drivers of um, supply challenge. So this is the supply of a, a suitably qualified workforce um, that are experienced by BUPA in resourcing defence with clinicians. And I might ask those to be displayed. And this is from Tender Bundle, at the Tender Bundle at C. It's, uh, let me give you the document number. It's BUP.0002.0001.0001. Fifteen to sixteen, you'll see that on screen, um, and you'll you'll see there that what is indicated. You'll see there. I'll give you an opportunity to read this. Mm -hmm. You'll see the five supply drivers are indicated there, and the reason these 
indicators are given by Bupa is in the context of there being a nationwide skill shortage in the health industry. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to read that if you can take that. And I, I take it you're familiar with that, um, Avil Bennett? Uh, I am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so of, of the various indicators that they list there, the first is that they, Boober indicates that there's an Australian-wide vacancy in healthcare positions. Would you each agree with that? Yes. yes. Um, they also indicate that there is a reduced pool of available healthcare workers and that in part it would seem that was in, in, impacted by border closures and, and fewer workers being in the country. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, they, they also indicate that one of the challenges to providing workforce to defence and clinicians to defence is that healthcare workers have a, a choice, a wide variety of choices, um, and so, some options might be more attractive to them than others. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, and I would probably say that is always the case, regardless of the, whether there's a shortage or not. Yes, mm. thank you. And, and would you agree with that? Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, there is also a narrow pool of available healthcare workers. Would you agree with that? Possibly linked to one of the earlier supply points? Yes. Yes, I think they reference the additional requirements, defence needs. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and also they mentioned defence geographical location, so there are perhaps some challenges to the supply of workers to defence because often bases are located in regional or remote areas. Would you agree with that? Yes. 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 <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the, the key um, impacts, of course, they identified to being able to provide a full suite of healthcare workers to defence is a shortage of workforce and also demographic imp impacts. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Um, and do you agree that difficulties with recruitment are experience more acutely in respect to on-base positions? Uh, in, in the, you mean as compared to or some a, other group or? Uh, a, a, as compared to any, any other, it, it, let, me, let me put it this way. Do you, do you, are you of the view that it is that the fact that workers are required, clinicians are required to work on base in the garrison environment is a further challenge to the recruitment of qualified healthcare workers? In so far as the location of our bases, as I think has been highlighted already in terms of the geographic location, in so far as um, on some of our bases there are some requirements um, uh, well, in, in fact, on all of our health facilities, there are some security um, requirements uh, in terms of working in our facilities and accessing our systems. Yes. Um, so the fact that we provide um, primary health care on our bases, I would agree, um, is uh, another factor that plays in. Thank you. Oh. Now, um, it, it would seem from... Sorry, the other witness... Yeah, I was just, to just about to add, I think if we we're talking in the context of remote working versus yes. physical on base working, yes. um, I think like any clinical workforce, face-to-face um, -face healthcare delivery is the norm. Uh, certainly pre-COVID, we've moved to other uh, models of care where face-to-face -face is not required and certainly defence and VUPA in that respect, you know, where care can be 
uh, appropriately delivered remotely, there's an allowance for that. Um, and those decisions are made locally based on business requirements. So what role is being filled, what model of uh, healthcare is being provided. Um, but there's no uh, more onerous requirement for clinical health service delivery in defence on base than I would expect would, would be the same in, in the public sector. I see. Um, could, I, could I ask you then just to, to address the matters raised by Bufa uh, at 54C and in particular the second paragraph there where I'd appreciate your response to that um, Vic, because w what they indicate that might be a at least a solution whether partial or total possibly partial, um, to skill sort shortages is a, more of a hybrid model, model of care delivery um, that has been, it would seem, discussed with Defence. The pro proposal was initially approved, but um, thereafter it is said that Defence subsequently decided that those roles needed to be provided in person, not hybrid or remote, to meet their requirements. Would you be able to... Re respond to that in circumstances where there is is a skill shortage, why it was thought that appropriate to have that on-base model uh, and, and the impacts of that? Uh, so in... Um, so you're asking me to respond... Uh, you're asking a question in the broad or specifically about that? Specifically in response to that. To that instance. Yes. Yes. Um, so, as I understand it, the circumstances around what is being described there um, relate to um, some initiatives from within Defence that we sought to increase the mental health workforce across the garrison. Um, and uh, in working with BUPA, um, de uh, determined uh, an approach to that and um, some tranches of... Uh, increases to the workforce plan mm -hmm. um, and as they sort of approach the last tranche of um, that recruitment process um, as I understand it um, Bupa raised some um, challenges they were facing in recruiting the required personnel yes. um, and uh, came back to defence, and, and these positions are face-to-face, -face, um, on-base clinicians across the footprint um, of the garrison. And, and just footprint. to confirm, what sort of clinicians are we talking about? So my understanding was that they were mental health care providers. I don't have the detail um, at hand of... Psychologists, psychiatrists, or presumably uh, psychiatrists. Probably not psychiatrists, yeah, but they would be mental health care, um, primary health care providers. So okay. it, it could be mental health nurses, um, psychologists. Yes. And tell me, why was it that Defence um, thought it best not to make those services available through a hybrid model? So as I understand it, um, the proposal that was provided by Bupa was proposing that the entirety of that workforce footprint be provided through a telepsychology service alone. Um, that's my understanding. Um, and that uh, the considerations that were made at the appropriate level in Joint Health Command determined that that would, would not meet the clinical need um, of our Garrison Health Service um, because we required um, for the safety and integrity of our garrison healthcare system, um, some face-to-face uh, -face clinicians who would be present uh, in our health facilities. But could I also add some context yes, that it is actually the fact that um, across the garrison footprint we do currently, um, and sorry, I obviously speak up to my tenure um, of handover at the 1st of December, um, do deliver telepsychology and telepsychiatry services um, that we have implemented in partnership with Bupa. Um, so there are arrangements uh, where there is, uh, you know, a hybrid service provided yes. uh, across Garrison. And, it, and that's currently the case, I take it? I, I agree with that. And I, I would add uh, that uh, because my focus is looking at 
progress that uh, my understanding is over 50% of garrison facilities have uh, telepsychiatry and telepsychology uh, and slightly more for telepsychology. Uh, and that was from a baseline of, of zero some years ago. So it's not that it's not happening. I read that as in that particular instance, there was a decision by command that it wasn't appropriate for that role. Yeah. And in fact, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Um, what's the position now? And from what point in time uh, can you say that that hybrid model, the 50% was introduced? I couldn't give you an exact date, but what I would say is that that model of delivering care has been something that has developed over the last few years of, um, during my tenure um, and particularly accelerated during um, the COVID years uh, where access to healthcare and the, you know, the provision of face-to-face -face care was clearly challenged um, yes. during the lockdown periods. No, no. Um, so, but I couldn't tell you exactly when we started, but we have for a very long time, many years, in fact, before my tenure as Commander Joint Health, um, had um, forms and been increasing our provision of telepsychology services and telepsychiatry services. Um, and I think we initially rolled out that service um, at the ADF Centre for Mental Health um, in, a, I would have to, take it on notice, but it, it is probably for at least five years or more. Um, Thank you. And tell me, as to the the hybrid model of delivery and the tele-psychology, the, the, the tele-delivery of services, is it limited to psych psychology uh, services, mental health services, or can you also obtain other clinical services by the, 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 the um, te tele-model of delivery? I understand there's telepsychiatry as well, so so the the two uh, yes. that I'm aware of, and and they exist in that continuous improvement framework that Bupa partners with Defence in developing. So yes, and um, I might also add that I do know that we have used some tele GP services. Um, so some of our primary healthcare practitioners. Um, general practitioners working in garrison um, and also in the occupational rehab space as well as I, I, I see. And has that been on an odd ad hoc basis or is that in a, um, you know, a cemented basis an approach to the delivery now of GP services and occupational rehabilitation? It has been a deliberate um, expansion uh, and change to the model of care. And are you able to indicate when that, those changes took place? I would need to take that on notice. Um, and are you able to indicate what percentage, roughly, um, of services are delivered via um, uh, remote means? Um, I, I think that the numbers have obviously fluctuated as we've had our journey through the COVID years, if I yes. might refer to them as that. Um, uh, and I think I recall seeing some data uh, that it might be in the order of um, five to ten percent of services um, in the discipline of um, mental health, as in psychology and psychiatry services. Um, but at what but point it might well, I could give some context to primary care because just after commencing my tenure, there was uh, over the Christmas period where historically services can be interrupted as people take leave. There was a a pilot of provision of uh, primary care telehealth services that occurred over that period um, and with the intent of um, historically if uh, somebody wants to access a GP appointment and it's not available then they would be um, uh, referred off base and, and go, on, go down that pathway to a uh, public GP. In this instance it was a pilot around telehealth for GP for primary care. Um, and which uh, provides a service to the patient and also um, convenience and that they don't have to travel large distances, particularly in remote areas. So we're still, I'm still waiting on the formal report from that pilot, but understand it was quite successful um, and probably in the order of 200 calls, but I couldn't, I couldn't commit to that, but that's my memory. Thank you. And tell me, in circumstances where there is a, a skilled sort of shortage of, of, of a suitably qualified clinical workforce, what other efforts has the JHC made to try to address that, that issue? 
So I speak um, obviously from the experience during my tenure. Um, it, it, we work collaboratively with Uber to explore a range of options. Um, we have, uh, you know, and across the full sort of scope of um, clinical service delivery in terms of on base and access to specialists, um, we have implemented uh, and piloted various things such as fly in, fly out um, clinics, um, the telehealth we've talked about. Um, we have also um, explored a, a range of other, um, uh, you know, opportunities where we might um, evaluate the scopes of practice um, that exist uh, from other sources that might provide us, um, uh, you know, some more capacity. So, for instance, um, you know, increasing um, the utilisation of nurse practitioners. Um, uh, so, so we certainly continue to, you know, to work on a range of opportunities um, that provide us that greater um, capacity. And tell me, are these opportunities that you have identified or identified and implemented? Uh, so we have identified them and implemented them, um, you know, where that's been feasible to do so. And has that been throughout Australia? Um, it has been in different locations around Australia. Um, and um, has it been sufficient to address the skill shortages that um, Defence is facing uh, in, in the provision of a, 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 an appropriately skilled clinical workforce? Um, I would say not entirely. Um, I think that there is an enduring challenge um, that Defence is not immune to. Uh, in terms of the skill shortage and the skill inequity in terms of distribution, um, you know, that, that is a, a national challenge. Right. Um, I guess, I mean, this, the skills shortage we're talking about, I think is coming from a position of uh, having challenges uh, with their fill rates. So the requirements def Defence has set and the ability to fill those positions, uh, which is which is different to defence experiencing a shortage of healthcare workers that impacts health service delivery. Um, you'd agree. So, and can you explain that difference? Uh, I think Boop is coming from the point of view that um, uh, under the contract, there's a requirement to uh, there are targets set for fill rates for different bases based on an assessment of of need. Uh, and they've been challenging to fill. You know, they were obviously committed to initially in the contract, but this this environment we're talking about with healthcare uh, worker shortage is impacting that. Um, but uh, I mean, as Admiral Sharkey said, there's been a range of things, and, and it's it, it, it's true. But to to minimise the impact on healthcare delivery, there's been a range of things that Booper and Defence have done together at the various uh, working groups. Um, some of which uh, Admiral Sharkey has. Um, explained uh, others I'm aware of is uh, just increasing um, Booper and Defence often go and visit the areas, the particular joint health units that might be having challenges to gain an understanding of what's required. There might be a reprioritisation of available personnel to critical areas. Um, but, but the figures that I've seen um, around tiered care, so if we talk about it, the, I think the contract measured it as tier one, tier two, and then non-critical and then flex. Tier one and tier two are, are routinely, across Australia, not broken down by, by unit, but routinely in the high 90s in a fill rate. So the, the main problems are with the flex workforce, the surge workforce, uh, and, and uh, uh, non-critical. Uh, non and I think occupational rehab is... is has a high fill rate as well. So, um, this it's so it's sort of we're talking about the fill rates as opposed to the health service delivery. I, I guess is what I'm saying. The impacts will be a little bit um, different, and there's a range of measures to to mitigate and and get across that. It's an ongoing area of work. Um, there are particular bases that have more challenges than others that the teams both focus on together. Uh, and I, I think the way that's done is working. 
And, and can you identify some other ways in which defence has sought to incentivise, if at all, the, the, the workforce to um, provide services to defence through BUPA? Um, so, we work in partnership with BUPA. Um, we've done some work over the years um, uh, to assist um, in developing and reviewing their employee value proposition. Um, and, uh, you know, that work is ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly have also supported a range of, um, you know, provider engagement, um, regional activities in which there is an opportunity for um, health care providers that are in local communities close to our bases um, to understand a bit more about uh, the role and the environment of working in defence. Um, we have uh, certainly sought to support and understand, um, you know, where the, and collaborate on um, with Bupa and their subcontractor on where the opportunities lie in terms of um, marketing opportunities, etc. You know, Bupa and their subcontractor are active um, participants in our annual. Um, Military Medicine Association meetings, for instance, which, um, you know, is an example of a forum in which uh, healthcare providers can um, seek to, uh, you know, learn a bit more and understand a bit more about working in that environment. Um, yes, and, and tell me, Admiral Sharkey, when you, you mentioned that you sought to support um, and understand and be aware of and collaborate with Bupa and subcontractors, in, in, can, can you provide some specificity to that? In what way? So, we have regular engagement with um, the team at Bupa across multiple levels. So, you know, at, at, at my level and at um, the executive team level and at the operational level um, within Joint Health Command, there is a constant interaction. Um, and in those governance forums that we... Um, hold with them risks and issues such as supply and the performance in terms of wait times are naturally discussed in those forums. And um, we, you know, work emanates and has emanated um, from those meetings and from those discussions where we will seek to target specific um, actions or initiatives. Uh, such as, just by way of example? to. Um, so, for example, just reflecting on um, the work that we did with them on uh, employee value propositions, um, as I recollect it, you know, we would have uh, t our teams, respective teams, um, relevant people participating in working groups and workshop and brainstorm ideas around um, how we might, um, you know, mutually support each other in, um, you know, in addressing some of these issues. Yes. And Bupa undertook a benchmarking exercise on salary, did it not, to try and um, to try to respond to the issue? You were aware of that? Uh, yes, I'm aware of that. And, and has, has JHC been involved in any way in responding to that or in been involved in that benchmarking exercise? I think that might have, a, I, I don't know the timing, but I'm aware of it, so it may be during my tenure. So I think they did a benchmarking around the modified Monash model, which the Department of Health uses for regionality and rurality. But, uh, and the, the team is, as Admiral Sharkey uh, has said, they are involved at every level, level. So nothing's done in isolation. And I think they provided that benchmarking to um, uh, the, my team responsible for management of the contract um, who gave some input and I think that's back with Bupa. So I don't, I'm not aware that there's an outcome uh, but there were certain aspects of that review uh, I think that didn't entirely um, align with the model. So it, it is about providing whilst wanting to incentivise uh, a workforce to come work for defence, making sure that there's also value for money in that as well. Yes, thank you. Um, just excuse me for a moment. Um, now, uh, the next topic I'd like to turn to is the, the quality, not just access to healthcare and the availability of healthcare providers, but then the, the, the quality of the, the service provision. 
Um, several witnesses before this Royal Commission have, have indicated certain issues with the, the quality of care provided. And I think it, it's a fair characterisation that um, there has been a concern with the loss of uniformed medical officers, um, a, a, a loss of unit expertise, and then the provision by third party contractors of clinical uh, services without the requisite experience in military medicine and, and cultural competency, defence cultural competency. Um, and in some instances, a lack of familiar familiarity with the Australian healthcare system. There, there have been issues that have been raised. Um, now, tell me, has JHC taken any steps to ascertain the cultural competency um, of BUPA clinicians? We... I, during the procurement activity, we identified the, the importance of cultural competency um, across that clinical workforce. Um, so it is an accepted um, you know, requirement that uh, the clinicians working in, uh, under that contract or are provided under that contract are um, supported in uh, optimising their cultural competency and we... Uh, but to the specific question of whether we have sought to assess or measure the cultural competency, I don't believe that Defence has undertaken any specific work um, to assess that level on the workforce. But, of course, we do assess and monitor um, the degree to which that workforce... Um, undertakes the training and induction and familiarisation activities that the workforce is required to do in order to work in that environment. So we assess um, that, that they have complied um, with undertaking the training and that is certainly monitored. Yes. Uh, and I would just um, add to that. I, I, I agree. I'm not aware any uh, measurement or assurance has been done, but... Um, I would reflect there's probably some recognition that that could be improved because it is in the forward plan under some of the continuous improvement activities to uh, uh, review and improve the induction process that occurs on garrison for health personnel. Yes, thank you. And, uh, and as to that topic, um, the induction, I understand that the, the certain training requirements are set out under the contract um, and the, the training includes, does it not, modules relating to suicide awareness in the ADF. Yes. Um, training on the defence environment. Yes. Right? Um, and then, th and when we say training on the defence environment, um, that will be on JHC policies and procedures, is that correct? Yes. Um, clinical governance procedures. Yes. Uh, and then understanding military medicine, is that right? Yes. Um, now, when, when you refer to those various modules, or I've referred to those various modules, um, which, if any of those, certainly they relate to procedure and, and how things are done, but do any particularly deal with those, those nuanced aspects of cultural competency? Because that's a different matter from understanding policy. I'm not sufficiently across the detail of each, the, the content of each of those modules that you've just, apart from identifying that they form elements of the training to provide an answer to that question. Admiral Bennett? Uh, no, I, I would probably be less informed at that point. I, I guess what I would say is the, you know, how the cultural competency is perceived, we, we're probably talking about from personnel. Uh, the which is assessing the effectiveness of the induction components you were talking about, just that there's an avenue. When we were talking about measurement and assurance, there is an avenue, obviously, of clinical incidents and complaints that that um, uh, personnel can utilise, I think, if they felt that there were challenges in that area with an encounter that they had with a particular clinician. 
Yes, and I, and I might come to that in a moment. But just on the question of assessing the adequacy of the training and cultural competency, how is it that um, you propose to undertake an assessment of that without fully understanding the nature of the, the training that is undertaken? So I, I think that there are certainly people in Joint Health Command who do have a deep understanding of the nature of the training. Mm. Yes. I just specifically don't have a detailed familiarity with the course content. I, I, and I would agree with that, understanding the team. There will be, there will be um, personnel within Joint Health Command and certainly even an on the basis uh, who, who would be able to answer that question in detail. But... Um, uh, I, I don't have that to hand, and and uh, and I would assume those packages and were developed with that in mind as well. Thank you. And so tell me, when is it uh, proposed that um, the assessment of, of the, the modules and programs be undertaken? You indicated that it was part of a, a future program of work. Are you able to indicate when this might take place? Uh, when I say assessment, it was part of the continuous improvement activities that both Bupa and um, Joint Health Command in one of the subgroups have have jointly agreed should be done. Uh, it was on the forward plan, and I suspect that will happen this year, I would imagine. Yeah, but, but, but at this stage, it's not yet um, scheduled, is it fair to say? Uh, it's, it was on a forward plan that I read, mm. so I, I would assume it is scheduled, and I think if it's there, I would expect, uh, and uh, could, could ask this question and lean in, that it would happen this year. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, it's the case, isn't it? This is something that needs to be directed quite, quite, quite clearly by defence, because Bupa, having coming from a civilian background, needs to be informed by defence and guided by defence in the type of training to be offered to its clinicians. Is that correct? Uh, yes. If I think if there are any any gaps in the modules that are provided, then. Uh, Defence would certainly be heavily involved in that. My concern is I'm not, I'm not clear on the problem we're talking about, the cultural... So I understand cultural competency and that there have been reports that it's an issue, but um, the detail of that uh, is, not, is certainly not available to me or where that's come from. Yes, and is, is it something that Defence proposes to investigate? Uh, again, I'm not sure the problem we're investigating. Uh, as I said, I think because it's on the forward plan, the team have identified there could be improvements in that in that area based on the the model they're using around quality improvement and feedback and a working group. So that's those improvements are working. I have no um, knowledge of any specific problems, nor indeed individual cases around that. I think that's part of the continuous quality improvement process that should be occurring. But I don't know if that's I mean, I, uh, my observation of it would be that in th in the time of my tenure, um, and in fact, you know, over my you know thirty years of <laughs> um, working in the defence health system, there is a constant awareness about cultural competence, mm -hmm. and so I, I'm not sure it's a um, you know a new um, challenge but it is um you know has has been an enduring theme that we have worked hard and will continue to commit to um you know investing in ways of um strengthening the cultural competence of our entire workforce all health workforces have some more well, workforces turn over and so there is naturally I think a process of induction and ensuring um, you know that people in that workforce are appropriately supervised and mentored and have um, supports around them in order to do that job so the same occurs even for the uniformed staff um, with new doctors who will join our services in uniform, there is a process of cultural competence that needs to be developed uh, in them as well. And so it, it's not something that I think is isolated 
just to the contracted workforce but to um, the defence health system and it will remain an enduring um, you know, target of ours as part of a quality healthcare system to ensure that our whole workforce um, is culturally competent. Yes, thank you. But for, for the moment, neither of you are aware quite what the improvements are that have been identified that, that need to be made in order to increase the cultural competency of the, of the workforce. No, I would... I object to this. <laughs> the problem is that the examiner has used a broad term about a single specific. Um, and whilst it's one thing to talk about cultural competency and training at a high level and what may or may not be done at a sort of policy level to deal with it, if there's going to be a discussion about people's knowledge or otherwise of the size or extent of a problem, my friend has to identify what the problem is. Um, well, the witnesses have identified that within JHC that there is a need to improve training around cultural competency. I hadn't observed that they were having trouble dealing with the language. But the difficulty is that there's a difference between the witnesses saying that because of turnover, etc., cultural competency will always be an issue that is on the radar and needs to be dealt with and a response to a problem. Do you want a definition of cultural competence? Well, what it is, it's actually being referred to as the cultural competency problem because one of the witnesses has already said, I don't have any specifics about what you're saying the issue is. I have no object. But the witnesses, it might be useful just to make sure we're on the same page. Yes, well, let me, let me ask this question. To the extent that um, within JHC, um, the need to improve, and I think you indicated this, Admiral Bennett, um, cultural competency has been identified and it's on the forward plan. Are you able to say, um, describe the various aspects of cultural competency that have been there identified? Um, I think my evidence was that there, um, in the continuous improvement framework... Yes. It had been identified that a piece of work uh, to be added to continuous quality improvement, which is a normal part of business, so not a need per se, but a normal part of continuous quality improvement was the induction process that takes place, place on Garrison. So insofar as how that links to cultural competency, so it was more about the induction that takes place for health incoming health personnel, recognising that a large aspect of that is around, uh, and it... it, it uh, it hasn't been identified specifically. It's just the recognition that an aspect of that would be around um, military cultural com competency for those and who what aren't do you familiar. Mean by that? What do you mean? Uh, by that? I would see if we're talking about military. I'm used to talking about cultural competency when we when we talk about um, indigenous people and multicultural aspects. So I think applying that to the military. Uh, it would be an understanding, cultural competency in someone would require an understanding of uh, the, the, well, the, the military culture per se, uh, the, different, the different challenges that, that personnel may have within the military where they're serving across the services, um, both uh, their, the challenges on deployment. So, but an understanding of uh, insofar as it's not general though, um, the challenges that military personnel face during their service, as well as the processes around um, uh, the requirements for health service delivery and how they differ from someone who might be a civilian. So, of course, there's a primary care element, but there's a large occupational health element as well. And, and of course, we're talking about um, mental health uh, here at the Commission and, and the specifics that people in the military may encounter from an exposure point of view or challenges uh, that those in the public may not. So a whole, a whole range of things around military service. Um, that that, that um, suffices for the moment as far as I'm concerned. Let me move on to another topic. Um, and that is another matter that you raised, Admiral Sharkey, in your previous evidence, namely um, the Bupa contract provided opportunities for data-informed continuous improvement, hence defence's entry into that. Now, when we discuss 
a continuous improvement, you, you would agree, would you not, that the flow of data is both ways, both data from Bupa, information from Bupa about performance to JHC, but also from JHC to Bupa, um, for example, about, and we'll come to this, health outcomes. Do you agree with that? Uh, so if I am to understand your question, that continuous improvement, in order for continuous improvement to work, um, it depends on a flow of data um, within the system. And in our case, we're specifically talking about our prime contractor and um, the Joint Health Command team. That's right. Yes, I would agree. Yes. Yep. Um, and y you may be familiar with Mr Sedgman's evidence that Bupa doesn't get data on health outcomes from JHC and his evidence was that Bupa would be assisted by that data. If you are you familiar with that evidence, each of you? I am familiar with that evidence. Thank you. Um, now, accepting that Bupa is the provider of some 95% there, thereabouts um, of health services, do you accept that Bupa might benefit from the provision of that data? I, I think it would be good to define health outcome data, um, which may be difficult because Mr Sedgman's not here. Certainly in the contract, I've been informed it's primarily around health service outcome data. Uh, and Bupa does receive that on a regular basis at the many committees that we talk about and in fact generates some of that health service outcome data. Yeah, so I, I would agree. I mean, I, th I think to me health outcome data and um, it refers to um, measures that would indicate the impact that a health service or a lack of health service has had on a patient that's engaged in that service. Um, I can't um, clearly, um, but I, I, I don't understand um, the evidence from our colleague, Mr Sedgman, in that there is, in my experience, a significant amount of data that is provided um, by Defence in the course of um, its partnership with Bupa um, at multiple levels of the organisation that would be health outcome data um, um, as part of that broad group. Yes, certainly. Um, are you able to, for some specificity, give some indication of what sort of data that includes? So, um, at a... I mean, I, it, it might help, I think, in answering the question if I'm um, permitted to, to talk in the general about um, yes. health outcome data in the defence health system um, and then specifically talk to um, Bupa and Bupa's yes. part in that. Yes. Um, so w within um, the health system, Health outcome data, uh, as I said, is a you know th there's a large proportion of it, and when we think about health outcome data, we can think about it in um, high fidelity or in the broad in terms of population level data. Um, there is data um, that is collected. Uh, and analysed and stored by the team across the continuum of the health um, system within Defence. That um, can be the clinicians who are dealing with individual patients um, who access health data that exists in the Defence Health Record System. And there is health outcome data um, that sits within that that's relevant to uh, individual patients. Um, there is then a whole raft of other health data that is considered at various levels of the organisation that includes things around access and quality um, measures. Um, for example, wait times, volumes of services, um, healthcare complaints and incidents data, low value care data, the 
um, occupational rehab outcome data, um, failed to attend data, um, you know, a, a whole raft of, and I, you know, from my memory, might uh, that's not an exhaustive list, um, but uh, and then that that data is is shared across the organisation. Um, we work with Bupa at multiple levels. Um, Bupa are a partner. Um, there are some 1,300 Bupa personnel who work as clinicians. Um, in our health centres who access part of that data all the time um, in the delivery of, of their roles. Um, senior contracted clinicians are also part of the clinical leadership team who um, have access to data uh, in the delivery of their roles. Uh, the low value care committee or low value care meetings, um, uh, that is a process in which our team works with the BUPA representatives um, to uh, evaluate and consider a whole um, host of data as it relates to um, members accessing services, uh, which for example can be um, comparative data on the rates of surgery, ENT surgery for example, or spinal surgery, or. Um, other interventions that our ADF members are experiencing um, and that data is, is presented by Bupa um, to that committee um, and um, they dis, you know, discuss and analyse and consider the clinical variation that sits in um, you know, ac across the footprint. Um, the clinical complaints and incident management system and the, the series of meetings and engagements that we have um, with Bupa on that also requires um, a sharing and exchange of a whole host of information that I would call health relevant health outcome data that's deliberated on in that forum. Um, so, th you know, that's some examples. Yeah, so do, so do you each feel that Bupa is sufficiently apprised of health outcomes data broad in the broad, as you indicate, in order effectively to deliver um, the clinical services that it needs to deliver and to um, provide appropriately trained clinicians? Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, a, a matter that has been raised by Mr Sedgman is that um, Bupa's clinicians are siloed. He agreed with that proposition. What, what is your response to that? I have not heard that before. I've not heard it before. I don't recall it from the evidence that I saw, but... Um, I would not agree with that proposition. Um, and, and why is that? So from my, I think as I've um, sort of described, and if I reflect back on um, the procurement of the Bupa contract, one of the key underpinning um, requirements and premises of that relationship is a partnering agreement. Um, Bupa are engaged at all levels of the Garrison Health System um, and I do not believe, it has not been my experience that um, Bupa personnel have been siloed um, from the Garrison Health System um, in the work that they need to do to deliver um, under the contract. Um, it, it, might, it might be helpful if, uh, by, with some specificity, if you can explain the way in which at, at a clinician level, defence clinicians or the Bupa clinicians engage with defence such that they're not siloed. How, how, do you, how do they work together? How do you work together at, a, at the point of delivery of clinical service to a patient? It is so in, in the health centre, the, the Bupa um, clinicians or Bupa and their subcontractor um, clinicians are employed in a uh, multi, um, in a mixed workforce of public servants, uniformed um, clinicians and contracted clinicians within health centres within a multidisciplinary team. Um, that has been uh, a model that's been in existence for uh, as long as I have been serving in different iterations of 
of um, the model of garrison health services. Um, they work, you know, every day collaboratively uh, in a multidisciplinary clinical environment um, as, you know, a part of a primary health care team. And do you have a further response? Oh, no, only, uh, I guess it is, I don't understand the comment, it's a surprise to me, but, I mean, it's something, having heard it, of course, we would look into it. In fact, I'm, next week I'm doing my, my first of visits to some garrison health facilities. So, you know, it's when you're on the ground, I think you can understand those issues a little better. Um, but I, I don't really have anything to add to um, Admiral Sharkey's evidence. Thank you. Um, now... Uh, when we when we talk we turn to that topic, the broad topic of um, data informed continuous improvement and the, the, the flow of data, and we discussed from JHC to Bupa, but now data also let's address the, the flow of data from Bupa to JHC. Um, we have been informed that the only data that Bupa collects is appointment based data. Uh, is that your understanding? No. No, that's not my understanding. Um, could you describe the additional types of data that is collected by Bupa? So I might start at the clinical interface. Um, Bupa clinicians, uh, you know, work in the primary healthcare team uh, where healthcare is required in what we refer to as the off-base space um, referrals are raised. Those referrals contain a lot of information, um, uh, you know, demographic and clinical information, etc. That information is provided to Bupa, mm -hmm. um, and they receive uh, and manage um, that referral process, um, uh, including receiving back the uh, relevant invoices um, and also the clinical reports um, onto their IRBS platform. Um, there is also, as I understand it, a regular exchange of occupational rehab outcome data um, that um, uh, the BUPA subcontractor Acumen used to generate um, reports back to us. Um, there is uh, a, a range of information that is clearly um, relevant to the delivery of the um, Mater's 24-hour hotline. Um, uh, there are, um, you know, regular feeds from our health information offices, I understand it, that provide uh, information to Bupa and reports to Bupa. Um, in addition to the regular ones, some ad hoc um, information is also um, shared with Bupa. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. So, just and just to give you some context, so and and, and you can agree or disagree with the proposition, um, where it, it, it was asked of Mr. Sedgman whether Bupa is a, a little siloed by virtue of the extent and nature of the data it receives. And his response was, well, yeah, we don't receive any clinical data, as I've made mention, or outcome data. So in that regard, um, we don't, it's not a part of what is delivered to us under the contract. You would you disagree with that proposition? Yes, I disagree that they don't receive any clinical data. Yes, I, I would agree. And I think what Admiral Sharkey stated is in, in some cases, they are the holders of the data or they generate the data. Yes, and, and then and, and as to that flow the other way, insofar as it was said that the only data that is delivered is appointment-based data, you disagree with that proposition too? Yes. Um, and tell me, how does Defence assess the quality of the healthcare that is being provided by Bupa's clinicians? Admiral Bennett, Admiral Sharkey? Uh, uh, so I think, I mean, I, I, I can start in, in a general way uh, because we spoke, of, I think we spoke about clinical governance. It's, it's, you know, that's part of what good clinical governance is about. Indeed. 
Uh, and so there's a range of factors that that um, would need to need to occur, and I think there's uh, that applies to both the health service providers that Bupa provides, as well as defence providers, as we've spoken about. I think the the first for that is obviously credentialing. So um, Bupa uh, is responsible for uh, the credentialing and confirmation of such uh, of the healthcare providers that that work uh, for them. Uh, and credentialing, you know, covers the scope of uh, obviously that a, whatever service that clin clinician's providing, they fit and proper person to provide that service. Um, then there's a range, uh, and Defence does similarly, the single services do similarly for their personnel who work on garrison uh, and, and Defence would for any public service personnel, as I understand. So there's the credentialing aspect of the workforce. Um, then there's the range of governance that sits over clinical governance, which Bupa participates in. So under the um, Joint Health Command has two clinical governance committees. One is Garrison Clinical Health Governance Committee that is chaired by uh, a one star who reports to me, which is a Director General um, of Garrison Health. The other is a specific ADF Health Services Contract Clinical Governance Committee, uh, which specifically talks about the clinical governance that occurs under the contract uh, and they both report up to um, what is the, uh, uh, and I've forgotten the name of the term, but the C Clinical Quality and Safety Committee of JHC, which is chaired by uh, the Surgeon General position. Uh, but at another level, if we're talking governance and committees, that occurs locally on the ground as well. So there are five regional uh, joint health unit, if you like, clinical governance committees um, that uh, uh, review and discuss their um, regional issues as well that all feed up through those committees. Um, the other aspects of clinical governing, governance in place is the patient experience piece we talked about. So uh, there's an avenue for um, uh, personnel to uh, raise complaints or compliments, in fact, uh, and uh, with respect to their health care. And certainly the Garrison Health Clinical Governance Board has a consumer representative that sits on that as well. Yes. Uh, May I ask this question? I don't, don't want to cut, cut across you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Although right. I realise I am. Um, <laughs> When, when you mentioned earlier, because you mentioned a number of issues, but that the, the identification of local issues, how does that take place, that identification? Um, so I'm happy for Admiral Strachey. She would not be more familiar with this than me, so mm. she can jump in any time. But I think it takes place uh, through two uh, avenues. One is the... the um, uh, the clinical incidents and complaints and compliments, they occur locally. So they they initially will go in through the local joint health unit uh, and uh, the senior personnel there responsible, usually the, co the commander of the unit, um, would review those locally uh, and then there'd be um, an assessment process around um, how they're managed or where they go, uh, obviously with different thresholds and they may um, uh, or may not come up uh, to me at a point in time or not. The other process um, I'm aware of is just local clinical audits um, that, that clinicians undertake routinely, both in defence and, and outside. So uh, there will be clinical audits undertaken on specific problems where there may well be just a review of the health records around a particular topic uh, and again, yeah. Yes, and so with those clinical audits, audits, they arise in response to critical incidents, is that right? Uh, no, that would be another... So clinical audit is a proactive um, uh, way of doing an audit on a particular issue that might be of, of interest uh, and sometimes the clinicians will do that locally but there is also uh, within Joint Health Command, the Director-General of Garrison Health has a, a clinical audit committee as well that will uh, request, put a focus on certain topics. The incident is, is a more of a reactive process where uh, there's either been... Uh, something identified by health service personnel and or uh, um, a member or personnel or patient um, and the so that's how the ins and then that will be reviewed and responded to which yes, is more reactive. You. And tell me as to the audit process is that a um, an ad hoc process how, or, or is that an embedded process that is done on a regular basis according to specific protocols how does it work? 
Absolutely. Admiral Schalke. Um, my understanding is that it is a regular programmed um, uh, process that is managed um, uh, through the regional um, medical advisor network. Thank you. Mm. Uh, and I would just add that um, I think there's ad hoc as well. So certain clinicians will do clinical audits around areas of their particular interest or specialty. Uh, but it is an area I think that is important to review. Uh, my, my feeling is it, it should be a regular proactive process that we also can drive central, centrally around uh, particular topics that we're interested in. Yes, thank you. And would you agree with um, the notion that, that complaints and compliments uh, don't, don't always offer a representative sample or res uh, don't reflect representatively the experience of the cohort when dealing with and receiving services from clinicians? I would. I think they're just one, one yeah. aspect. Thank you. Um, now, a another matter that Bupa has mentioned is that it, it does not have access to measures and metrics used to assess the quality of healthcare infrastructure. Um, the, the, the environment for the delivery of care because that's established and managed by defence. Um, and without the provision of those metrics, would you accept that um, uh, to BUPA, defence cannot obtain meaningful feedback? Given, given that the BUPA clinicians are, are there, 95% of the clinicians or thereabouts are delivering the services in the defence healthcare environment, should there not be an engagement with the BUPA clinicians about the safety of that environment and the infrastructure? Um, the, the initial proposition that started a few minutes ago hasn't been accepted by the witnesses. I don't believe that it's been re responded to it yet. Thank you very no, much. no, in order to ask that question, the witnesses would have to accept the base proposition. I'll, I'll, I'll start again. Um, first proposition. Bupa states that it does not have access to measures and metrics used to assess the quality of healthcare infrastructure. Do you agree with that? I, do, I don't think I'm in a position to agree or disagree, but what I, yep. I feel similarly. I don't know I can answer. So you can't comment on that topic? No. But what, but what I would say yes. is that I am aware that there is a WH... There is a, a Workplace Health and Safety Forum that, that BUPA participate in with Joint Health Command represent, representatives, which I believe is part of the... Um, I think it's Annex L under the contract. Mm. It's one of those um, regular engagements. And I would think that in that forum um, there must be some sharing um, and awareness of, of um, information. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I but, but you don't know because you don't yeah. participate in that forum. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, now, we mentioned clinical governance frameworks and in, in particular you, Admiral Sharkey, identified in your previous evidence that um, one of the, the, the purposes behind the BUPA contract was to improve the clinical governance arrangements over the delivery of healthcare services. Um, and it, it, it's the case, isn't it, that defence through JHC together with other groups within the enterprise, so for example, the mental health and wellbeing branch, um, has developed a range of healthcare and health and wellbeing, if I can put it broadly, strategies. That, do you agree with that? Is it that, that there are a number Is of strategies? Yes, they've developed yes. By, yep. by, by JHC and, yes. and other branches within Defence. Yes. Um, and it was Bupa's evidence that Defence has not sought its feedback, that is Bupa's feedback, um, in respect of their provision of clinical services for the purposes of designing those strategies. Do you agree with that? I would um, 
No, I... Uh, do I agree that we haven't sought their feedback? No, I don't agree with that. Can you give any uh, instances where you have sought Bupa's feedback in the design of health and wellbeing strategies and like strategies? Um, so if I may provide some context around, uh, in particular, the development of the ADF health strategy, yes. because I understand... Um, You've talked about a number of strategies, but if I could tackle that one, for instance, Certainly. to start with. The, um, the development of the ADF health strategy occurred uh, in Joint Health Command, which it was a process that started in December of 2017, as I recall it, uh, and progressed through um, to... Um, 2019 and then into 2020. Um, Bupa weren't engaged until um, to deliver services until the middle of July 2019. So um, I would say that it was simply not possible for them to be engaged from the early um, part of that. The, the other important context that I think um, is of value to understand is that over the years of 2017 and 2018, um, Defence Joint Health Command undertook a very uh, intensive um, and um, uh, comprehensive uh, procurement activity um, over those two years in which we... Um, spent a lot of time and investment in engaging with industry as we um, developed the procurement activity, progressed the procurement activity for the ADF Health Services contract, which we now have with Bupa. So during that period of time, um, we engaged not just with Bupa but a whole range of um, industry participants across health to really understand their capacities and capabilities that might be brought to bear in delivering health services in partnership with Defence. So that was over 2017 and 18. At the time when I became involved in um, overseeing the development, the project that, that um, was the development of the ADF health strategy, um, it wasn't necessary for us to engage because we had just come out of the back of um, two years and in fact you know some of the deliberate activities that we undertook during that time period was something called co-design where we co-designed the solution with the tenderers um, which then informed um, the ADF health services contract that we have with Bupa. So we developed a very deep understanding and had lots of feedback from um, a range of industry participants, including Bupa, over those two years of what their capabilities and capacities were um, to develop, um, sorry, to, de to deliver and contribute to the defence health system. So by the time um, we were developing that strategy, the team in Joint Health Command had a very deep understanding um, and, you know, we considered that it simply just wasn't necessary for us to engage yet again um, with Bupa in a deep way to understand their capacity um, to contribute to the strategy, we already had a very good understanding of it. Yes, and tell me, turning to the, the mental health and wellbeing strategy that is being developed at the moment, are you able to indicate the way in which um, Defence has engaged with Bupa and in, in particular its clinicians who are delivering services on the ground in the development of that strategy? Others would be able to give a more detailed um, overview of uh, the consultation process that's um, occurred in the development of that strategy. But my observation would be this, that I do know that there has been engagement with Joint Health Command and with Garrison Health Staff and Regional Health Staff around that. Bupa clinicians are part of our network. Um, uh, you know, they... Um, naturally a part of the team that then would inform um, that input and feedback that we provided in that process. Thank you. 
Um, Commissioners, might, might we take a, a short break now and, and then come back for the remainder of the session? Thank you. Sorry, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, yes, please, thank you. Okay, thank you, oh. we'll adjourn. All rise. The Royal Commission to Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 3.35. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Thank you, Mr. Everybody. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, and now, tell me, you have mentioned previously that um, both Bupa and Defence through JHC meet through various committees and through um, various boards and review meetings on on regular occasions about a ra range of issues. Um, in any of those contexts, so you're able to say or speak to the extent to which Bupa and Defence discuss systemic issues affecting Defence members. And let me give you some examples by way of context, and you may, you may have others in mind. Um, but for example, do you consider uh, together, consider and analyse trends in members' presentations? Do you consider or analyse high risk factors for members or any such other matters relevant to the treatment and provision of health care to members? Um, so in my experience, um, the short answer is yes, we do. Um, by way of examples at the multiple tiers of that, um, it, you know, our conversations that I have had in um, chairing the PGB, for example, um, in uh, sharing with um, our BUPA colleagues um, the strategic challenges that defence is facing um, and, uh, you know, other relevant issues. And in those forums we have discussed um, things such as the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, the priorities around mental health and wellbeing, some of the um, broad work, um, you know, that is being done across the department and how that impacts uh, the relationship with BUPA. Um, that would sort of be the nature at that level. Um, and I am confident that there are equally similar types of conversations that happen at other levels. Um, examples also more specifically around risk for patients is the work of the low value care um, group mm -hmm. uh, who specifically um, as you know core in their agenda is um, considering issues um, that in particular um, place defense members potentially at risk of harm from healthcare services um, and so that you know is broadly their agenda um, and they certainly um, you know, discuss issues of risk um, in that, but in a range of forums. Thank you. And and just to confirm for the transcript, when you say PGB, is that a reference to the Program Governance Board? Yes. Thank you. Um, is there anything you wish to add to that? No, I don't have anything to add to that. Thank you. Um, can I turn to this topic now, and that is the continuous improvement framework that has been mentioned previously. Um, by way of background, um, Defence has had a mental health strategy since 2002, that's correct, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, and in 2009, uh, the Dunt Review of Mental Health Care in the ADF was released, was it not? Yes. Um, and that made 52 recommendations and one of the matters that the, that report identified was the lack of quality improvement processes to the development of mental health policy and strategic programs. Do you agree with that? 
Yes. Um, in, in 2014, or over the period of 2014 to 2015, um, Defence Commission Phoenix Australia to develop a SIF. That's right, isn't it? Uh, uh, y yes, I agree with that broadly. I I, I wasn't uh, involved in that process at that time, so me I, being I able to um, completely confirm the time frame. Okay, I, I accept that. Um, uh, at that, I'll, I'll put this proposition to you. Um, it was approved by Defence in 2016, which was obviously before your time, um, and then. Thereafter, there was a phase by which um, the SIF project was developed and there was a development of the monitoring and evaluation plans to support the SIF. Are you familiar with the monitoring and evaluation plans? I'm familiar with them at a high level. Um, I don't have a very detailed working knowledge of them or their development. I see. Yeah. Um, they were developed by a consultancy company Think Place Australia, and they were approved by Defence in 2019. Are you aware of that? Uh, again, I, I didn't have direct involvement in that work. I think, you know, in the preparation for the Royal Commission hearings, I've become aware that it was Think um, Place. Yes. Um, and um, of the existence, or, you know, I, so I have an understanding of the history of the development, but yes. I don't have a good working knowledge of... And, and um, Admiral Bennett, presumably uh, you were aware of those matters by virtue one of the Royal Commission, is that correct? Uh, historically, the, the um, series of activity, work activity you pointed out, I'm, I'm vaguely aware of, I think. Uh, and by nature of the fact it's occurred in defence, I've never been directly involved. So I've, I've not commented because I'm, I can't confirm the year and no, exact sorry. wording. Yep. Certainly. Um, oh, it, it, I might in, in that case invite each of you to accept those as, as propositions upon which we'll, we'll base some questions. Um, in, in late 2020, and this, this was, I believe, in your time, um, Defence contracted the University of Canberra um, with a brief to implement the SIF and the monitoring and evaluation, uh, evaluation system um, as a mechanism to assess the collective impact of the defence mental health and wellbeing strategy. And that includes the uh, suicide prevention program. Are you aware of that? Yes. Um, in 2021, the University of Canberra provided a number of interim reports. Well, was there an oral answer to that question? Yes. Yes. Oh, Yes, I'm sorry, I might invite you to speak up a little. Thank you. Um, in, in 2021, the University of Canberra provided a number of interim reports. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, and in those reports, the University of Canberra identified some fundamental issues with defence's systems and infrastructure which prevented the implementation of the SIF and the monitoring and evaluation plans, and that included in relation to the availability and fidelity of data. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Thank you. Um, and as a consequence, the University of Canberra found that the original brief to implement the SIF and the um, monitoring and evaluation plans was no longer tenable, and there was therefore a rescoping of the project. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Um, in December 2023, the University of Canberra provided Defence with several reports regarding the SIF and the monitoring and evaluation plans for a number of programs. Is that correct? Yes. yes. This is after my... Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and those reports find that the evaluation capability under the SIF still remains limited, but nonetheless it's improving. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Councillor. Yep. Thank you. Same information. Um, now, as to those reports, is it the case that they have not yet been provided to Defence in final form or have you now received them in final form? Uh, my understanding is they've been provided in final form. So the draft was received in December 2023. Uh, the team had some provided comments back and they've been re re received in final form. I have not seen them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and I must say, we, we have yet to, to receive the final form of those um, 
of documents, but, but nonetheless, we, we each have the, the drafts. Now, as to the issues that were identified, and I'll refer first to the, the early findings, um, particularly regarding the suicide prevention program, um, it was found that significant challenges existed in respect of data collection and evaluation re readiness. Would you accept that? Yes. Um, and as a consequence, as we have indicated, the evaluation of the suicide prevention plan was postponed to allow for an intensive interim process to, to improve data collection. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Thank you. I, I understand it to be an evaluation, move instead to an evaluation of evaluation readiness, as I read. Yes, thank you. Um, and and when, when you when you refer to that, mm. what is what do you understand is meant by that? I understood that the initial intent was to do an evaluation of the programs, but because of the data issues so identified, uh, that evaluation could not be done. So instead, almost a step back to uh, prepare, you know, to understand the evaluation readiness uh, of the program, which to me then would support informing that next stage. So. Thank you. Um, and of the, the other findings by the, um, particularly in the, the University of Canberra, Canberra interim report findings, there were interviews with personnel at an operational level which showed low levels of documentation ability and poor quality in data collection during program delivery. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of the specific, in that much detail um, about each of the 26 recommendations that I, I seem to recall. There were, I, I couldn't confirm the exact details well, of each recommendation. Well, I'll, again, I'll, I'll, I'll put these to you as, as summaries of what has been identified. Um, there was also uh, a finding that there was um, what, what the governor's collaboration environment supporting the SIF, while that was comprehensive, it did not result in high engagement or a collaborative cultural quality use of the SIF and there was an attribution of human resource constraints um, as a barrier to SIF implementation. Are you aware of that in any detail? At a high level. That, that that is consistent with my recollection yes. of the range of recommendations. Thank you. Um, and, and also there was a finding that there's a cultural mismatch between JHC and single service activities, with JHC's brief being oriented more around mental health and treatment while the services are oriented more around wellbeing and performance. Do you recall that? I don't recall that. I don't recall that. Um, now, the UC interim reports found that the SIF and the monitoring evaluation system failed to provide a measurable evaluation mechanism by which Defence could assess its programs against the strategy. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, in high level terms. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. The board. Yes. Um, and le let, me, let me ask you this. Or at least let me say this: the the, the conclusions that. No, let, let me ask this question. Following JHC's review of the mental health and wellbeing strategy from um, 2018 to 2023, what what will be the outcome of that review in light? of the matters identified um, by the University of Canberra in relation to the SIF. Can you answer that? Uh, I can answer moving forward. Yes. Noting that the final reports have just been received and yes. in fact the Joint Health Command team is yet to provide their final outcome evaluation of that themselves internally. But we've had some discussions and I think um, most of the premises around evaluation capability uh, and data issues, I think, you know, w we would accept. Certainly from my point of view, uh, I'm reading something that's a historical, an evaluation of a historical program. So, um, and it, it's a matter, and, and some were not probably having been identified already in 2021, were not a surprise. 
Um, and, and there were also uh, positive outcomes in some of those reports. But probably just to talk about process, be, as you um, be aware, Council, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Branch under Brigadier Langford has carriage of the next Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy with DBA. Um, uh, uh, it's my understanding that um, Brigadier Langford and her team at various levels have been involved in this SIP process, so none of these findings um, will be necessarily new uh, and uh, have been understood along the way. And I think the draft mental health and wellbeing st strategy for the next actually does refer to the SIF. So there'll be a process whereby um, the findings, the formal findings from the SIF work for the pr previous strategy will be considered in depth and um, what has not already been incorporated into the current strategy, and I, I can't talk to that detail, I wasn't involved, but um, would be considered and, uh, you know, strategies by themselves are living documents. So I imagine any lessons learned uh, that were accepted will also be considered, but that, that will be a matter for um, Brigadier Langford and, and uh, uh, her, her branch and division to consider. And, and just in that regard, um, it was the case that until I think it was 9 May 2023, and you may not be aware of the exact date, but you may be, um, JHC was responsible for the SIF, but then thereafter it was tra tra transferred to Defence People Group. Is that your understanding? That is, that's not my understanding of the previous strategy. My, my understanding is that the uh, responsibility for the SIF for the 2018-23 strategy has sat with JHC and remains so. And, and it is with the, the forthcoming strategy that responsibility has been transferred to Defence People Group and in particular Brigadier Langford and that That's branch. my understanding. Thank you. Um, so as to the, the previous strategy, um, Admiral Sharkey, you were responsible for the SIF from your commencement in the, the role in December 2019 until that date of transfer in May 2023, is that correct? Um, yes, during my tenure, but yes. noting that the University of Canberra commenced their work, I believe, in 2020. That, 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 that's right, yes. yeah, yeah. So the, the, work, the work commenced during your tenure. Yes. And during that period, once they commenced that work, you had overall oversight in respect of that work. Yes. Yes. Um, now, might, might I ask, when did you become aware, Admiral Sharkey, of the, the University of Canberra's interim reports? Was that when they were released? Uh, I couldn't tell you an exact date that I became aware of it, but it was um, temporarily around the time that I believe they were released in 2021 in the middle of 2021, yes. um, and I became aware through um, verbal briefings from the then um, responsible um, assistant secretary, um, uh, AS. Um, or when, D when you say AS, that's a reference to, to what? Sorry, the, um, in fact, I think it was a director general yes. um, was the title um, at that time who was responsible for that body of work, who appraised me, um, you know, directly of the sort of in the broad, the outcomes of that and kept me informed. Yeah, so a director general within JHC, is that Correct. right? Yeah. Who, who informed you of the outcomes of the and the content of the report? Uh, yes. In yeah. Um, and, and having been so informed, what did you and JHC do in relation to the report? Did you act on any of the matters that were identified by the University of Canberra at that stage? Yes, um, so the team considered that report in more detail um, and uh, I was advised that um, the 26 recommendations um, they recommended that we support and endorse those recommendations or agree those recommendations mm -hmm. um, uh, and work commenced within that group, um, you know, to address the recommendations that were in that report. 
And when you say the team, were you part of that team or was it a team separate from you reporting to you or some other I was not part of that team. Um, uh, the, the responsible director general of uh, health policy programs and assurance um, uh, we supervised uh, the joint health command team that managed um, that contract and that particular project. Yeah. And when you say they undertook work in relation to the recommendations, what was the nature of the work that was undertaken? I would, I, I, you know, I would be imagining um, what it was, but it would be working with the University of, of Canberra team um, to understand each of those recommendations um, and what they entail and to commence work um, on implementing those recommendations. But I, I would need to, uh, you know, other people um, in the organisation would be um, more equipped to talk to the detail about the actual work that was conducted at a director level. Okay, m might I suggest this? Um, given the nature of the recommendations that were made and the matters that, well, that were identified, were they not of sufficient seriousness for your attention to be brought directly to them and for you to have been involved in ameliorating them or addressing them? So I was aware of the recommendations. I um, supported uh, the work of the team in um, a, you know, commencing work to address those recommendations. I certainly accepted the significance of those recommendations, but um, you know, as uh, is the case across the broad portfolio of work um, in Joint Health Command, I rely on um, the expertise and the high skill level of my direct reports to manage their teams to uh, conduct that work and to brief me accordingly and where risks emerge from that work that um, I'm made aware and I, I was certainly um, made aware of the outcomes of this body of work and the findings um, and I agreed the recommendation that we should accept all those recommendations and that work should commence on, um, you know, seeking to address those recommendations. So they were the steps, you, you were essentially a signing off process for the steps you took in relation to um, addressing the findings and implementing the changes as a consequence of the recommendations in the UC reports, is that right? So I believe my, um, and I would need to refer, reflect on the briefs exactly, but my recollection is that um, I noted the information that was briefed to me formally mm -hmm. um, and I uh, was satisfied um, with the information that was being provided me to me verbally and uh, in written form around uh, that work that needed to be done. And do you have any re recollection now? And if you do, could you tell us of what the, the work was that needed to be done to address those recommendations? I couldn't recall all 26 of them. Um, uh, I, I just don't have that information um, fresh in my mind. Um, s some of the work um, revolved around, for instance, uh, embarking on work to ensure that we could measure um, the loss and SOS um, metrics, so around um, uh, literacy and stigma of suicide across the ADF, um, and that work has been undertaken. Um, other work, uh, I seem to recall, was also certainly around um, exploring how we can address the um, adequacy and quality of the data that exists in the electronic health record in terms of the use of appropriate coding and so on and so forth that, you know, would enable us to um, uh, be better measure suicidality and um, conduct um, 
the, you know, the appropriate evaluations that were required in order to evaluate the suicide prevention program. Um, and there were a range of other, um, you know, recommendations that I, I couldn't speak to off the top of my head. Yes. Um, so are you, you, you don't recall and you weren't involved, is it fair to say, fair to say that, that the, de the detail of that work you've just identified? Uh, yes, that is correct. I wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day, um, detail of the work. Yep. Having regard to the seriousness of the work, and particularly when we're talking about suicide prevention programs and suicidality of suicide, is that a matter that you believe that, upon reflection, in hindsight, would have warranted your direct involvement? No, I consider the level of my involvement appropriate. Um, you know, I, I trust and have the confidence of my team and conduct the due diligence over that body of work and was um, informed at intervals um, through, through the, the, the routine processes of managing Joint Health Command um, at that time. And I, I, I don't believe that um, my uh, ins insertion of, of myself at a detailed working level um, was required at that time. Um, and not being across that detail at the time, how could you be assured about the nature of the work that was being undertaken and the sufficiency of the work that was being undertaken to meet the recommendations identified by the University of Canberra? In the course of my supervision of direct reports across Joint Health Command, um, I had, you know, weekly if not daily contact with um, members of my team as a matter of course. I am confident that the nature of the, um, the working relationship that I had, the um, availability of myself to those direct reports, um, in addition to the formal governance arrangements um, that exist within the command, that I was confident that I would be informed of any issues, impediments um, that, you know, re required my attention um, during that process. Um, you, you were confident that you would be informed, but did you yourself make inquiries to ascertain the nature of the work that was being undertaken and whether such issues or impediments had in fact arisen? I can't recall the exact details of when and where I would have made those, you know, those requests or those inquiries, but it was certainly part of my routine um, communication and conversations when I discussed the work of each of the portfolios of my direct reports that um, such inquiries would be occurring. I want to suggest to you that having regard to the nature of the, the matters identified, it was sufficiently serious as to warrant your direct involvement. What do you suggest to that? What do you say to that? I don't agree with that. Yes. And so tell me, um, Admiral Bennett, in relation to the work that is to be undertaken in the future, um, to what extent were you briefed on the University of Canberra findings in the course of the, the handover process? Uh, in the handover process, which was three days total and a um, very broad portfolio of work that the command mm. undertakes, yes. the handover process per se, uh, it would have come up as part of the work that the Health Protection Policy Branch was doing, uh, not the complete, and of course I received handover uh, briefings from the other three branches who are all doing important work. Um, I received, I then did a deep dive with um, Dr. Michael Drew on the, uh, the following week. Uh, and it was there, I, th I think I recall, certainly in the first two weeks, um, that we had a more detailed conversation about uh, the strategy in general, the SIF work and the future strategy. Uh, and it was sometime um, in mid-December that, that those draft reports were received. Thank you. And tell me, for context, Dr. Michael Drew is... Might, might you identify him, please? Sorry, he is the Assistant Secretary of Health Protection and Policy, so, uh, which is the equivalent of a Director General. Thank you. 
um, and in terms of the work that is to be undertaken in relation to the SIF, that which remains with JHC, could you please identify that for the Commission and what you propose to do and what program of work is in place? The, the remaining work is actually just doing the closeout report. So uh, as you've identified, the SIF for the future strategy, the responsibility has transferred to Mental Health and Wellbeing Branch. So the final piece of work is, whilst we've got the final closeout report from the University of Canberra, it's the Joint Health Command final closeout report on top of that, um, which is, is uh, yet to be finalised, which will include those components of the SIF, um, but other components of the strategy, I imagine. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, can I turn to the topic of the ADF Health Strategy 2023 itself? Um, that strategy was endorsed by the Chief of the Defence Force in 2021, is that correct? Yes. Um, and uh, among other things, it's fair to say that it set the strategic agenda for the provision of healthcare and defence, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, co Commissioners, for context, I should note this, that in, in various notices, including most recently in a response dated 5 March 2024 by Defence, to a notice issued in, in on the 26th of February this year, and that's notice 279, um, and also in evidence given as recently as yesterday by Ms Cecilia Perkins, um, no mention has been made of the 2023 health strategy. Um, instead, at all relevant times, the evidence referred to the ADF health strategy um, as that endorsed by CDF in 2021. Um, so, and this, the 2023 strategy ca came to our knowledge by virtue of our having received your handover package. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to explore the, any, the differences to the extent they exist between the 21 and the 2023 strategy. Um, and I should ask, you're, you're both familiar only with the 2021 strategy, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, I am familiar with it. You're familiar with it. And, and, and of course, you've had working familiarity with the document. Thank you. Um, now, that strategy was led by JHC, that's right, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Um, and as I said, that strategy provides a strategic direction for healthcare services, that's right? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, um, it forms can I... The of the defence health yeah, system. Of the defence health system, yes. Inclusive of services. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it forms the basis of the assessment of the relevance and appropriateness of health-related programs in defence, is that right? Yes. Uh, and it guides resourcing decisions. Yes. And it states that people are a fundamental input to defence's capability, that's correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just before this goes any further, my friend may wish to correct the record in that the notice didn't ask for the strategy as far as I'm aware. Is, is this the notice referred to earlier? Yes. 279 or? 278, I believe. 278, I believe, is the correct number. Right. You want to say anything about that? Um, uh, the, the, the relevant point being that insofar as the notice referred to an ADF health strategy, the re relevant evidence was that there was no indication that there was a 2023 strategy in place. Okay. And it's 278. It's 278. 278. Yes. Um, and as to the strategy, it establishes governance and accountability structures that are critical to maintaining um, a strategy that is fit for purpose. Is this the 2021 strategy or the 2023? This we're talking about the 2023 strategy. Thank you. Um, ensure successful implementation across defence. That's correct. Yes, I accept that. Yes. Um, now, plainly enough, then. Let me suggest that in relation to the strategy, um, in 2022, the ADF Health Select Committee undertook a review of the 2021 strategy. Is that right? Joint Health Command led a review of the ADF Health Strategy. Thank you. 
Um, and I might ask the document to be displayed from the tender bundle. It's document 18. It's def.1399.0002.0077. One three double nine dot triple zero two dot double zero double seven at double zero eight three. And this is the review into the 21 strategy. And you'll see there there are certain findings and recommendations. I'll give you an opportunity to review that. They're familiar to me. Pardon? They're familiar to me. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, tell me, Admiral Sharkey, to what extent were you briefed on these findings and the recommendations? Uh, I was... Um, I was briefed on them. I'm not sure I can describe an extent to them, but um, I was certainly brie uh, briefed and, in fact, participated in an element of the review process. And what element was that? Um, so my recollection, and I could not tell you the date of it, but I was certainly invited to a round table uh, discussion with a um, group of stakeholders um, that was part of the um, review process that was undertaken by the team in Joint Health Command. Yes. Um, and the purposes of my involvement then was um, clearly in relation to my role as Surgeon General and Commander Joint Health um, to provide some strategic um, perspectives on um, health and defence at large um, and provided an opportunity for me to engage with the uh, participants in that um, roundtable discussion um, in order to, for them to sort of contribute um, to the review process. Yes, and um, are you able to indicate whether the various recommendations that are indicated there uh, have been implemented? Um, I would need to consider each one in That's all right. turn. Um, so, in regards to number one, the recommendations as represented, um, there have been incorporated and reflected in the 2023 version that is now published. Um, the at recommendation number two, establishing strategic benefits measures and metrics against which the strategy will be assessed. That work um, is continuing and is has not been complete, but is um, still a work in progress as at the time, um, 1 December, when I handed over my role. Um, replacing the roadmap with a defence action plan uh, as at 1 December when I handed over my role, that work was ongoing and not yet complete. Um, I believe the language in the republished uh, version of the strategy for 2023 has been aligned. I believe that the timeframes that are articulated in the strategy have certainly been aligned, but because the action plan is not yet um, complete, uh, the timeframes are not in the action plan. Um, item number six, establishing a working group. Um, as I understood it in 1 December, uh, the working group had been agreed and there had been single service endorsement um, and other group endorsement of that participation, but um, there were capacity issues with the full participation, so I'm not at the at the point of 1 December, it was still a work in progress to get that up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, number seven, um, there were um, uh, inclusions in the updated 23 strategy that certainly reflected uh, the more recent um, 
defence strategic review as a key artefact um, and also reflected the anticipated delivery of the uh, next version of the defence and DVA mental health and wellbeing strategy um, and uh, that was underway at that time. And I'm sorry, my screen just doesn't let me fully... I'll read it over here. Um, uh, and I believe that the planning is in place um, to achieve number eight at the point in time when I stepped off. Thank you. Um, now, tell me, as to the, the comparing the two, two strategies and the evaluation of each, um, the 2021 strategy includes a roadmap of outcomes measured against periods of time and strategic objectives. Is that right? Yes. Um, now, does it, it doesn't include any specific metrics to measure the success of the, its implementation. Is that right? Yes. How, how is that um, success measured, absent those metrics? Well, I think that that goes to the very heart of um, what was identified in the review process, mm -hmm. that um, the strategy would be strengthened um, with the addition of um, a clearer set of metrics that would enable that evaluation to occur. Yes, and then as to the 2023 strategy, um, is it the case that no performance metrics presently exist in respect of that? The, yes, that is my understanding. That work is underway. Yes, and when do you anticipate that that work might be finished? I think that's probably a question for the new Surgeon General. Uh, my answer is probably a little uh, more complicated in that um, in con having considered the strategy since I've taken over my tenure, I think I think it's, uh, and I understand the review, I think it's, it's a good, uh, uh, the review makes sense to me. I... I look at it more as a strategic framework and would probably offer the reason there have been no metrics is because they're high level strategic objectives that are hard to put metrics against. Mm. Uh, and I think that was the intent of the Defence Action Plan being recommended. Uh, and if I understand, I might confirm with um, Rirad Mulshaki, I think it was the Health Select Committee that recommended that. My uh, intent going forward forward, I think there's a gap between a high level, what I would consider strategic framework and an action plan, and I think there needs to be a planning process in between that that sits under that, particularly given Joint Health Command now sits with the newly established MPO under Lieutenant General Fox, and there's this, and uh, Lieutenant General Fox is implementing a the operating system for the MPO, which also has... Uh, planning accounted for to and and measures against those that each of her divisions will do to assure um, General Fox of the, prior, you know, the work against the priorities that we have. So there's a couple of concurrent things going on here as well as the national defence um, strategy, which is probably going to do, is due anytime soon, and of course, anticipation of the Royal Commission recommendations. So... Um, we have not yet had a, a health select committee meeting, but um, my intent is probably to propose a process, um, not an action plan per se, but a, a more fulsome planning process that aligns all of those planning structures under the one un, under this strategic framework. But um, it's almost like taking one step backward to go two steps forward, if you like, um, just so that 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 all the planning that happens in Joint Health Command is is aligned top to bottom. Uh, and 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 then that would be reported um, up through the health select committee as well as to the MPO. I hope that answers the question. So so there's no time frame for when the metrics will be developed, but that that's work that we will be starting. That the the command and I uh, pretty much immediately. We've been discussing it in detail already. Yeah. And and tell me, Rear Admiral Sharkey, have there been any impediments to the development of that work? given what that was identified by the University of Canberra since, um, since 2021? I'm sorry, we're talking about the ADF Health Strategy? Yeah, so the, the, the University the, of Canberra. The, 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 the work that has just been identified by Admiral Bennett is that work that could have been started earlier in view of the findings of the University of Canberra report? I'm not sure I understand 
the nexus between the University of Canberra work, which was centred around the defence mental well, um, mental health and wellbeing strategy, and University of Canberra were not involved in the ADF health strategy. So I'm sorry, I'll draw that question. The, the, the work un undertaken in respect of the ADF health strategy that's been undertaken now, could that work have been undertaken earlier and developed earlier and commenced earlier in relation to the 2021 strategy? Is there any reason why it's only happening now? Uh, um, look, there certainly are impediments um, in terms of the capacity of the teams um, uh, in order to do this work. And I'm not talking about just the capacity of the team within Joint Health Command, but more broadly across defence. And this work necessitates um, good engagement um, across the department, um, you know, in, in terms of completing this work. Um, and if I, you know, reflect on um, the progress, particularly around item number six and the challenges in establishing that working group, um, it certainly has um, been apparent that the capacity of some of the key um, other areas across defence to fully engage in that work um, uh, is an impediment to progressing um, some of that work. But what I would also say is that uh, I was aware um, that that did um, drive the team to consider other ways in which they might um, continue to progress the work um, uh, in a different way than was initially intended in, ter in terms of the working group. So the team, as I understand it, did progress to consider and do some deliberate assessment of what Joint Health Command's um, contribution would be uh, to the action plan and defining um, the requirements uh, more definitively in the action plan, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, and when you say that there are impediments in, in, in that the capacity of teams constituted an impediment, what do you mean by capacity? So, the availability of the various stakeholders or participants in that working group to attend meetings, to be engaged on the topic, um, you know, to provide uh, input. Um, and work effort into the work that was required. And Admiral Bennett, can you, uh, how, how, are you, how can you be assured that things have changed such that you can start undertaking that work now? So, so there's, uh, to, to go back to the question, uh, there, there's always been work underway and I think Admiral Sharkey's defined that in the challenges and to broaden that, it's, it's not just capacity and joint health command. The work that's been going on at the um, branch level responsible for the strategy uh, has been with the single services as well as Joint Operations Command. So it's actually uh, looking at, um, it was looking at developing an integrated, if you like, um, benefits and action plan. Um, that's where the challenges have been because of the competing priorities that are existing uh, at the moment in defence over that period of time. And the team have come to me um, as, as we're in our discussions to so have escalated the problem, which is why um, uh, you know the the next stage will be uh, to take it to the health select committee. So if you like, take it a, a tear up from the the working group that were attempting um, to progress the action plan. But the other reason that there's a bit of a change is more around the establishment of the military personnel organisation. So that wasn't. Uh, that only happened in July last year. So the reason for my pivot a little is just the concurrent planning process is underway to make sure they align so that we're not doing a planning for the health strategy as well as planning for the business side of the military personnel organisation. Mm. So that's an alignment that's happened as a result of the establishment of the MPO, not as a result of nothing. Being and done. do you feel comfortable that that alignment will facilitate um, more effectively, the work in respect of the, the, that we've been just been discussing. Yeah, I, I'm I'm uh, optimistic. I won't say happy. I'm optimistic it will facilitate Joint Health Command's work more broadly. Um, it'll provide that governance framework around the work we do, how we prioritise it, how we allocate resources. Uh, it'll be visible to 
Lieutenant General Fox uh, and above and the Health Select Committee. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm confident that will occur. And, and, and to the individual services as well? Uh, to the individual services as they are all represented at the Health Select Committee. Yes. Definitely, and they are, are all represented there, yes. Thank you. Um, can I move to the topic of the uh, joint health, the topic of joint health action in relation to research? Now, we heard from Professor Wild this morning and um, she mentioned a number of studies on which she's developing her, her own program of research. Um, one of those studies was the Wellness Action Through Czech Health Project, and that's the WATCH project. Are you familiar, are you each familiar with that project? Yes, I, I am not. Uh, and in that case, Professor um, uh, Admiral Sharkey, if I can direct this question to you. Um, has JHC taken any steps you know, you know, by reference to implementing new programs or con at least considering the implementation of any new programs or any like matters in view of the um, issues identified in that project? Uh, so yes is the short answer um, to that. Um, uh, the case in point being the program of work that you heard about from um, Professor Wilde in her evidence earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other, um, you know, there are a range of um, actions that were taken in terms of um, how we use the outcomes and the findings from that research as it related to um, uh, in information and sharing that with the um, different communities that were the subject of some of that research. And I'm talking here about um, the commanders, the healthcare providers and families. Mm -hmm. um, there was work done to digest the outcomes of that research into um, products uh, that could be uh, useful in terms of communicating with those um, groups of stakeholders. Um, and, uh, you know, I am aware that it has, for instance, stimulated um, um, some really positively received um, engagement with the Defence Families um, community uh, in, in terms of reinforcing probably what scientifically we were already aware of in terms of factors um, that might provide opportunities for earlier identification and intervention um, as it relates to you know, mental health issues in the ADF community. Yeah, thank you. And where you talk there of a, a range of actions that were taken and also engagement that was undertaken as well, can you provide some specificity around that? So what sort of actions, what was the nature of the engagement? Just just to, 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 to understand what has been done in relation to the, the project. Yeah, so my recollection is that um, uh, the the outputs or the findings from that research were summarised in a way that could be um, included in um, artefacts that were produced. So um, uh, I want to say, um, you know, handout material and physical um, readable artefacts that could be digested by um, participants in those um, communities that were distributed. There was information that was um, included on websites. Um, there was uh, briefings provided, and I'll you know, talk to the health system, to health staff across Garrison and in various other forums around um, the outcomes of that. It was for instance, presented at the AMA conference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was information provided through um, the leadership network um, and the content of the findings was also utilised or leveraged in the health, in, in the work developing the content for the various health promotion activities um, that we also undertake. 
Thank you. And when you say through the leadership group, do you have in mind, is it command there, that that information was fed down to command about the, 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 the outcomes of that project? Yes, that's no? my recollection broadly, yeah. yeah. Um, and but you don't recall the nature of the information or, or how it was? I can't remember the details, the details. of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and tell me, might I ask you whether you're familiar with the Elevate study? Uh, broadly, I'm f the name is familiar to me, but I would – some time has passed um, since I probably had any engagement on it. And, and I take it you're not familiar with the – Emily, the name is familiar, okay. but I don't know the details. Oh, let, let me just, I'll summarise it. It's designed to follow up on high-risk individuals who are identified in previously undertaken study being the Transition and Wellbeing Research Program. Does that assist you a little? Yes. Um, and having so identified it, are you able to indicate um, what action, if any, JHC has undertaken to progress um, that study? And 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 what. And, and how it has sought to implement any findings in relation to that? Uh, so my understanding is that is um, a body of work that's been uh, sponsored by DVA mm. uh, in partnership, I believe, with um, the University of Adelaide. Um, okay. I, I, I am aware that my team at the time of my tenure um, had been involved uh, with DVA in um, you know, understanding that study and providing some input into um, into the study, but I, I would need to um, seek some other advice to refresh myself for further details, but I, I certainly was aware of that in the broad. Yeah. Tell me, I suppose it might boil down to this. Do you feel that um, JHC has been sufficiently engaged with um, DVA in when it comes to research and when it comes to programs, particularly now that there is a move towards a lifetime wellbeing approach to defence member and veteran care? Do you, do you believe that JHC is sufficiently engaged with DVA on the topic of research or could that be improved? So I can speak to my tenure. Yes. Um, that uh, from my perspective, I think we were well engaged with DVA through multiple forums. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my observation generally of that relationship and how it has developed over years is that it has gone from strength to strength and um, that there has been an ever increasing closer engagement with DVA um, across a range of issues um, to do with serving members and veterans. Thank you. I, I would agree in the short time I've been there. I think there's good engagement at all levels and the fact I'm not aware at this point in time of the study doesn't mean that no. the team are not aware. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm, I'm sure I have taken over as a representative on the um, uh, there's a DVA uh, research committee that, that I sit on uh, as well, and I, I I would be confident that that study has probably come up in that forum as well. It's just that as an individually at this point in time, not aware, very confident in the engagement between DVA and defence around research and other matters more generally. Thank you. Um, let me finish with just a, a brief, uh, some brief attention to some quite specific matters and in particular a periodic mental health screen. Um, are you, to what extent are each of you familiar with the periodic mental health screen that's conducted in defence? Fam I'm familiar with the term. Yes. Uh, I, I haven't seen the detail but I'm a familiar with the term and the tempo. Yes. Admiral Sharkey? Yes, I'm um, familiar with the... Um, with the implementation of the periodic mental health screen in the um, mental health screening continuum um, and um, the nature of it. Yep. Yes, in, in, in so far as it's used to inform the provision of support services to individuals um, who, who've, who've uh, and, and, and screenings and a review to assess whether support is required. Um, 
sorry, could you re repeat the big? I didn't catch the beginning of that. In, in so far it is used to identify individuals to whom the provision of support or services might be required. Yes, yes. Um, now, we understand that a periodic uh, mental health screen does not become available until a member either presents to a, um, to, for an appointment, uh, is, is that right? Or has not received a mental health screen in the 12 month prior, is that correct? Uh, that was my understanding of where it fits in the mental health screening continuum, yes. Yes, thank you. So if, if for example, if I'm a new recruit, uh, as a worst case scenario, what's the longest time that I might have to wait in order to have a periodic mental health screen? My understanding is that the periodic mental health screen is there uh, in the event that um, um, uh, personnel haven't had any other type of mental health screen in the last 12 months. So it won't necessarily be applied every 12 months if somebody's been on deployment and they've had a screen pre or post deployment or a screen on request for other reasons, then it won't be applied, but it's there in the event that someone presents and they have not had any type of mental health screen in the preceding 12 months. And then the process is triggered to have that screen. Correct. Yes. Um, so would you be able to indicate what the benefits are of the, previous, of, of the periodic mental health screen in, in general terms? Why, why do you utilise it? Uh, so it is, as you s said, um, a, a tool available to um, defence um, to provide an opportunity for um, members of the ADF to um, be screened for um, uh, their risk of mental health disorder. Yes. Um, it also provides an important opportunity for um, psychoeducation um, and um, conversations um, with clinicians around mental health issues. Um, it was identified, um, and I understand the um, sort of primary th thing that it sought to do was um, uh, be the sort of uh, one of the final pieces of um, making that screening continuum within defence um, more comprehensive um, and try and close some of that gap where we might be missing individuals um, in their um, service career continuum. Yeah, and, and, and in, that, in that respect, is it correct that none of the services conduct mental health screens um, upon entry to the defence force or is that incorrect? Um, I, I I would need to understand that a bit more fully. I don't have enough detail um, with me, but w what I do know is that there is a comprehensive medical screening process on entry into the Defence Force and uh, an organisational psychology um, screening process on entry into the Defence Force, um, it, which you know, both include some elements of mental health screening, um, but I could not talk to whether the same um, tools that are used in the periodic mental health screen uh, exist in those other two I products. Understand. I don't. I understand. Yeah. Um, and then, as to the data that is obtained from the periodic mental health screens, is that utilised in, in, in any particular way, whether it's for research or to for inform programs. Obviously, there's utilisation in respect of the, the patient-specific utilisation, but in, in a, a broader and more systemic way, is that used in any manner? When was it introduced? I, I don't... I, I might talk forward-facing, because I mainly because I think it's a... It might be relatively recent. I, I haven't seen any data of evaluation of that particular tool yet, mm -hmm. but I would say that the intent would be to certainly look at that in the fullness of time, uh, you know, as as um, uh, as it's sustained, and certainly for other parts of screening, 
uh, there is um, there is a program of looking, you know, at the collective data around uh, the acronyms that they return to Australia, psychological mm -hmm. screening or the post-operational screening. So that's a body of work that does get done and reported on. And uh, I imagine it would be, it would make sense and be useful to do the same for the periodic mental health screen. Thank you. And in, in that connection, it's been suggested um, to this commission through various documents that have been provided under um, compulsory notice has been suggested by defence um, that, that first defence does not appear to track or analyse the, the outcomes of members recruited to the ADF with marginally higher psychological risk factors for one, and that there's no way of tracking them not through their time of service, number two, and that defence does not track or analyse the outcome of successful applicants who disclosed during the recruitment process a history of self-harm or substance abuse or suicidality, um, ACEs, mental illness or conduct disorders, that, that those matters have been identified in, by defence in response to notices. Ha having regard to the, the significance of those issues, do you, for first, perhaps this is a question for you, Admiral Sharkey, why hasn't it been tracked, number one? And do you see utility to tracking that information in the future? I don't wish to be difficult, but I think that needs to be broken up. There's about four parts to that. All right. Well, it actually proceeds on three assumptions arriving from what I gather to be responses to notices. That's right. So you... Yeah, then your first question was, why hasn't it been tracked? Mm. Can we just stick with that at the moment? Yeah, so let, 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 let's look at the, the first issue identified under notice, that the outcomes of members recruited to the ADF with marginally higher psychological risk factors does not appear to have been tracked or analysed by, um, uh, by defence. Why is that so? I don't know why. Um, it has also been said that there is no way of tracking them throughout their time in service. Would you agree with that? So, each individual ADF member through their service has a comprehensive health record um, that is accessible to clinicians along that um, pathway. So. I'm, I mean, I can't speak to the notice because I don't believe I was so involved in the notice. Um, uh, but in terms of tracking, I would say that from a clinical perspective, there is uh, a continuous um, visibility of the health system uh, in terms of tracking those individuals and should the need arise to be aware of the history of those individuals. Um, but if you're talking about health uh, surveillance or some other yes. um, surveillance mechanism or research mechanism, more broadly, I'm not familiar with. Council, could I seek some clarification? Because I think we're talking about uh, individuals, I think you're saying with higher than normal risk factors. The, the, the difference between becoming visible to the health system and not would be whether there's a diagnosis attached or uh, there's uh, mental ill health. Yes. Or is it really an assessment, a psychological assessment rather than a psychological diagnosis, if you know what I mean. So, so I, I suspect that that will depend on whether, A, I guess, the success in recruiting, but you are talking about people who have entered, so presumably they've had, they've successfully gone through recruiting. Um, if there was something that needed to be drawn to the attention of the health system, I would be confident that that process would occur. Um, but if these are individuals who are assessed as potentially having higher risk factors, they may not come to the attention of the health system at all. Yes. No, I know. Hence the inability to track and um, versus somebody, you know, being able to monitor and, and uh, track somebody who, who is in touch with the health system. Thank you. I, I think just the other, um, another 
point to add to that is that I, I would also have confidence that in terms of the clinical care around individuals who might be at higher risk, there is a deliberate and um, comprehensive clinical handover process that occurs. Yes. Uh, you know, for individuals in terms. So um, I'm confident that the clinical care around them would be managed um, based on their clinical needs. Thank you. Um, and let me move to one further topic, and that is the Suicide Prevention Expert Advisory Group. Are you each familiar with that group? Yes. Um, and that, that has been described to this commission as the preeminent body to provide advice on matters related to DVA and defence approaches to suicide prevention, jointly and severally. Would you accept that characterisation of the group? Um, actually, I, I might just correct. I'm not sure I'm overly familiar with that group. And, and are you familiar with the group? I, I am not. I was, I'm not familiar with that term. No, thank you. Um, and let me move to one further matter, and that is in, in the course of this Royal Commission, um, Defence in response to notices has provided information in relation to suicide relation in related incidents, and that has been collated across a variety of uh, answers to notices to give. Um, now, I don't, I'm not either to ask you about the process involved in collating that information, but having now had the benefit of those notices, or at least defence having had collated that information, having that, those notices, are they, is that being used by JHC in any way presently, number one? And do you propose to use the information contained in the notices in any way, number two, whether to analyse it, consider how um, services or the like might be changed? I think I would need to understand exactly what the notices were and what the content of them was. Um, I am not... If it is the group of notices that um, we talked about in yes. the preparation session... Yes. ..that um, relate to information that was gathered through the incident management processes yes. various in the command... Um, then no, Joint Health Command is not currently... Well, sorry, I only speak up to 1 December um, 2023. I was not aware of Joint Health Command utilising those information, that information, um, nor at that point having any plan to. The other point that I would make about that is that that's non-clinical information. It's incident reporting information. Mm -hmm. So the, pur the purposes... For, for Joint Health Command in taking that information, A, we wouldn't ordinarily get visibility of that content of the notices. Um, and I would reflect that I, I think it's probably an information fusing activity um, that is the subject of, was the subject of some consideration in terms of other areas of defence to take on that work. Thank you. And Avril Bennett, would you agree with that? Uh, I'm not add? familiar with the notices referred to. Um, if I um, extend what Admiral Shark has said, if, 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 if we're talking about a fusion of non-clinical information around um, specific uh, death by suicide events, is that what...? Yes. OK. Then... Um, uh, agree that the Joint Health Command has not been involved in that, but it, it it sounds on a parallel with what the Mental Health and Wellbeing Branch is doing with the suicide pi review pilot. Yep. Uh, and I can't talk to whether or not they've used those notices. I guess what I would say to refer to your question around mm. whether we would do something with that information, um, I mean, that's the absolute intent of the suicide review pilot um, to have a look at a whole range of factors and certainly if anything uh, does come out of that that requires uh, and I'm sure we'll be involved and we'll understand the information as it arises anything comes out of that that requires a consideration of review of health services whatever that may be uh, that would certainly occur. Thank you. Um, no further questions.
Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you very much. I do have a few questions. Um, if I could just start um, by understanding, we, we were talking about VUPA and the, some of the um, challenges, one of them being workforce. Um, can I just understand from a defence uniform perspective, do you have vacancies for um, health practitioners within uniform defence? So there, there is um, there are vacancies in the uniformed footprint um, in each of the three services, um, and there you know there have been over it has been over time difficulties um, in recruiting and retaining um, some of our clinical categories in the permanent forces. Um, in particular around medical officers. Um, there's hollowness in other um, areas, um, uh, you know, across the, the nursing service and um, uh, medics and um, uniformed psychologists. Uh, so there certainly is what we refer to as some hollowness um, across all of those three services. So... Um has work been done to try and address that vacancy? And I appreciate you've discussed what's been done to try and assist VUPA to um, uh, improve their fill, fill rate. But so, Commissioner, um, are you talking about specifically in terms of the garrison health facilities and the staffing in garrison health facilities or more broadly across the services? Um, at large? Um, primarily garrison. Um, so the arrangements, the, the agreement that we have with the single services um, for contributions of workforce, uh, uniform workforce into garrison vary slightly between the different services. Um, and uh, we do constantly have engagement with the single services around the relative prioritisation of posting of people into those positions. Um, the arrangements um, ha have been um, varied over the years to seek to optimise um, you know, the resource sharing um, in order to optimise garrison um, and the, the services out of garrison from which the services, obviously the single services, directly um, benefit. They do have competing priorities in terms of um, raising, training and sustaining the deployable health capabilities, um, which are also critical to defence, um, not just on operations, but also to support... Um, uh, the training cycle um, and capability cycle in each of those three services. So it is a constant process of um, prioritisation and negotiation uh, with the single services about how that clinical footprint is best distributed. Um, so w one of the things that has been suggested um, to this commission is that there should be more uniformed health practitioners across the spectrum. Um, and I guess I, I'm sitting here wondering, is, is that potentially something that, you know, should be recommended or should occur or, or are you, would that just result in more gaps unfilled? Yeah, so it, it would, um, based on the current s supply of uniform clinicians across the three services, um, that would create some operational impacts potentially if if um, uh, if we were to significantly change the way that workforce is allocated between garrison and the single services. Um, for the for the, the better or for the worse. Uh, look, I, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, it, it's about balancing. Um, operational capability and the need to support um, units that are deploying each and every day, ships at sea, um, 
you know, units into the field in support of air operations. Um, that is primarily why, you know, we have clinicians in uniform is to support the deployable capability. There is no doubt that Garrison would benefit from a larger contribution of um, uniform clinicians into the Garrison Health Centre, you know, as we've heard from a whole range of reasons. But, you know, there is work, um, and I'm sure Admiral Bennett can talk to it, that we've identified that needs to look at um, the way in which the defence health system and the network um, is resourced at large. Um, uh, so I might leave it there and, and ask if Admiral Bennett's got okay. anything to add to that question. But yeah, he's probably answered my question sufficiently. <laughs> okay. um, can I just ask, uh, and I think I have asked this before, but you do have mental health nurses, mental health nurse practitioners and allied health practitioners other than psychologists? within the staff, either uniformed or from BUPA? Uh, yes, or um, APS as well. Probably. And APS, okay. Do you have mental health peer workers as part of your health delivery staff? No. And is there a reason for that? Uh, no particular reason. We... Um, undertook several ye years ago um, some deliberate work to broaden uh, the definition of a mental health care provider to include a range of um, scopes of practice, um, including social workers um, and, psych you know, nurses and psychologists, as we've just identified. Um, there's no particular reason for that, um, I think some, I'm not particularly familiar with the scope of practice of um, a mental health peer worker. It, it would, in my mind, um, you know, we would need to understand what exactly the scope of practice of that individual and how they would contribute in their primary health care setting. Um, can, I, can I just ask you, um, do you have mental health occupational therapists? If you, you referred to psychologists, nurses, social workers, do you have OTs? I'm not aware of them as a category in the primary health care network. We certainly refer to occupational therapists uh, in the external network, but I wouldn't ha I wouldn't know um, the degree to which we would have um, mental health occupational therapists in that network. Is a slightly different role to a more generic um, OT. Can I just ask the question, and I apologise if this sounds really um, uninformed, but we've heard that BUPA provides more than 95% of the clinical workforce, it, well, the workforce delivering clinical services. So it's not 95% of the workforce. It, it, I think my evidence was actually... 90 to 95 percent of the services, services that yes. um, ADF members access is access is delivered by BUPA, which then um, begs the question because I don't think they are 90 to 95 percent of the workforce, and it, it begs the question then for me, um, what I is what the uniformed health practitioners do substantially different to what the BUPA contractors do? Like, do you have different responsibilities um, that perhaps take you away from the clinical service delivery into other spheres? Um, there certainly are... Um, uh, there, there are other obligations that uniform clinicians in their career continuum have as compared to a contracted healthcare provider working in garrison. Um, so, in t you know, for the uniform clinicians that work in our garrison facilities, um, they will often fulfil positions that might be com what we call command management and leadership positions within that facility. 
having said that, though, we also have um, uh, more fully employed, uh, you know, general duties clinicians who contribute to the clinical work um, of those facilities. The uniformed clinicians of whatever um, discipline also have a range of um, uh, service requirements that they need to maintain in terms of maintaining their deployability and some other obligations that are unique to being um, a military person in uniform that is not shared by the contractors. Um, uh, but certainly the clinicians that either contribute to our garrison footprint in a posted sense or that are um, our more flexible uniformed contribution that we call garrison clinical duty workforce, which is um, a bit more of a surge sort of part-time contribution from the single services. They are certainly engaged in delivering clinical services alongside and working in the multidisciplinary team um, alongside the APS and the contracted workforce. One of the, um, the council was asking about clinical governance, um, I guess, and it, it's kind of aligned with corporate governance. One of the issues around that is resourcing overall, and I think um, you suggested Admiral Bennett might speak to resourcing issues for, and I'm thinking there for um, health, serv health service delivery across the Defence Force. Yeah, uh, um, Commissioner, I think Admiral Sharker would probably, she was referring to work that's occurring um, aligned with the National Defence Strategic Review, which has a recommendation for CJ Health around being adequately resourced to provide sustainable health support to operations. So there's certainly work going on in that respect to understand what that demand might be for health service delivery looking at the current resources we have and the gap. Uh, and it's not, whilst it specifies operations, Garrison Health will have a big role in that as well, obviously, to prepare the force for deployment, uh, as well as um, provide health uh, capability on operations, as well as uh, post-deployment, as we've discussed. So so that's, that's, that's a unique and large body of work underway. There's no answer to that at the moment, and it's it will be part of um, informing the National Defence Strategy to come out as well. And it's really looking at what is the health capability that um, the military needs in the in the in the in the medium term, if you like. Um, so that that's the that's the response to that question. I'm not sure if it answers your question around clinical governance. No, I, was just, I was just kind of thinking, we, we talked about clinical governance. Yeah. I think about clinical governance, corporate governance and resourcing is kind of one yes. of the things I put under that heading. Sorry, it's how my yes, brain right, works. Right. <laughs> so hopefully that, that answers your question. I mean, there are other components to that around how we also operate with the health network, public health network, the Australian health system. Um, uh, so those things are all under consideration um, as part of the health system that defence personnel um, interact with. Um, just in terms of the discussion around outcomes, um, Bupa, uh, Mr Sedgman, did say to us last week um, around, as council indicated, that uh, Bupa didn't get clinical outcome data. And, and you are seeming to refute that assertion. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, on hearing that um, and your own response is, well, I don't think that's entirely accurate, but um, could you speculate as to perhaps why he may have thought that? Is there something that you think perhaps Bupa could benefit from that they can't, currently don't get or don't have access to? I, think I, I am terribly good... sorry, Commissioner, but I do have to object to the witnesses being asked of the thought processes of the other witness. Um, I, I think I'll uphold that objection in a normal courtroom, but you know, <laughs> maybe there's a way of rephrasing it. <laughs> um, what, what could help... I'll, I'll rephrase the question. <laughs> what could better help... Uh, inform a clinical service provider about 
um, clinical service delivery and clinical outcomes? So I think, in Commissioner, in considering uh, health outcomes broadly myself, um, and Admiral Sharkey and I spoke to mainly what is aligned with health service outcomes and, and the fact that there, that data is shared between Bupa and Defence. Um, one of the challenges I think all health service providers have, and Defence is no different, is around population health outcomes. Uh, and that sort of information is always useful to have. And in fact, it's, uh, it is uh, both mentioned in the strategy around monitoring and surveillance of the health of, of the population writ large and also research priority. Uh, so there's some work that goes on in that area in, um, in Joint Health Command and Defence, but it is an area that uh, as we move to implement a new um, electronic health system, which is occurring this year, that we are very keen to continue to improve our health surveillance and monitoring of the defence population more um, broadly and uh, in anticipation that will support that. So I, I, I think it may well be around um, not individual clinical outcomes. Again, Bupa has the information for much of that, but really the, the surveillance of the broader health outcomes of the defence population. And would poly, polypharmacy, for example, be one of, you know, uh, uh, one of those types of things that you might look at? Uh, yeah, we may. I think we would have certainly have the, the data and information for that. So, um, you know, those, whatever the, the priorities around risk are at the time. Would would you have data around, for example, to assist you to understand the appropriateness of the mental health interventions that are offered currently Acro across the, not necessarily at the individual level, but across? I think we have thought about th that and uh, how we um, can, can get better visibility of it. I think part of the challenge is that um, our ADF members, when they access the various programs in the civilian community, um, are part of the cohort that are treated or managed in those facilities. And so for us, um, it is difficult to bring those that information together in a meaningful way. And I absolutely appreciate that if you're yeah. talking about the referred out, but even just for those within your primary health care services and any mental health interventions and the appropriateness of that. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, for example, um, you know, the clinical guidelines for mood disorders would suggest the first thing is lifestyle factors and then psychological therapies before you look to any kind of, uh, you know, pharmacological interventions. Um, do you, do you have any way of knowing whether, in fact, your primary health care clinicians are observing those guidelines? Um, so we certainly have looked at that periodically and conducted clinical audits um, and um, over the, you know, a cohort of people who are being treated in um, the garrison health system. Um, and so that is probably the primary means through which we would... Um, be able to assess the appropriateness of treatment is through that um, audit and review process that, that certainly has been a methodology that we've used. And can I just ask in terms of um, clinical standards, um, can you just tell me um, whether you actually have, whether um, Defence Health Services actually have any kind of, go through any kind of accreditation process against any particular standards, and if so, which ones? Um, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking here particularly mental health and suicide prevention. I don't necessarily want to go here. Right. Um, uh, I think the answer would be no in terms of formal accreditation. Um, however, we in our work are constantly um, aware and very familiar with the requirements of various standards and certainly um, in terms of accessing particularly mental health um, treatment programs, um, uh, you know, 
through Bupa, um, there are requirements within that contracted arrangement that require the referrals to be made to accredited um, facilities and treatment providers um, accredited against, you know, whether it's, um, and I can't remember all the names yeah. of them, I'm sorry, but the relevant standards. But the, um, sorry, Admiral Brennan. Uh, uh, but just to add, Commissioner, um, after uh, Admiral Sharkey's time, uh, there, there is a specific example with um, the telepsychiatry and telepsychology uh, models of care, which were developed in, in defence uh, uh, a number of years ago, but the uh, Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare last year did publish some um, standards around uh, digital um, tele-mental health. And so that I did ask the question of the team and they have mapped, uh, they used a different standard system, the name of which escapes me, but they have mapped across uh, the standards that are in use across to the 2023 uh, Commission standards as well. So, so the team are well alert to the national standards out there um, and continue to keep abreast of, of uh, how we are mapping uh, across. And I think in that instance, whilst the Commission stands, a lot of them aren't entirely relevant to defence because they're around acute care, that particular one was. So. Um, yeah, okay, I'll leave that there. Um, look, I'll leave my questions there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Operator, could you please bring up SST.1001.0001 .001. This is uh, Lieutenant General Stewart's um, personal statement. And take us to 006 and 7. And if you could please put them side by side. And then um, highlight paragraphs 13 to 17 on the left hand page and 18 to 21 on the right hand page. Thanks very much. Um, Admirals, this is an extract from a statement of evidence by Lieutenant General Stewart, who is not, he hasn't given oral evidence yet, but this has been provided to the Royal Commission. And as I understand it, or think it probably is, it's a statement of what his perception of a good health system would be, particularly in delivering health at the point of need. So what I'd like you to do is to read those paragraphs and see if it can square with the health system you have operating at present on in two respects, one in garrison positions and two on deployment. I've been told by the people from Buta, Mr Sedgman, um, in effect, that he thinks it could be done in the garrison, but Bupa people don't go on deployment, so he's not sure what could be done on deployment. So I'll leave you to read it. Admirals, I know that your screens seem to stop at a certain point. Uh, I'm worried you may not be able to see all of it. We'll need to fix that, I think. Yeah, it's uh, just that it sits a bit low on one side of the... Can you see all the way down to 17 on the left and 21 on the right? I can. I can, I can by adding the screen. Well, perhaps the operator could just move them up. Thank you.
chance to read it, have you? When I read it, I see the core of his argument that's contained in paragraphs 15 to 17, where he speaks of a capability brick or team, and then talks about how it might be adapted to particular circumstances, say in a an infantry battalion, and and how it would reflect a multidisciplinary model and include quite a significant number of different different disciplines, but. No doubt that might depend very much on the size of the unit and the nature of the operation that's being undergone. Do you have any views about whether that's feasible? Um, Under your current system? Um, um, look, I, I think um, the essence, uh, you know, I would endorse the essence of what is... Um, aspired to in creating um, such a model. Um, there are elements of that that I think um, in the current arrangements we currently aspire to achieve as well in terms of the notion of multidisciplinary, um, uh, access to multidisciplinary teams, um, that habitual relationship and the strength in understanding the cohort and the dependency for which you're providing it, um, the strong connection with command and um, the other well-being um, capabilities. I think in my mind it sort of speaks a little bit to... Um, so some, the, the, I, I would see some of the potential challenges being those that existed in previous iterations of the defence health system where we had a more dispersed um, health footprint uh, in the garrison environment in particular, which created issues of efficiency and sustainability in terms of workforce and um, the resources required to sustain it. Did it bring the medicos, if I can call them that, um, into closer contact with the troops and allow them to become more familiar with the troops' individual needs? Um, well, I think the answer to that is probably yes, but I would also say that there are um, there is an ability um, in the current construct of the hub um, resource allocation in garrison to maintain those habitual relationships where the right culture behaviours and resourcing exists within the health um, facilities. Um, and I absolutely accept that we're not getting that, um, you know, we're not meeting the needs of the single services uh, in that expectation, um, you know, in all locations. And uh, if the model's transported to a deployment situation, can it work there? Um, well, I, I would say yes, and it probably does. So that's not, you know, at the moment, um, and I'll talk just about the health footprint, the doctor, nurse, medic. I mean, that's not dissimilar to the construct that exists currently um, with organic health care and the way in which we deploy um, units and embed health assets into um, the support of um, deployed units in the operational setting. Do you wish to add anything, Admiral? Uh, 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 just that, and that's, that aligns with the piece of work uh, I was talking about before about looking at what are our um, health capability requirements for operations as well, and it would look at the current model and uh, uh, look at our other options considered. Um, other, other than that, I agree, I accept the premise. Uh, it, clearly makes sense, but it is, uh, we've heard a lot about the health workforce and it is about providing the optimum uh, health service delivery and health care whilst balancing, you know, the, the personnel we have. And um, I, I'd be keen to understand, I think, I think it's on health to understand what the issues of, of the commanders are so we can um, better target what the solutions might be. I think it infers that it's 
that they're too many and medically restricted, but we can't, I can't say that for sure. So for me, I'd, I'd really like a clearer understanding of the issues the commanders are having with the current model and so we could look at options around. Is there a forum to have this sort of debate with the service chiefs? Yes, there is, yes. And, and uh, locally as well, myself and, and my DGs, as they did in Admiral Shark, is visit the um, bases generally or the single service units to, to have those discussions. But um, it, it's something that, that we're aware, aware of. The command satisfaction with health is not as high as it can be, so we need to understand and address. If I might add just a couple of other points, yes. Commissioner. I, I mean, I think these conversations are really important and valuable to have internally within Defence and, and as the Admiral mentioned, there are platforms to do that. I, I think in my personal experience of um, 30 years, that rate of medical restriction, um, in my view, has been pretty consistent over a long time. A couple of feet, please. I'm sorry. Apparently there was... I think it's confidential. Okay, can you need the um, feed? Well, the, oh. the feed needs to be stopped at the moment so we okay. can just work out what we do with it. But I would have thought the transcript will just need to be edited Okay. to take out the two references. Are these images only been on the private view? It would seem so. They don't appear to be on the... Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, that can be done. Leaving the number aside, I suspect that the consistency of the figure would be um, within General Stewart's uh, view as well. Um, y yes, I don't, I don't disagree, but uh, that is despite the changes to the model um, as well over time. Sure. I, um, and I think the other point that I would make, there are other, con, you know, there are obviously a range of considerations that would need to be taken into account. But the other learning, I think, from previous models of a more dispersed health footprint in particular was the um, less satisfactory situation of having um, single clinician arrangements without peer support or without adequate supervision as well and how we would provide the assurances around the clinical quality and safety um, of those clinicians in the way that they operate. Um, completely accepting that we, we do currently, you know, have uh, many operational scenarios where there are, um, uh, you know, uh, independently operating clinicians um, but there are sort of well entrenched um, governance processes over that. But I just thought that worth mentioning as well. Thank you. Mm. The other issue I wanted to ventilate with you, followed on uh, from what um, Ms. Rupa Goria asked about whether you'd looked at any of the data we'd gathered. Um, apart from gathering data, we've also published two research papers. Well, more than that, but two in particular I'm thinking of about about suicide and self-harm monitoring. Um, part one was about the data landscape and short-term opportunities and part two was about a roadmap to real-time suicide and suicide data monitoring. Um, they've been published, they were commissioned by us from Melbourne University to know whether uh, the Joint Health Units had a chance to look at them or comment on them? Um, I certainly am familiar and um, have looked to some degree at the suicide, the roadmap um, mm -hmm. one. Uh, I, I couldn't recall all the details of it um, today, but, I, you know, it's certainly of interest to us. Right. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Admiral Bennett, do you wish to add anything about that? Nothing to add. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. I just had one quick point, and I, I realise it's been a long day. Um, how do we ensure continuity of care with people? I know they're meant to be moved around, certainly the senior people, every two or three years from one place to the next. How is that ensured that there is a continuity of, of health care for when people are moving from one place to the next? Can I take that? Um, so a, a continuity of care... Um, is obviously a critical enabler in all health systems and I think a, a challenge more broadly. 
uh, we think about continuity of care um, around several inputs into that. It's, it's not just about the workforce, it's also about the flow of health information um, around those individuals as well. And so for, um, and I'm assuming your question is that how do we do it currently? Um, it, so it is around um, the careful manage management of the workforce that we have in place managing um, individuals. It is about deliberate handover of, of clinical um, information and clinical care. Um, we also operate a healthcare coordination forum, um, which provides some um, additional uh, governance and structure around the healthcare coordination of individuals. The Defence Electronic Health System uh, in Defence, um, a national available health record system also supports that um, continuity of care. Um, in addition to other um, functions around recall and follow up and fail to attend uh, reporting and monitoring. Um, so there's a, there's a whole number of activities and initiatives and processes um, that we have in operation that um, uh, work to ensure that continuity of care in our, in our current defence health system. So, com Commissioner, if I could um, add, and as Admiral Shaki said, it, it, it's continuity care is a range of things. I think, I think to um, uh, patients, personnel, people, it, to them it's mainly about who they see, which is the one aspect. To clinicians, it is about that continuity of uh, clinical information and handover. But w one of the advantages of the prime contract is, you know, with with um, non-uniformed health, uh, health service personnel is that they are able to provide that physical continuity more than uniformed personnel, as you've indicated, who either can deploy or uh, turn over. So I think it gives personnel the advantage of seeing their uh, preferred clinician, if you like, in circumstances, um, uh, whenever that may be. It's certainly one of the advantages of that civilian workforce. Thank you. Commissioner Brown has one more question, I think. Sorry, I, I just wanted to go back to the issue of the um, mental health screening continuum. Council, I think, asked the question about did you think there might be any benefit to um, conducting the very first of the periodic mental health screens um, during the uh, early part of career, after, just after recruits join? I understand they... Well, may, may be 12 months or so otherwise before they get a, a periodic mental health screen. Do you have a view about whether there'd be any benefit to doing that screen as a baseline kind of earlier on? I think, Commissioner, for me, um, what I'd need to confirm is what mental health screening's done on recruitment during the recruitment process. Uh, and... I would imagine it's done, but would need to confirm. And I think that would then, you know, inform the answer about when would be your next periodic mental health screen. So um, I think if it was done at recruitment, you would probably then go into that mental health screening continuum where you'd have another screen in 12 months if you'd not had one in between. And, and the avenues, are, knowing that recruits are a potentially higher risk cohort, um, in between that 12 months, obviously, there's, there's still the ability to self-refer uh, or for uh, a command to refer for a psychological screen if they're concerned about a recruit as well. So there are other avenues where if a recruit was having mental health problems, they, they would certainly have access to the health facility. But I, I think it sort of hinges on um, what screening's done in recruitment. Mm. And the other question then around the mental health screening is we understand that there's the, the POPs and the RTAPs done if there's been an operational deployment. Um, otherwise, it's the periodic mental health screen if you haven't had reason to have it um, any other time. But there are... Well, there's a couple of things. One is that there are cohorts that I think Defence has identified who are probably at some higher risk and one group... Uh, for example, that has been put forward is those who intelligence officers and those who um, pilot the, the remote vehicles, 
partner that um, may cause um, some destruction, um, which potentially may impact on, you know, mental health state. Um, is is there? Do you think there's any potential value in screening those kind of identified higher risk cohorts more regularly, and whether that's through the, you know, the the periodic mental health screen or in some other way? Um, so, what I would say is that there is always there are opportunities um, available to target um, deliberate screening over high-risk groups. And there's the... Com I'm not sure if in your work you've come across the command requested um, process for mental health screening that um, is one used, um, which can be initiated over particular um, cohorts in certain... in ..you know, in some circumstances. Um, obviously, with the op-resolute, you know, Again, that's another example of a slightly modified approach outside of the RTATS POPs um, regime that is also applied. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, uh, there may be um, some advantages in that. Uh, I know that um, from time to time we've looked at, for instance, also um, there's screening that's been introduced into the submarine community um, you know, over the years because um, of the recognition that um, the work that they were doing posed some unique risks to the way in which that community was working. Um, there are, um, in terms of operational activities and, um, you know, the UAV um, type of scenario would also be subject to the operational health planning um, process which assesses the health risks that are imposed on those cohorts and it is through that process where there is a deliberate consideration of the risks that are involved in certain groups doing certain activities and it is that process that then informs whether or not additional screening and what type of health screening or other um, health mitigations need to be put in place for that um, particular um, activity. So I, I do think that defence does do that, um, deliberate sort of consideration of risk and modify away from the, the more sort of RTATS POPs type of approach. Mm. Um, so there, there is a risk-based um, applied um, thinking that goes into how we think about our defence populations um, and ha how best to, um, you know, mitigate the risks. And, and I understand that critical incident mental health screen sits in that mental health screening continuum as well as another opportunity for screening. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr Fordham, any issues? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Rubagotti, any matters arising? Nothing arising. Thank you. Okay. May the witnesses then be excused from their summons? Yes, they may. Um, admirals? <laughs> Thank you. We know it's been a long day, but we very much appreciated your evidence today and the amount of information that we've covered. Um, you're excused from your summons to appear today, and thanks again. Um, if there's no other matters, I understand we're adjourning till 8 a.m. tomorrow. Yes, I understand, sir. Okay. We'll adjourn. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 8am Friday, the 22nd of March, 2024.